Section 1 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 5, The Age of Louis XIV. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface by A. W. Ward, G. W. Prothero, and Stanley Leaths. The Age of Louis XIV, though the traditional use of the phrase may warrant the adoption of it as the title of a volume covering a period of European history closely coinciding in date with his personal rule, cannot be held to possess the organic unity which belongs to the theme of our Napoleon volume. Louis the Fourteenth, though endowed with some truly royal qualities, and above all with that of knowing how to choose the chief agents of his policy at home and abroad, was himself no great statesman and nothing of a general. His monarchy was not his creation. He was without real initiative, and no intellectual effort associated with his reign was due to his personal inspiration. On the other hand, the system of absolute government, which he steadily carried on during more than half a century, and to which all the activities of the French nation were consistently, though not without struggles, accommodated, was characteristic of the whole age of which he is the most conspicuous figure. To the perfection of this system, the state with which he was identified had been long advancing by what may be termed a logical process of development and to it the large majority of rulers contemporary with himself were desirous of adhering or attaining. In the dominions of both branches of the House of Habsburg, the alliance of dynastic interests with those of the Church of Rome had at different periods prevailed in the contention against what had come to be mere provincial liberties. But Spain had fallen into political as well as social decay, and the House of Austria was only gradually recovering from the disappointment of its revived dynastic ambition. Among the princes of the empire, however, the enfeeblement of the imperial authority had called forth a widespread ambition to exalt their territorial power at the expense of the claim of their estates while in several instances, and more especially in that of Brandenburg, Prussia, they sought to mark their advance by the assumption of a royal crown. Nor was it in Central Europe alone that open imitation flattered the absolutism of Louis XIV. In the Scandinavian kingdom, the peoples made common cause with the throne in permanently overthrowing in its favor the sway of the nobles, while in Russia, the distinctive features of whose earlier history are traced in this volume, the autocracy of Peter the Great, strengthened by his contact with Western civilization, broke the resistance of the boyars and church, and stimulated the lethargy of his people. In three important European states only, no absolute system of government was established in this age. In Poland, notwithstanding the chronic pressure of the eastern peril, faction, consuming its energies from time to time in the process of choosing a king, could not have tolerated the establishment of a strong regal authority, even had a fitting personality been forthcoming to make the attempt. The Dutch Republic, though the oligarchy of its leading state had to surrender the control of affairs to a hereditary presidency, preserved the free constitution which it had won for itself with its independence. In Great Britain, religious convictions, menaced together with the traditions of parliamentary self-government, combined with them to preserve the foundations of political freedom and to defend the religious convictions of the great body of the nation. Thus the patriotic Dutchman, whom the last English Revolution seated on the throne of the Stuarts, was, reluctantly enough, forced to accept the limits of the royal authority with which he had been invested. While in the matter of government, and of all the influences derived from it, 
The example of France more or less enduringly impressed itself in this period upon most of the states of Europe. The history of their international relations was determined by several causes, among which the foreign policy of Louis XIV was but one of the chief. The endeavor of France, in circumstances singularly propitious to the execution of her design, to constitute herself the arbitress of European affairs at large, unlike the Habsburg aspirations for a universal monarchy, lacked the glamour of imperial tradition, while it could not claim the open approval of Rome. The pretexts with which Louis XIV was supplied for his long series of encroachments within the boundaries of the empire, for his attempt to annex the Spanish, and for his subsequent invasion of the United Netherlands, are discussed in different parts of this volume, together with the history of French intervention in the affairs of other European states, and the pacifications and other agreements and alliances which mark the successive stages of alternating advance and retreat in the progress of the French schemes, necessarily call for exposition and comment. The height of the narrative seems to be reached in the negotiations which preceded, without being able to avert, the War of Spanish Succession, or rather, inasmuch as these negotiations proved the unwillingness of Louis XIV to provoke the united resistance of Western and Central Europe against him, in his ultimate decision to accept the opportunity offered him by the last will of Charles II of Spain. The quote-unquote balance of Europe was now in actual danger of being unsettled. In other words, the preponderance of the power of France would have become irresistible had her king's final challenge been left without a response. The Grand Alliance brought about by William III proved victorious, and though later events, and more especially the death of the Emperor and the accession to the imperial throne of the Austrian claimant of the Spanish inheritance, once more modified the situation, the principle of a re-established quote-unquote balance underlay all the negotiations which resulted in the Peace of Utrecht. Thus, at the close of the period treated in this volume, the political ascendancy of France in Europe was a thing of the past, though her ascendancy continued in literature and in much besides. The second of the causes determining the course of European history in this age has to be traced in the long and seemingly remote history of the Ottoman power in Europe from the middle of the 17th century to the Peace of Karlowitz. Its significance for the Empire, Hungary, Poland and the Venetian dominions continued till nearly the end of the period treated in this volume. The policy of Louis XIV drew no small advantage from the Eastern question, and viewed its temporary settlement as, in its turn, a menace to the balance of power in Europe but for a large part of Europe it was, to the close of the 17th century, a question of life and death. Finally, in this volume, a large division of the canvas is filled by the Great Swedish, or quote-unquote, Northern War, a new Thirty Years' War, absorbing all the conflicts of Europe, might have resulted had the military genius of Charles XII been united to a political genius of the same order. But none of the high-spirited successors of Gustavus Adolphus, whose exploits are narrated in this volume, had inherited the comprehensiveness of his statesmanship. Thus the result of the Northern War, while incidentally proving the impotence of Poland and leaving the now important military power, Prussia, to play a quote-unquote waiting game was to transfer the Dominium Maris Baltici to the young Russian power and thus prepare a new chapter in the history of Europe. It seemed to us that an adequate historical survey of the latter half of the 17th and the early years of the 18th century 
was impossible without due regard to the moral and intellectual interests which this period inherited from its predecessors or bequeathed to ensuing ages. From the Reformation to the times of the Thirty Years' War, the discussion and settlement of religious dogma had absorbed a wholly disproportionate share of the intellectual activity of Western Europe, where the toleration of religious opinion was even as a conception almost unknown. Yet, as is shown in this volume, the spiritual forces of religion were revived as man ceased to be chiefly concerned in the fixing of its doctrines and the enforcement of their acceptance. And the principle of toleration, while it became a factor in the prosperity of states, gained and imparted strength from its association with new developments of religious life and thought. At the same time, literature adapted itself to the courtly order of things, except where, as in the later works of Milton, the issues for which a mightier age contended still dominated the poet's mind, or the universal sympathies of a great dramatist such as Molière claimed a European audience. And yet another influence was beginning in a more gradual and less widely perceptible fashion to permeate the life of Europe. To science, as our usage limits the term, kings and peoples had almost forgotten to lend an attentive ear, when, in the period of which this volume treats, it once more asserted its position among the moving forces of the world's history, and entered upon a new stage in its progress of which the continuity has since then been unbroken. The chapter in this volume on French literature under Louis XIV and its European influence was to have been written by the illustrious French critic Monsieur Ferdinand Brunetière, but on his lamented death only a few notes referring to his projected contribution were found among his papers. We were fortunate enough to be enabled to secure the consent of Monsieur Émile Faguet that he should take the place of his confrère, a place which no other critic of literature could have filled so suitably and so well. The bibliography to his chapter has been kindly supplied, at a very short notice, by Mr. A. R. Waller of Peterhouse, Assistant Secretary of the University Press. The late Sir Michael Foster, whose cooperation in the Cambridge Modern History will be a source of gratification to all our readers, had only a week or two before his death sent to us the manuscript of the second section of the chapter on the progress of European science, of which the earlier section has been written by Mr. W. W. Rouse Ball. But Sir Michael had no opportunity of revising what he had written, or of furnishing us with more than a rough draft of his bibliography. We have to thank Dr. Clifford Albert, Regius Professor of Physic, and Mr. A. C. Seward, Professor of Botany in this university, for their great kindness in revising their lamented friend's text, and adding suggestions for his section of the bibliography, which has been completed by Mr. A. T. Bartholomew of Peterhouse and the University Library. The index to this volume has been compiled by Mr. H. G. Aldis of Peterhouse, Secretary of the University Library, and the chronological table by Miss A. M. Cook, whose services to the Acton Collection in the Library will long be held in remembrance. In accordance with the rule previously followed in this history, the dates of events mentioned in this volume are in new style, except in the case of events in a country by which in this period new style had not yet been adopted, where, as in the instance of a battle by sea, doubts might arise as to which style has been chosen, that actually used has been specially indicated. The dates of the years are throughout in new style. A table of years in which new style was severally adopted by the chief European countries will be found in Volume 3 of this work. A.W.W., G.W.P., 
SL, September 1907. End of section 1. Section 2 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 5, The Age of Louis XIV. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1. The Government of Louis XIV, 1661 to 1715, by A.J. Grant, Part 1. When Mazarin's death left the government of France in the hands of the young king, the country seemed to be so happily situated, so free from dangerous rivals and pressing dangers, that it was capable of determining its own destiny. While France had triumphed over Europe, in France itself the monarchy had triumphed over all rival powers, classes, and organizations. The futile struggle of the Fronde had discredited the Parlement, and had exhibited the egotism and the incapacity of a noblesse. France turned to her king with a loyal enthusiasm born of a sense that the monarchy alone could maintain order in the state and ensure its prosperity. At the time of Mazarin's death, Louis XIV was twenty-three years old. His character was as yet little known. If Mazarin had not kept the sovereign in ignorance, he had certainly kept him in the background, and hence it was that Louis XIV's declaration that he intended to be his own first minister, and that all ministers were to address themselves to him, was received with amusement and incredulity. His singular grace and dignity of manner were already apparent. His amorous temperament was familiar to those who had been brought into close contact with him, and these characteristics endured to the end. But the world had not yet suspected the persistent energy of the young king, or his fondness for the business of reigning, or again the boundless pride and egotism which neutralized many of his best qualities. During the whole of his reign he maintained his habits of regularity and hard work. He was constant in attendance at the various councils by which the business of the state was transacted, and he was always attentive, eager to master the details of business, and confident in his own judgment, whether in domestic or in foreign affairs. From the first he was the real ruler of the country, and his mastery increased as his reign advanced. The domestic and the foreign policy of France were at first largely controlled by his great ministers, Colbert, Louvois, and Lyon though the approval of the king was always a necessary condition of their action, and at each point his judgment had to be convinced. But before the end of the reign, the relative importance of the ministers had greatly declined. They were, at last, the almost servile executors of the king's will, and he had grown intolerant of opposition and protest. It is difficult to arrive at a judgment as to the abilities of Louis XIV. Lord Acton has called him by far the ablest man who was born in modern times on the steps of a throne. Clearly his was no commonplace character or intelligence. One who directed the policy of the first state in Europe for fifty-five years, who achieved many victories and showed great tenacity and skill in the hour of defeat, must have had powers above the average. No historian has ever denied to him patience, industry, or method. One must work hard to reign, he wrote. And it is ingratitude and presumption towards God, injustice and tyranny towards man, to wish to reign without hard work. He laboured at the task of reigning his whole life through, undeterred by ennui, uninterrupted by pleasures or domestic affliction. Montesquieu's judgment that his character was more striking than his intelligence, il avait l'âme plus grand que l'esprit, is perhaps the fairest summing up of a grand monarque. In what concerned foreign affairs and the organization of the central government, he exhibited real skill, but he did not show the same intelligence or the same patience in relation to social or religious problems or the organization of local government. The extension of monarchical authority and of his own personal power was the predominant impulse with him, and where these were not concerned, his attention and energy were apt to flag. His theory of life was theocratic through and through. The king is God's vice-regent, and is possessed of a sort of divine infallibility. The history of his reign passes judgment on this theory, as to its effects both on the kingdom and on the king. In his reign, the monarchy ceased to be the one principle of unity in the state. It ceased to justify itself as the protector of a people against the nobility, and as the successful leader of a nation in war. It became something apart from a people and the nation. 
the way was thus prepared for the revolution of the next century. The authority of the crown had triumphed over, without actually effacing, all rival authorities. Parlements and local estates and municipalities still existed. The church still held its assemblies, but if they still exercised any power, it was by permission of the king. All power came from the king, and it was the fixed determination of Louis XIV that this fact should be recognized by all the officials of the state. When Voisin became Secretary of State, he apologized to the king for referring certain decisions to him, saying that he had not yet had sufficient experience of office to take on himself the responsibility of decision. Louis answered emphatically that it would never be his business to decide anything, that he must always take his orders from the king and limit his activity to executing them. The machinery of government developed by Richelieu and Mazarin was used by Louis XIV, but it was developed still further. The essential characteristic of the Constitution of France during his reign consisted in its being a government through councils, to which, with few exceptions, neither birth nor rank gave any right of admission. The nobility were excluded with jealous care. Great ecclesiastics were no longer admitted. The councils were filled chiefly with men of middle-class birth, usually lawyers, Jean de la Robe, who owed everything to the king and could not possibly regard themselves as independent of him. The exclusion of those above the accepted level was maintained even against members of the royal family. There were four chief councils, the Conseil d'État, the Conseil des Dépêches, the Conseil des Finances and the Conseil Privé. The Conseil d'État, unofficially known as the Conseil d'Honneur, was a small body of not more than four or five men which met in the presence of the king. It assembled three times a week, and in it the great questions of state were considered and decided. All the members could take part in discussing these questions, but the decision rested with the king. This council was the pivot of the state, but the king took care not to allow it to become apparent constitutionally. No minutes were taken of the proceedings of a council, and no record was kept of its decisions. Its meetings were merely occasions on which the king chose to ask the advice of those whom he cared to consult. The Conseil des Dépêches was also held in his presence and considered and decided on all questions relating to the internal condition of France. The Conseil des Finances had under its control all questions relating to taxation and was also held in the royal presence. All these three councils were held in the royal apartments, the fourth council, the Conseil Privé or Conseil des Parties, was a body quite different in kind. It was held in the palace, but not in the royal apartments, was not usually presided over by the king, and consisted of a large number of lawyers, maîtres de requête. It was not technically a supreme court of appeal, for its functions were purposely left indefinite, but it was the highest judicial court in the land and represented the vague but supreme judicial authority belonging to the king. These were the chief councils, but there were others, such, for instance, as those dealing with religion, with the Huguenots, and with commerce. In any matter of importance, the king was accustomed to seek the advice of persons whose opinion he valued, and whom he had no reason to fear, and to decide after listening to their advice. Thus, at the centre, the royal authority triumphed completely, and thrust the Parlement and the sovereign courts into the shade. His aim was the same in the provinces. But in these, the royal authority had to struggle to supremacy through the ruins of a vast number of provincial institutions, customs, and rights. There were the provincial estates, or what remained of them. There were the provincial parlements. There were the municipal liberties, once so vigorous and important, and still general, though decadent and threatened with extinction. Wide differences still existed between province and province, not only in feeling and institutions, but even in language. Lavis has asserted that in the year 1661, the greater number of Frenchmen were still ignorant of the French tongue. In consequence of these separatist tendencies, the royal authority had a hard struggle to carry out its aim of centralized and unified government, in spite of the heavy blows which Richelieu had already struck in this direction. The ruins of the past were still left to cumber the ground, and often to prevent the rise of any more useful edifice, but in their midst there rose the power of the royal intendant. The Parlement were not abolished. They continued to sit and to give decisions at Toulouse, Grenoble, Bordeaux, Dijon, Rouen, Aix, Pau, Rennes, and Metz. 
and later in the reign at Tournai and Besançon. The provincial estates still met at intervals in Brittany, the Boulonnais, Artois, Burgundy, Provence, Languedoc, and Franche-Comté. The governors still held nominal power in the various provinces. They were usually men of aristocratic birth and they enjoyed a large income, but they were for the most part absentees, and when they went to their provinces it was for ceremonial purposes rather than for the performance of important business. Parlements, estates, and governors were devoid of any real power. The real authority lay with the royal intendants, who in effect represented in the provinces the unlimited authority of the king, and who were placed there in order to maintain and increase it. The king informed his intendants that it was their business to see to the observation of our edicts, the administration of civil and criminal justice and of police, and all other matters which concern the prosperity and security of our subjects. They were chosen from the ranks of the unprivileged classes, and the nobility saw in them their chief rivals and enemies. In the passage quoted above, the king speaks of the prosperity and security of our subjects, and the relief of a poor figures occasionally in despatches, but it is the special weakness of the reign that so much was made of the royal authority for its own sake, while the condition of the people occupied a quite secondary place. Notwithstanding the great power of Louis XIV and the reforming energy of Colbert, little was done for the relief of the people, even during the early and prosperous years of Louis XIV's rule and the wars, successful and unsuccessful of his later years, heaped intolerable burdens on the shoulders of the poor and threw into further confusion the system of administration, which Colbert had done his utmost to regularise and simplify. It was the effort of a king to keep the power in his own hands and to avoid the slightest appearance of a mayor of the palace. Without violently overthrowing the old machine of government, he reduced to something like impotence the ministers of old and high-sounding titles and gave the reality of power into the hands of other ministers and secretaries of state who were immediately appointed by and dependent on himself. The secretaries of state, despite their nominally dependent position, were elevated above the heads of the old nobility. They represented royalty itself, and only princes, dukes, and marshals were exempted from the necessity of saluting them by the title of Monseigneur. The Chancellor was in name the chief of the king's servants. He seemed the last survival of the Middle Ages. He was nominal president of all the councils and head of all courts and tribunals. He had the custody of the royal seal, so that all acts of a royal authority passed through his hands. He was irremovable and seemed, therefore, a very bulwark of aristocratic power against the monarchy. But in truth, the treatment of the Chancellor is symbolic of a whole political condition of France. He remained in his splendour and wealth and nominal power. Earlier kings had eluded his power by giving the actual custody of the seals to an official removable at pleasure. But in the reign of Louis XIV, the prestige of the royal authority was so great that no subterfuge was necessary. The chancellors of Louis XIV were not the slightest check upon his authority. Next came the Controller General of Finances and the Ministers of State, whose office under Louis XIV lasted just so long as they retained the confidence of the king. They were without accurately defined duties and were in fact exactly what the king chose to make of them. After them came the secretaries of state, in whose hands were the real administration of the realm. Their duties in 1661 were the superintendence of 1. Foreign Affairs, 2. War, 3. The King's Household and the Church, 4. The Protestants of France. But, in addition, the provinces were rather arbitrarily divided into four groups, and each group was placed under one of the four secretaries, but these duties were not rigidly defined and were varied when new appointments were made. Louis XIV was excellently served during the first part of his reign by men most of whom had received their training in statesmanship in the schools of Richelieu and Mazarin. Le Tellier, a man of humble origin, was Secretary of State for War and had shown great efficiency in that department. He was a servant such as Louis XIV loved to have, painstaking, efficient, and incapable of any ambition except to rise in the favour and service of his royal master. His reputation has been effaced by his subordinate Colbert and by his son, the notorious Louvois. 
Brienne, Lavrillière, and Guénégaud were the other secretaries in 1661, but the name of Lyon was greater than theirs. He had served as a diplomatist with great distinction under Mazarin and was soon to show his skill under Louis XIV as Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. For the moment, however, it was not war or foreign affairs which claimed the king's chief attention, but rather the Department of Finances, where Nicolas Fouquet still reigned as surintendant. It has been told in an earlier volume how Fouquet had used the troubles of the Fronde to amass for himself an enormous fortune by methods even more corrupt than the moral standard of the time allowed. Mazarin had known what he was doing, had winked at it, and had probably shared in the profits. But the new master of France had an authority and a spirit which placed him above such temptations, and the wealth and the position of Fouquet were such that he was the most real rival of the royal power. Colbert had already marked the dishonest gains of Fouquet and had reported them to Mazarin, but no action had been taken. His counsels had more weight with Louis XIV, and the overthrow and trial of Fouquet was the first serious measure of his reign. He was condemned to banishment and confiscation of property, but this was not enough for the king, who commuted the sentence into imprisonment for life. Fouquet was immured until his death in the prison of Pignarolo. The chief agent in pressing on the trial of Fouquet had been Colbert. He was sprung from a family engaged in commerce, and had at first thought of commerce as his destined career. But he had then entered the service of Lutelier, and had through him become acquainted with Mazarin, to whom he had rendered important services. His opposition to Fouquet was prompted by a detestation of the methods employed, which animated his whole career, but personal ambition also played its part. The fall of Fouquet brought Colbert to the control of the finances, though the title of surintendant was not employed again. Finance was now relegated to the attention of a council, but in this council Colbert was henceforth the supreme influence, though he at first only held the title of intendant des finances, which was later changed to controller general. His influence, too, extended far beyond the finances and largely controlled the king's policy until the epoch of the Great Wars began. Charge after charge was accumulated upon him. In 1661, he was member of the Council of Finance and Chargé d'Affaires for the Navy. In 1664, he became superintendent of buildings. He was raised to the post of Controller General of Finance in 1667. He became Secretary of State for the King's Household and Secretary of State for the Navy in 1669. Colbert was neither a philanthropist nor a philosopher. The relief of the poor is often mentioned in his projects, but it seems rather a conventional phrase than a deeply cherished aim. He has nothing to add to the economic or political theory of the state. He identified the wealth of a state with the amount of gold and silver which it contains. This was the common theory of his age. It was more individual to himself that he conceived the total volume of European commerce to be incapable of a material increase. What one nation gained, he concluded, another must lose. The idea of the fraternity of nations found no place in his scheme of thought. He was anxious that France should win from the other nations the commerce which they at present possessed. Commerce with him was divided from war by its methods rather than by its spirit or its objects. The greatness of France, he declared on one occasion, was proved not merely by its own flourishing condition, but by the poverty and general distress to which it had reduced its neighbours. Yet, while neither philanthropist nor philosopher, he was a man of business with a passionate enthusiasm for detail, industry and efficiency. And though not an original thinker, there is something revolutionary in his general objects, for he wished to make a France, in spite of all her feudal, aristocratic, and military traditions, a commercial state. To transfer her ambition from war to finance, to manage her policy not with an eye to glory, but on sound business principles. But he failed to bend France to his will. Her traditions stood in his way, and Louis XIV cared nothing for commerce and much for military glory. Yet even the small measure of success to which he attained makes an epoch in French history. The man himself is clearly revealed in his projects, his letters, and the correspondence and memoirs of the time. Madame de Sévigné calls him the North Star, in allusion both to his fixity of purpose and the coldness of his temperament. Industry with him ceased to be an effort and became a passion. 
The labour which he so readily underwent himself he exacted from others. He loved to work his way into all the details of business, to determine the methods by which it could be simplified and improved, and then to carry out the reform in spite of all obstacles thrown in his way by tradition, corruption, and the carelessness of the king. But a desire to paint Colbert as the king's good influence, while Louvois figures as the opposite, has sometimes led to the attribution of virtues to Colbert which are not really his. His life was not without very serious blemishes. He made himself a complacent instrument of a king's amours, and his passionate hatred of corruption did not prevent him from gaining titles, income, and offices for himself and his relatives by means which in another he would have bitterly condemned. As a man of business, Colbert, while he sought to open out new sources of income for the state, desired also to see the state managed on its present lines with economy and efficiency. For the present, these qualities were the last that could be attributed to the political and economic system of France. There was confusion everywhere. A medal struck in Colbert's honour, mentioned without exaggeration, Errarii rationes perturbatas et actenos inextricabiles. But confusion was not the only trouble. There had been corruption and knavery too. And, so soon as Fouquet had been arrested, and long before his trial had reached its strange termination, Colbert set to work. A tribunal was established to deal with the fraudulent financiers, and sat from 1661 to 1665. There was no inclination to lean on Mercy's side. Some were condemned to death, though none were executed. More than 4,000 were fined and compelled to disgorge large sums for the benefit of the treasury. The debts of a state next demanded his attention. Through the mouth of a king he repudiated certain debts altogether, because only a small portion of the original capital had ever reached the treasury. Then he declared that other bonds were to be cancelled by paying off the original sum advanced, less the sum of the interest already received. Those who were chiefly injured by this measure were the rentiers of the city of Paris, and their protests were loud and long. The king supported Colbert in a declaration wherein he stated that the cancelling of the bonds was the only way of effecting the relief of the people which we desire with so much ardour. But subsequently the procedure was modified in deference to the outcries of the people of Paris. The net result was, however, a considerable reduction in the indebtedness of the state. The assessment and collection of the taxes also called for immediate consideration. The chief of the taxes was the tailli. The abuses connected with this most burdensome and long-lived impost were threefold and may be summed up in the words privilege, arbitrary assessment, and oppressive exaction. Nobility, clergy, court, and government officials were exempt. Bois-Guilibert estimated in 1697 that not more than a third of a population contributed to the tailli, and this third was the poorest and most wretched. In the Pays d'Election, the total sum was fixed by the government, divided among the districts and parishes of a province by the intendant, and finally collected by prominent villagers who were made responsible in their own property for the full payment. The payment of the tax was enforced by distraint and quartering of soldiers, often accompanied by acts of cruelty, and was frequently evaded by corruption. The collectors especially groaned under the burden of their responsibility. Failure to find the prescribed amount of taxes was punished by imprisonment. In 1679, we hear that there were 54 collectors imprisoned in Tours alone. Colbert's letters are full of the shifts to which the taxpayers had recourse in their efforts to escape, and of the misery caused by the government exactions. In the Pays d'État, the taxes paid to the king were still called a don gratuit, or benevolence, and the tailli was by no means so grievous a burden, and did not discourage industry and in the cultivation of the soil. The total amount was fixed by the intendant, but the provincial estates had some influence in its assessment on districts and individuals, and it was reckoned not on the general wealth of a taxpayer, tailli personnel, but upon his house and landed property, tailli réel. How was the situation to be remedied? Colbert did not propose or desire to anticipate the ideas of 1789 by the abolition of privilege, but he scrutinized all claims to exemption and brought back into the ranks of the taxable a large number who had escaped under various pretexts. 
but above all he insisted on a more careful supervision of a collection of Ataï at each of its stages. He urged the intendants to keep a jealous watch on the receivers and collectors. He gave rewards to those who collected the tax with the least expense and punished the most wasteful. Sometimes there breaks out in his instructions a feeling of pity for the misery of the people, but it is for the most part the man of business who speaks. Here, as in the case of all Colbert's schemes for reform, the Dutch War of 1672 exercised a fatal effect, and the need for much money at once brought back many of the worst abuses that he had striven to destroy. A vast number of other taxes, usually in the nature of customs and excise, exhibited the same features of confusion, corruption, and oppression as those noticed in the case of Atayi. The abuses arose chiefly out of the indirect method of collecting these taxes. They were sold to capitalists, who usually undersold them, and thus a large number of intermediate profits were exacted from a taxpayer and were lost to the state. Here also Colbert exhibits his usual characteristics. His ideas do not rise above the existing system. He does not propose to institute the direct collection of these taxes by state officials, but he inspected the existing system with minute care. He punished fraud. He tried to establish greater simplicity of working. Yet even under the improved system introduced by Colbert, the weight of the burden of the taxes is shown by frequent provincial disturbances. These provincial risings make little mark in the memoirs of the time, though Madame de Sévigné devotes some precious pages to the troubles in Brittany, and the society of Versailles cared little about them but they were in many instances very serious, and a study of them shows how little the classic dignity of the court of the Grand Monarch is truly representative of the condition of France during his reign. There was a serious rising in the Boulonnais in 1662, caused by the quartering of troops and the imposition of unpopular taxes. It was suppressed without difficulty, but was followed by cruel and unjust punishments. Two years later, a much more dangerous movement broke out in the land of Gascony. Here it was a new tax on salt that raised the fury of the people. The nature of the country, and above all the skill and audacity of the leader, Odillot, prolonged the trouble for many months. In vain, those who were caught were cruelly punished, and high rewards were offered for the head of Odillot. He escaped in spite of all, sometimes finding a refuge on the Spanish side of a frontier. In the end, the government had to come to terms with the audacious leader and gave him the command of a regiment of dragoons. An equally serious revolt broke out in the Vivarais, where a report of absurd taxes exasperated the people beyond patience. It was reported that the peasants were to pay ten livres for each male child born and five for each female, three livres when they bought a new coat and five when they bought a new hat. The rising was not suppressed until a force of nearly 5,000 men had been dispatched from headquarters. After the Dutch War of 1672, there were even more serious troubles. In 1674, Bordeaux broke out into rebellion to the cry of Vive le roi sans gabelle! The forces of the Intendant were at first defeated, and it was only by great exertions that the rebellious city was reduced. The troubles in Brittany were perhaps the most serious of all, and they were supported by the Parlement. Before the province was quiet, the troops of the king had been guilty of horrible excesses and their officers of broken promises. Thus it is clear that even at the zenith of the absolute monarchy, the passions that inspired the peasantry in 1789 were not far below the surface. End of section 2 Section 3 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 5, The Age of Louis XIV. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1. The Government of Louis XIV, 1661 to 1715, by A. J. Grant, Part 2. While Colbert strove to improve the working of the actual machinery of France, and succeeded in diverting to the coffers of the state gains which had hitherto gone into the pockets of individuals, he was not contented with this. He desired also to add to the wealth of France by promoting her productive energies and by stimulating her industries. In all this he frankly takes the national point of view. The wealth of one country meant the poverty of her neighbour. Such was his economic creed. 
and he desired to acquire for France the industries which her neighbours, especially England and Holland, enjoyed. False theory here led him into the one supreme mistake of his life, his promotion of the war against Holland. His eyes were never open to his theoretic error, but he saw the war sweep away many of the reforms and improvements that had been the result of his passionate energy. His general industrial scheme is easily summarized. He desired to turn France into a busy hive of industry, to promote and direct those industries by the action of the state, to protect them from the rivalry of foreign countries by high protective tariffs, and then to open up trade in the commodities produced by improving the internal communication of France, by establishing trade with distant lands, and defending the country by an increased and remodelled fleet. He pursued this task with energy and gained as large a measure of success as his commercial theory, the lukewarmness of Louis XIV, and the condition of the country allowed. In 1663, he drew up a statement of the various articles imported into France and declared that they ought to be produced on French soil. Some of them had formerly been produced in France, but had disappeared. Others had always come from abroad. Domestic manufactures must be revived and stimulated. Foreign manufactures must be planted in the land. Many industries he found in the exclusive possession of foreign countries, Colbert was determined to break through these monopolies and to transfer these industries to French soil. He offered rewards to foreign workmen, English, Dutch, German, Swedish, Venetian, to come and settle in France and establish a centre for the manufacture of their various articles on French territory. At the same time, he punished severely Frenchmen who tried to transfer their industrial knowledge to a foreign soil. For the rest, all France must work hard. The pauperizing almsgiving of the monasteries must be limited. The admission of peasants into the orders of a celibate church must be discouraged. The king was to take the lead in the endeavor. Chief among the royal industries was the Gobelin factory, which soon gained a great celebrity for its tapestries. But there were more than a hundred other establishments that bore the title of royal. The example thus given would, it was hoped, be widely followed. Religious establishments were encouraged to manufacture. Municipalities were directed to turn their attention to industry. There were honours and state aid for those who laboured, and the great minister's bitterest opposition visited all idlers. But it was not in Colbert's nature to trust for the development of industrial France to the effects of competition and the free impulses of the people. He could not believe that a thing was done unless he did it himself or through his agents. He was alarmed and irritated to find that in certain markets the products of the French factories were not welcomed and were regarded as deficient in quality compared with those of the rivals of France. To alter this condition of things, the manufacturers must be schooled by the state. The industries of France were nearly all in the hands of trade guilds, and it was through these that Colbert brought the influence of the state to bear on the manufacturers. Edicts and regulations followed one another by the score. Methods of manufacture, with details as to the size, colour and quality of manufactured articles, were laid down. The tone adopted was that of a schoolmaster who alternates punishment with moral platitudes. Then inspectors were sent round the country to enforce these regulations. A famous edict of 1671 on the weaving and dyeing of cloth will show to what lengths he was ready to go. If bad cloth is produced, specimens of it are to be exposed on a stake with a ticket attached giving the name of a delinquent. If the same fault is committed again, the master or the workman who is at fault shall be censured in the meeting of the guild. In the event of a third offence, the guilty person shall himself be tied to the post for two hours with a specimen of the faulty product tied to him. The customs and traditions of France and the love of ease natural to all men resisted Colbert at every turn. His instructions show his growing anger with the fainéantise of the people. He closes the public houses during working hours. He uses irony and threats and often confesses that his efforts are in vain. But much was done. Industrial France was slowly coming into being. Patient energy and a continuation of peace would have done more. But Colbert had not succeeded in destroying or seriously injuring the industries of the neighbours of France, and his theory persuaded him that this was an indispensable sign of her prosperity. 
Holland, he complained, possessed 15,000 or 16,000 of the 20,000 ships that carried on the commerce of the world, and France had only five or 600. His first system of tariffs in 1664 contained nothing that went beyond the ideas and practices of the time. But three years later, he was more eagerly bent on the development of French industries and more determined on the destruction of the rival industries of the Dutch. We have seen that by him commerce was always regarded as a sort of war, and he saw, without desiring to withdraw from a struggle, that this time the commercial struggle was likely to lead to a military one. In the tariff of 1667, the customs on goods entering the Kingdom of France were in many instances doubled, in some considerably more than doubled. Thus, worsted stockings were charged eight livres instead of three livres ten sous. Fine cloth was rated eighty livres instead of forty, lace at sixty instead of twenty-five. A little later, an absolute prohibition was placed upon Venetian glass and lace. Heavy taxes had already been put upon the export of raw materials produced in France, and this was often extended so as to include corn. The Dutch answered with counter-tariffs, and this war of the tariffs leads directly up to the outbreak of war in 1672. In Colbert's scheme, industry and commerce were closely connected, and while he desired to stimulate the productive energies of France, he desired also to increase her share in the interchange of the commodities of the world. French traders lagged far behind those of Holland and England. They had hitherto played a small part in exploiting the wealth of the Indies and the Americas. Holland and England employed the method of chartered companies for their distant overseas traffic, and Colbert resolved to do the same. His dealing with this question reveals his invariable characteristics. France must have trade, and therefore she must have trading companies. The rich men of France, whether merchants or nobles, must be forced to invest in these companies. The companies, when formed, must be under direct state supervision at every point. All that energy and constant watchfulness could do for the promotion of trade would be done. Colbert's failure in this instance, as so often, was that he did not realize the part that liberty must of necessity play in the development of commerce. It was his habit to think of efficiency and liberty as rivals, not as partners. He reorganized the Company of the West Indies. He founded a company for the East Indies. These were followed by companies for the Levant, for the timber trade of the Pyrenees, for the Northern Seas. The development and the failure of all these companies follow similar lines. We may take the East India Company as typical of all. It was founded by a royal edict of August 1664. The capital was to be 15 million livres, and the king subscribed 3 million without asking for interest. The company was to enjoy a monopoly of all trade between the Cape of Good Hope and the East Indies. It was to possess in its own right whatever it took from the natives or from European enemies with full mining rights. The only burdens imposed on it were that it should build churches and pay priests for the conversion of the natives, and that it should in all things comply with the laws of France and the Coutumier de Paris. But this last stipulation proved ruinous to the prosperity of the company. It forced upon the agents of the company and upon all future colonists the restrictions both religious and political of France, restrictions damaging at home, suicidal abroad. Nothing went well with the company from the first. It was in vain that the rich and the noble were forced to subscribe. The record of the company is a record of corruption, failure, and bankruptcy. In eleven years the company lost six and a half millions of livres and Colbert heard with impotent jealousy that during this period the corresponding Dutch company had paid a dividend of 40%. Some of Colbert's companies did worse, some rather better. None succeeded in rivaling the great companies of England and Holland. The colonies of France were closely connected with the commercial companies, and their history during the administration of Colbert is much the same. France possessed excellent bases for colonization in Canada, Louisiana, and the West Indian Islands, and made a promising beginning in Madagascar, Ceylon, and India. But though Colbert realized to the full the possibilities of these colonial establishments, he interfered too much, and his interference was even more dangerous at so great a distance from France than it was in France itself. 
The spirit of religious intolerance, which was soon to strike a heavy blow against his enterprises at home, ruined those abroad. The only thing that could have served the French colonies was liberty, and of this Colbert, with all his vast gifts and powers, never knew the value. The internal customs of France were an irrational medley of tradition and privilege. Each province had a different system, and this system was guaranteed in many instances by the treaty whereby the province was incorporated with the crown. It was impossible even for the ruthless will of Colbert to make a clean sweep of all the fetters which the past had placed upon the future, but by persuasion he brought the great central provinces of France under the same system, that is, Normandy, Poitou, Maine, Picardy, Viony, Thouars, Perche, Champagne, Berry, the Nivernais, Burgundy, the Bourbonnais, the Beaujolais, Touraine, Bresse, Anjou, and the Ile de France. In this case he aimed at much more than he accomplished. I am opposed, he wrote, to all that interferes with commerce, which ought to be extremely free. He would have liked to see a uniform system of weights and measures, and the almost complete abolition of interprovincial custom and dues. He was not sufficiently supported by the king's authority to realize more than a small part of his plan, though French commerce had acquired a more unrestricted movement before the Dutch war. Colbert did much to facilitate the internal trade of France by the construction of canals and the improvement of roads. The idea of a chief among these enterprises, the famous Canal of Languedoc, which joined the Mediterranean to the Bay of Biscay, was no new one, though the actual project suggested to Colbert was due to Pierre-Paul Riquet, who was employed in the administration of the Gabelle. Colbert eagerly adopted the proposal and at first thought of making a canal capable of carrying ships of war, but he had to be satisfied with a more modest scheme. The difficulties, financial and engineering, were very great, and towards the end Colbert and Riquet had ceased to be on good terms with each other. The canal was opened in May 1681, a few months after the death of Riquet. It was, for the times, an extraordinary feat in engineering. The canal was 162 miles long, had 75 locks, and was carried over a watershed 830 feet above the sea level. But Colbert was far from resting satisfied with the one great enterprise. He directed the improvement of the waterways throughout France, the making of new canals, and above all the improvement of the roads. Since the time of the Romans there had been no such roadmaker in France as he. Colbert's vision of a France, colonial, industrial, and commercial, necessarily included a strong navy. What Richelieu had done in this respect had been undone in the period of Mazarin's domination. Colbert took up the work with more than his usual energy, and here all his great qualities were seen at their best. When he began, the warships of a French navy were, he tells us, only twenty in number, and of these not more than two or three were really serviceable. But by 1671 the number had risen to 196 effective vessels, and by 1677 the figure had risen to 270. Thus Colbert saw the king in a position to realize the object summed up by him in the phrase « se passer des étrangers ». The old harbours and arsenals of France were repaired and new ones created. A fresh life was infused into Toulon, Rochefort, Brest, Le Havre, Dunkirk and shipbuilding rapidly developed. He gave as careful a consideration to the question of the crews as to the ships themselves, but here the hardness of his nature becomes painfully evident. He forced the maritime population of France into the service with a vigour not less brutal than that of the English press of later days, but the cruelties to which his system could descend are seen at their worst in relation to the galleys. These vessels had been of the greatest service in the naval warfare of the Mediterranean, and Colbert was passionately determined to build and equip them with the greatest possible rapidity. He succeeded in building them, and boasted that the French yards were capable of turning out a galley within the space of twenty-four hours, but the crews gave him endless trouble. The toil of the rowers was so terrible and their treatment so cruel that free men could not be induced in sufficient quantities to undertake the work. The galleys were a common form of punishment for the criminals of France, and the correspondence of Colbert shows him to have urged upon the judges the sentencing of as large a number as possible to the galleys. The vagrants of France were forced wholesale into this living death, and those condemned for a short period were often detained for life. 
history has few more terrible chapters than that of a barbarous treatment of the French galley slaves. We stand amazed at the different subjects which came under a survey of Colbert and at the minute attention which he was able to bestow on them. There is assuredly no French statesman besides him whose energy flows through so many channels until we come to Napoleon. As Minister of Marine, the fortifications of France were partly under his control, and with Vauban he laboured to make them impregnable. He was interested in the public works of Paris, and hoped to make the king concentrate his architectural ambitions on the Louvre, and he saw with despair that the royal inclination was turned wholly in the direction of Versailles. He protested against the expenses of Versailles with singular frankness, declaring that the new palace would perhaps afford the king pleasure and amusement, but would never increase his glory. But all was in vain, and his projected improvements for Louvre were never realised. In order to complete the survey of his manifold activities, we need here only mention that the creation of five new academies was due to Colbert, the Academy of Inscriptions and Medals, the Academy of Science, the French Academy at Rome, the Academy of Architecture, the Academy of Music. Though with these royal protection and ministerial direction counted for much and sometimes hindered their free development, they all lived and flourished and were one of the most permanent effects of Colbert's genius. Of the pensions which he accorded to men of science and letters, the first list, 1662, contained 60 names, 45 French and 15 belonging to foreign countries. It must, however, be allowed that the list, and especially the order of names in it, suggests no very favourable idea of Colbert's literary tastes. His object was, in point of fact, mainly political, and, by acting as Messinus under Louis XIV, he intended to control the men of letters and, through them, to influence public opinion. In its ideals and its efforts, both political and literary, the age of Louis XIV typifies order and authority. But an inquiry into the actual condition of things reveals a striking contrast to the ideals of the age. The administration of justice was irregular and corrupt. The encroachments of the crown had broken the independence of feudal justice, but it still subsisted in a most confused, arbitrary and corrupt form. Crimes were amazingly frequent even in the neighbourhood of Paris and were increased by the brutality of the punishments inflicted. The procedure, both in civil and criminal cases, was uncertain, dilatory, and embarrassed by the rival claims of innumerable feudal courts as against the royal magistrates and one another. The corruption of the provincial administration of justice is attested by innumerable complaints, and the rich and powerful among French criminals enjoyed a large measure of impunity. All that was best in Louis XIV and in the traditions of a French crown fought against this state of things, and here also Colbert was the chief agent and stimulus to the royal will. A series of ordinances, of which the chief were the Ordonnance Civile, 1667, the Ordonnance Criminelle, 1670, the Ordonnance sur les eaux et forêts, and the Edit sur le commerce, 1673, defined the procedure in various departments and controlled the legal system of France until the Code Louis was replaced, a century and a half later, by the Code Napoléon. The general tendency and the general result of these ordinances was excellent, but in some points they stereotyped odious practices, and Colbert defended at every point the cause of monarchy rather than humanity. The use of torture was prescribed, counsel was denied to the accused in criminal cases, the treatment of bankrupts was severe in the extreme, but it was not enough to declare the royal authority by ordinance, it was also to be demonstrated in action. A royal commission under the presidency of the Sieur de Novion was sent down to Clermont en Auvergne in 1665 to repress disturbances there and assert the royal power against the presumption of the nobles. Fléchier, afterwards Bishop of Nîmes, has left us a brilliant and amusing description of the procedure of this commission. The chief incident was the trial and execution of a vicomte de la Motte du Canilac for the killing of a man of humble birth in the prosecution of a private quarrel. The peasantry, when they found the royal authority thrown on their side against their aristocratic oppressors, passed at once from servility to insolence, refused the usual acts of courtesy to the nobles, and would clearly have anticipated the violences of 1789 if the government had not been strong enough to repress them. What was done in Auvergne was repeated in other parts of France. 
Novion reported to Louis XIV that a single official could now execute orders which could not formerly have been carried out without the support of a body of soldiers. If all exaggerations are excluded, we still see here the action of a monarchy in its most typical and beneficent aspect. The disorders of Paris and the neighbourhood, which at one time reached an incredible height, were largely remedied by the appointment of La Reynie as lieutenant of police. The first eleven years of Louis XIV's personal government are so much influenced by the ideas of Colbert that the reign of a king and the biography of a minister are almost identical. But before the end of that period, Colbert had found a serious rival. The pacific designs of Colbert were opposed by the plans and influence of Louvois, the Minister of War. Louvois and Colbert were alike in their industry and in their devotion to the service and glory of their king, but they were alike in nothing else. The causes of their personal hostility have been examined as if there were some secret to be revealed, but in fact Louvois crossed Colbert's path at every turn. He urged Louis to spend money on Versailles, while Colbert wanted to make Paris the royal residence. He wanted to spend the revenues of France on military preparations, while Colbert wished to use them for the promotion of colonial and industrial enterprises. In short, he was for war, and Colbert, with one fatal exception, was for peace. The struggle between them for their master's support was very keen, but it was decided in favour of Louvois. For some years before his death, Colbert had suffered from gout, and this decision seems to have overwhelmed him. He died in September 1683 almost in disgrace. It was the supreme misfortune of France that Louis XIV, with all his great qualities of intelligence and character, had so imperfect a sympathy with Colbert's aims. What might not Colbert have done if he had served to Frederick the Great? The year 1672 and the outbreak of the war with the United Netherlands mark the end of a pacific period of Louis XIV's reign, throughout which Colbert's had been the chief influence over the royal mind. During those first twelve years of the reign, the prosperity of France was not uncheckered, nor her aims always right, but the chief effort of the government was directed towards commercial and industrial development, the limitation of privilege, and the unification of the state. The War of Devolution had been only a slight interruption to this progress, but the Dutch quarrel opened a continuous period of war, lasting with little real interruption from 1672 to 1713. During this period, the internal development of France was of little account. Colbert's influence had much declined even before his death. The king's mind was absorbed by military glory and religious orthodoxy, and these two tendencies were represented in his court by Louvois and Madame de Maintenon. Louvois was the son of Lutelier, of whom mention was made above, and who, in 1655, had procured for him the right of succession to his office, in accordance with the dangerous custom which established a sort of heredity in many of the highest positions in the state. In 1662, the king raised Louvois to the position of Secretary of State, and from that date he became one of the chief influences with the king and the rival of Colbert. He was a man exactly suited to win and to retain the favour of Louis XIV. To the rest of the world he was disdainful, arrogant and violent, but in his dealings with the king he showed himself pliant and servilely deferential. It flattered the pride of a king to see his power over one who submitted to no other authority. Louvois did not, like Colbert, strive to thwart the king's natural disposition. Rather, he impelled him towards the goal to which his natural bent directed him war, glory, dominion, and self-worship. These were the objects that Louvois held up before the eyes of Louis XIV, and to which he was by nature only too much inclined. There are two sides to the work of Louvois, and our judgment on him will vary widely, according as he is regarded as an administrator or a statesman. As a statesman, he not only urged the king on to those military adventures which brought the age of Louis XIV to so disastrous an end, but he also approved and cooperated in the tragic blunder of a revocation of the Edict of Nantes. But as an administrator and organiser, he deserves the very highest praise. He found the French army, famous indeed and victorious, but full of gross corruption and so bound by traditions, usually of feudal origin, that it was far from answering quickly to the wishes of the central government. Louvois, acting in agreement with the whole tendency of the ideas and policy of Louis XIV, 
centralized the administration of the army, made the control of the king direct and paramount, and eliminated what remained of aristocratic influence. At the same time, he improved its weapons, tightened its discipline, punished abuses and brought its different parts into organic connection. The abuses in the army were chiefly due to the power and influence which the nobility still held in the recruiting and organization of the army. It was the nobles, not the government, who collected and equipped the troops. They had themselves purchased the posts which they held, and they found various ways of making a profit out of their positions. The chief of these was to make a return of, and consequently to receive pay for, more men than were actually to be found in the ranks. On days of official inspection, the gaps were filled up by paid substitutes, passe volant, whom Louvois strove to suppress by the severest penalties. The scandals and corruptions in the provisioning of the army were also notorious. Louvois sought to remedy this state of things chiefly by bringing the army under more direct control of the government. He was not prepared to revolutionize the whole system, but by indefatigable attention to detail and by the strictest severity against proved malefactors, he succeeded in abolishing or diminishing the worst evils. The army was still recruited by the nobles, but Louvois appointed inspectors to ensure that the soldiers for whom the government paid really existed, and to repress the license and indiscipline of the noble officers. The cynical hardness of Louvois' nature, the brutalité that is so often attributed to him, here stood France in good stead, and he was excellently served by two inspectors, the famous Martinet for the infantry and de Fourril for the cavalry. But Louvois was not satisfied with the enforcement of honesty. Equipment and organization both underwent important modifications. The bayonet was introduced, the fusil, flintlock, took the place of the mousquet, which had been discharged by means of a match. The grenadiers were organized into an important force, the status of the engineers and of the infantry was raised, the artillery was brought into closer relationship with the other parts of the army. A uniform was not yet insisted on for the whole army, but much was done to improve and regularize the appearance of the troops. Much thought also was devoted to the question of victualling. The slowness of the movements of earlier armies was often explained by the impossibility of procuring supplies. By Louvois' orders, magazines were established which greatly improved the mobility of the armies in the earlier wars of the reign. He carried on the work of Richelieu too by abolishing certain posts whose occupants held an almost independent position. The position of colonel-general of the infantry was suppressed, and, though the colonel-general of the cavalry and the grand maître of the artillery still remained, their powers were so reduced that they no longer conflicted with Louvois' chief aim of concentrating all military power in the hands of the king. A reform of a different kind must also be mentioned. He made generous provision for disabled soldiers by the establishment of the Hôtel des Invalides. In sum, Louvois was efficient in the highest degree, as energetic as Colbert, and capable of infusing his own energy into his subordinates, ready to take responsibility and usually able to justify it by success. Without the efficiency of the French war office under Louvois, it is impossible to conceive of all the triumphs dating from the earlier part of Louis XIV's reign. Before the death of Colbert, another influence beside that of Louvois had begun to be strong with the king. Orthodox pietism had triumphed over him in the person of Madame de Maintenon. The political marriage, which had been arranged for him at the Peace of the Pyrenees, was not likely to retain exclusive control of his heart. The license, which had become traditional with the kings of France, would not be checked by loyalty to Maria Theresa, who was a true and virtuous wife, but neither intellectual nor attractive. The king had been strongly attached in the first instance to Maria Mancini, the niece of Mazarin, and it needed all the power of a cardinal to induce Louis XIV to carry out the stipulated treaty and marry Maria Theresa. Immediately after the marriage, gossip was busy with the king's infidelities, and soon it was known that Louise de la Valliere was the chosen favorite. The king felt for her probably the purest passion of his life. She was only seventeen at the time of their first acquaintance, and her great beauty, charm of manner, and sweetness of disposition sufficed to maintain her influence for many years. But she was in many ways singularly unfitted to maintain her position at court. 
Her conscience was not easy. The religious life was always attractive to her, and when, at last, she found her power waning and a rival preferred to herself, it was chiefly her genuine love for the king that made her regret the change. In 1674 she retired to a Carmelite nunnery. Her successor was Madame de Montespan, who had intrigued desperately against Mademoiselle de la Vallière and held the first place in the king's affections from 1670 to 1679, though not without occasional rivals. She was in point of character and person almost the antithesis of her predecessor, haughty, domineering, proud of her position, striking and imperious in her type of beauty. She had innumerable enemies at court, both among the nobles and the clergy, but she outfaced them, and for nearly ten years she triumphed over them. Her eclipse came from a strange quarter. She had borne the king several children, and it was necessary to find a discreet person to attend to their education. She met Madame Scarron at the house of a friend, induced her to accept the charge of her children, and thus introduced to the king the woman who was destined to be her successful rival. Madame Scarron, who soon received at the king's hands the title of Marquise de Maintenon, is perhaps the most interesting figure in the court of Louis XIV. She was the grandchild of Agrippa d'Aubigny, the famous Protestant leader of the 16th century. Her father had been a worthless spendthrift, and she had passed through many remarkable changes in life before she came to be the unacknowledged wife of the most splendid of the French kings. She was born in the antechamber of a prison, had spent some portion of her early life in Martinique, had been left an orphan at the age of seven, and, following the tenets of her protectors, had passed from Catholicism to Protestantism, and from Protestantism back to Catholicism. In her seventeenth year she had married Scarron, a comic dramatist of reputation in Paris, preferring, as she has told us, such a marriage to the cloister. At twenty-five years of age she was left a widow, and lived for some time an obscure life until an accidental meeting with Madame de Montespan made her the governess of a king's children. In her new task she came into contact with the king, and soon became a well-known figure in the court. She played a part of extraordinary difficulty with the utmost adroitness. Though she was in name the servant of the king's mistress, she gained great influence with the king himself. It was partly due to her that he severed himself from Madame de Montespan and was reconciled to his much-injured wife. After the death of Maria Theresa in 1683, Madame de Maintenon was secretly married to the king in January 1684 in the presence of Arlet, Archbishop of Paris, and Louvois. She was a woman of great charm and dignity of manner, demure, self-restrained, and even cold in temperament, loving sobriety and reason both in thought and action, a character apparently little fitted for so romantic a destiny. She was, too, a woman sincerely, if not passionately, religious, and it was the religious element in her mind and character which contributed much to her conquest of Louis XIV. The religious vein had never been wanting in Louis XIV, even in his careless and licentious youth, and his confessor had always been one of the chief influences upon him. But under Madame de Maintenon, the whole tone of the court had changed. The splendid gaiety of the early years was thrown aside, and the practices of religion became the mode at Versailles. Madame de Maintenon's influence cooperated with this religious development, and did much to make the once brilliant court of Versailles decorous and dull. As Louis XIV drew near to the church, his personal morality underwent a most welcome improvement, but the new influence was unfortunately answerable for the worst political mistake in his reign, which contained so many. For, unfortunately, the conversion of Louis XIV was one which had no root in reason and bore no fruit of charity. The Church had never abandoned her desire for uniformity or her belief that physical coercion might be legitimately used to enforce it, and thus Louis XIV was led on to the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. End of section 3 Section 4 of The Cambridge Modern History, Volume 5, The Age of Louis XIV. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 the Government of Louis XIV, 1661 to 1715, by A. J. Grant, Part Three. 
The attack upon the Protestants of France, which culminated in the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, was due almost entirely to religious intolerance, little complicated by the political and social motives which had intensified the religious struggles of the 16th century. The Huguenots of France had lost the political ambitions and aristocratic connections, which made them a serious danger in the days of the League and perhaps in the time of Richelieu. They had taken no part in the wars of the Fronde, and Louis XIV, in 1666, publicly acknowledged the vigour and success with which they had resisted the party of rebellion during that period. They supported the commercial schemes of Colbert with a force out of proportion to their numbers, nor did they threaten the church any more than the state. There were fine orators and some scholars of distinction in their ranks, but their propagandist zeal had waned. They only needed to be left alone to provide France with a great source of strength, both moral and material. Two forces drove France down the fatal descent, from being the foremost representative of religious toleration to becoming a belated exponent of religious persecution in its most odious character. First, the king's personal feelings counted for something. Religion had come to be a strong and genuine motive with him, and together with his vanity impelled him towards the establishment of religious unity. But the church in France was the strongest driving force. She was at the zenith of her power. Her clergy were distinguished by sincerity, learning, and even by social sympathies. But they had always regarded the Edict of Nantes as an insult and passionately desired its withdrawal, or, if that were not attainable, its restriction within the narrowest possible limits. The assemblies of the clergy, held every five years, continually demanded fresh measures of persecution. The fact that the clergy of France were about the same time engaged in a serious controversy with the papacy as to the question of Gallican liberties made them all the more anxious to prove their orthodoxy by measures against the Protestants, and it is upon them that the chief responsibility must fall. The end of the struggle was not foreseen. Neither king nor clergy had any intention of abolishing the edict from the first, they desired merely to harass the Protestants by the most rigid interpretation of the edict and by the withdrawal of all royal favour from the despised sectaries. This course had been suggested so early as 1655 by Gondrin, Archbishop of Sens, and the king began to act on it in the first year of his personal reign. For in 1661, commissioners were sent round France to inquire into the administration of the edict, and henceforth the liberties of the Huguenots were curtailed at every point. Thus, in 1661, toleration was withdrawn from the Pays du Gex, conterminous with Geneva, on the ground that it had not been a part of French territory at the time of the issuing of the edict, Yet in that territory there were 17,000 Protestants, while the Roman Catholics numbered only 400. During the following year, the action of the state troubled the Huguenots in many ways, but in 1666 a notable and open attack upon their privileges ensued. The General Assembly of the Clergy in 1665 had drawn up an address to the King suggesting certain liberties of which it might be possible to deprive the Huguenots while still maintaining the letter of the edict. Most of the proposals of the clergy were accepted by Louis XIV in the Edict of 1666, which may be taken as opening the era of persecution. It professed to maintain the Edict of Nantes, but each of its sixty clauses embodied some unjust decision against the Huguenots. Henceforth, the liberties of the Huguenots were curtailed by a hundred different methods, open and secret. Two may be taken as representative. In 1666, those of the Huguenots who accepted Catholicism were allowed three years in which to pay their debts, and in 1669, the Chambers of the Edict, established in 1598, were suppressed. The position of the Protestants became grievous in the extreme, but for the present, Louis XIV was not prepared to go further. The Elector of Brandenburg had protested against the Edict of 1666, and in 1669, Louis XIV withdrew many of its clauses. The Protestants were still oppressed by indirect persecutions of every kind, but the years between 1669 and 1680 were a period of comparative peace. During much of it, foreign affairs were claiming the king's attention. Colbert's influence was still strong, and thus no positive legislative enactments of importance are recorded against the Huguenots. But signs of coming danger were not wanting. 
the clergy maintained a war of pamphlets against them and demanded the destruction of the Hydra. Turenne's conversion was a serious blow, for so long as the first soldier in France was one of them, his fellow Huguenots felt secure from the worst. The government, moreover, was rigorously excluding from its service, even from the lowest grades of it, all Protestants. Even Colbert had to bow to this policy, the danger of which he realized. But the most important move in these years of comparative peace was the institution, in 1677, by Pellisson, himself a renegade Huguenot, of the Treasury of Conversions. A considerable sum of money was put at the disposal of the agents of the crown wherewith to purchase the adhesion of Huguenots. It was claimed that this means had been successful in procuring over 58,000 conversions by the year 1682. The year 1681 marks the beginning of the end. The Peace of Nijmegen had left the king's hands free to attend to domestic concerns. About the same time, Madame de Montespan's influence with the king came to an end, and though there is no evidence to connect Madame de Maintenon with a policy of a revocation, her rise meant the strengthening of religion and the weakening of political interests in the king's mind. It is the special characteristic of a tragedy of the revocation that so many good men and good impulses contributed to induce the king to commit his criminal and suicidal blunder. In June 1681 was issued an edict unsurpassed in the history of religious persecution for its mixture of hypocrisy and cruelty. It declared that children of Protestant parents might declare themselves converted to Catholicism at the age of seven. The edict, which at first sight seemed merely ridiculous, proved in its working a terrible weapon of religious coercion. Any trivial acts or words could be interpreted as implying adhesion to Catholicism. Then came the invasion of Protestant households and the forcible abduction of children. All appeals to the king were in vain. He had perhaps not yet determined on the revocation of the edict, but he told Ruvigny, the deputy general of the Reformed churches, that he was henceforth indispensably bound to effect the conversion of all his subjects and the extirpation of heresy. The attack became hotter during the following years, and the violations of the words of the edict itself grosser. In 1682, a pastoral from the leaders of the church in France was ordered to be read in all places of Protestant worship, in which the continued obstinacy of the Huguenots was threatened, with evils incomparably more terrible and deadly than they had suffered up to the present. Protestants were excluded from most trade guilds, from the financial service of the state, and from the king's household. Their places of worship were closed in great numbers, usually on the plea that they had received back converts to Catholicism. Their colleges and schools were abolished. When they attempted to meet on the sites of their ruined temples, this was interpreted as rebellion and punished with barbarous severity. It is reckoned that by 1684, 570 out of the 815 French Protestant churches had been closed. Between 1665 and 1685, nearly 200 edicts were issued dealing with la religion prétendue réformée, and nearly all of these curtail some liberty or impose some new constraint. Here they destroy a church, there they compel midwives to baptize the children of Huguenots in the Catholic faith, if their life is uncertain. One edict orders that a seat shall be placed in all Protestant temples for the accommodation of Catholic officials, another that no Protestant minister may reside for more than three years in the same place. Already the Huguenots had begun to stream in thousands to foreign countries in search of the security and livelihood which France denied them. But the government was not satisfied with legal chicanery and indirect pressure, in 1681, Marillec invented the method of a dragonade. The quartering of soldiers on private persons was habitually practiced in France. It was a grievous burden to whomsoever it befell. But when the soldiers were quartered specially on Protestants and received a hint that their excesses would be overlooked by their officers, it became for the sufferers from it a martyrdom. But in 1681, the government was not ready to adopt as its own the procedure of Marillec, which raised difficulties with foreign governments and vastly increased the tide of emigration. When, therefore, Ruvigny reported the iniquities which were being transacted in Poitou, the king disowned Marillec and shortly afterwards recalled him. But in 1685, Foucault was directed by Louvois to use the same methods in Bearn, 
Tens of thousands of Protestants saved themselves from outrage and torture by verbal adhesion to the religion of their persecutors. Then the same system was extended from Bian to other provinces where Protestantism was strong. But the Edict of Nantes still remained on the statute book, and the government pretended to observe it. The farce soon ceased. Every influence at court was in favour of the revocation. Chief among the king's councillors in the matter were his confessor, the Jesuit Père Lachaise, Arlet, the Archbishop of Paris, Louvois, the Minister of War, and Lutelier, the Chancellor, the father of Louvois. Madame de Maintenon was admitted to conferences on the treatment of the Huguenots and found her position as an ex-Huguenot a difficult one. She tells us that her advice was always for moderation. We must not hurry, we must convert, not persecute. There was a period of hesitation in which the question of policy and legality was considered. The court adopted the view that Protestantism in France had almost ceased to exist, and that the Protestants had, of their own free will and uncoerced, flocked to reunion with the Catholic Church. Père Lachaise promised that the completion of the work would not cost a drop of blood, and Louvois held the same opinion. The accession of James II to the English throne removed all danger on that side. Thus, revocation was determined on. The edict was signed by the king on October 17, 1685. The edict of revocation declares in its preamble that the best and largest part of the adherents of the Protestant faith have embraced Catholicism and that, in consequence, the edict of Nantes is no longer necessary. That edict, therefore, and all other edicts of toleration were repealed. All meetings for public worship were henceforth interdicted to Protestants. Their ministers were exiled, their schools closed. No lay Protestants were to leave the kingdom. Any attempt at departure was to be punished by sentence to the galleys for men, by confiscation of body and goods for women. The last clause stated that all who still remained adherents of the Protestant faith should be allowed to dwell in the towns and other places of the kingdom without let or hindrance on account of their religion. But this provision, whatever meaning it was intended to bear, proved utterly futile. While the pulpits and the literature of the day were declaring that heresy had died down of its own weakness, won over by the beauty and the truth of Catholicism, the agents of the government were well aware that it was still the faith of many thousands. The work of the Dragonades began again and was conducted more ruthlessly than before. The emigration of Protestants, which had been going on for ten years, now assumed proportions still more alarming. In spite of all prohibitions and the condemnation of great numbers of Huguenots to the living death of the galleys, vast numbers streamed across every frontier. Certain districts, such as the Pays de Gex, were nearly depopulated, Others, such as Normandy, where nearly the whole of the commerce and industry had been in the hands of the Huguenots, were reduced by the emigration to great poverty. Brandenburg, once so valuable an ally of the French king, was foremost in giving an asylum to the refugees. So strong was the feeling in England that even James II could not restrain it. He was compelled in March 1686 to promote a public collection for the benefit of the French refugees, and a very large proportion of them found a home in England. In France, the chorus of contemporary approval of the king's action was almost unbroken by criticism, though a little later Vauban and Saint-Simon both expressed their hearty abhorrence of the methods employed and their fear of the consequences. But among later historians, no apologist has been found for these proceedings. The strength of France was diminished, and the strength of her enemies increased. It made the elector of Brandenburg a more determined opponent than he had been before. It contributed to the overthrow of James II three years later, whereby England became the most tenacious of all the enemies of France. It ruined the industrial and commercial projects of Colbert, and it added to the military and commercial efficiency of other countries, more especially of Brandenburg, Prussia, and England. The king had said that he would complete the conversion of the Huguenots, even if it cost him his right hand. And the disaster was not smaller than what is implied by the metaphor. It was, moreover, soon obvious that the revocation and its consequences had done nothing to strengthen the church in whose cause it was undertaken. Rather, it contributed unmistakably to the rise of the anti-clerical movement of the next century, which made the repetition of such an incident forever impossible in Europe. 
Soon after the beginning of the War of the Spanish Succession, a rising in the southeast of France revealed how complete had been the failure of the government to extirpate Protestantism. The hills and forests of the district of the Cévennes afforded shelter to a population which still cherished the Huguenot faith, in spite of all measures taken against them. Persecution deepened their faith into fanaticism and mysticism. Voices were heard in the air, men and women were seized with convulsions, and prophesied of the iniquities of the Church of Rome and her coming overthrow. Such incidents had taken place during the war with the Grand Alliance, and they were intensified when the conclusion of peace in 1697 brought further sufferings on the district. When the outbreak of the War of the Spanish Succession again turned the attention and the resources of the government to the frontiers, the exasperation of the peasants broke out into a rising which for four years, 1702-5, to five, proved an annoying and dangerous addition to the burdens of the foreign war. It began with the murder of the Abbé du Chéla, a notorious persecutor, in 1702. Immediately it assumed dangerous proportions. The peasants, nicknamed camisards by their opponents from their habit of wearing a shirt over their clothes in nocturnal attacks, found leaders well suited to the nature of the country and the character of the people in Roland and Cavalier. Roland's was the greater and nobler personality, but it was upon Cavalier that attention was riveted towards the end of a struggle. He was not more than eighteen years old at the beginning of the rising, but he showed extraordinary gifts both for the simple strategy that the occasion required and for the maintenance of discipline. The struggle was conducted with great barbarity on both sides. The royal troops hunted down the commissars like vermin without regard to age or sex. Marshal Montrevel, who succeeded the Count de Broy in command of the royal forces, destroyed houses, farms, and crops, and reduced the population to the extreme of starvation. But, as the rebels did not surrender, Montrevel was withdrawn, and the conduct of operations was entrusted to Marshal Villars, the most successful of the soldiers employed by France in the War of the Spanish Succession, and a man of great tact and diplomatic powers. He at once adopted a more conciliatory policy and, in May 1704, secured an interview with Cavalier at Nîmes. Much to the indignation of his comrades, who still remained in arms, he was induced to surrender by the offer of command in the royal armies and promises vague and illusory of toleration for the Protestants. He actually entered the royal army, but convinced of the bad faith of his king, he escaped and joined the Allies. He died in 1740, governor of the Isle of Jersey, and a major general in the British service. After his surrender, the resistance in the Cévennes soon collapsed. Roland was killed in a fight. Protestantism still lingered and was still subject to cruel persecutions. It was not until 1710 that the last of the Camisard leaders was hunted down, but Protestantism was never really extirpated from the valleys of the Cévennes. The remainder of the reign of Louis XIV exhibits little of general interest in the domestic policy and development of France. The long struggle of the Dutch War had thrown the finances into confusion, and now, after a peace of only nine years, France entered upon what was practically 25 years, 1688 to 1713, of warfare against a vast European coalition. War and diplomacy monopolized the attention of the government during all the period, and the internal administration shows us little more than the reaction of the great struggle. One result of the war with the Grand Alliance was the utter destruction of the municipal liberties of France. Colbert had already interfered with the towns, but his interferences had been directed against abuses and carried out in the interests of justice and efficiency. He found the municipal finances in confusion, the taxes often employed for the pleasures of the magistrates, the rich throwing a large part of their proper burdens on the shoulders of the poor. Colbert submitted the municipal accounts to the inspection of the royal intendant. He scrutinized all claims to fiscal privilege and forbade all improper employment of town revenues. Careless as he always was of popular liberties and blind to the advantages of self-government, he often interfered in the elections, imposed candidates of his own, and annulled the popular choice where he disapproved of the result. But it was after Colbert's death that the decisive blow was struck, and for motives far lower than his. In 1692, the war with the Grand Alliance was straining the resources of France, and the government had recourse to expedients of every kind. 
Chief among these was the sale of offices, and this evil practice received an indefinite extension when, by the edict of 1692, it was applied to municipal magistracies. The king declared that it was his intention to create mayors in all municipalities whose offices should be for life and hereditary. His action was justified in a preamble of amusing sophistry by the explanation that, having no longer any reason to fear successors, they would exercise their functions without passion and with the freedom which is necessary to secure equality in the assessment of the public burdens. The same process was carried still lower in the municipal scale by an edict of January 1704, which declared that aldermen and all other municipal magistracies should be brought under similar rules. And again, the change was justified on the ground that an annual tenure of office was insufficient to acquaint men with the duties of their office and to make them useful to their fellow citizens. The real motive was financial. The sale of these offices was a valuable source of income to the crown and a terrible burden on the population. The government, which during the next century grew almost continuously weaker, could not renounce an expedient so easy and elastic. In 1706, alternative mayors were created that there might be two offices to sell. During the 18th century, the right of free election was seven times sold to the municipalities of France and seven times taken away again. Municipal government sank lower and lower in France until the revolution came. Colbert died in 1683, Louvois in 1691. After the deaths of these powerful men, the king's government grew more and more personal, and his dislike of independence in his servants greater. Le Pelletier was at the head of the finances from 1683 to 1689. Pontchartrain, from 1689 to 1699, held the control of the finances as well as other posts, and by his position, though not by his abilities, recalled the situation of Colbert. Chamillard succeeded to the control of the finances in 1699 and was followed in 1708 by Desmarais, a nephew of Colbert. The losing struggle which France fought against Europe during these years brought confusion on her finances and ruin on her manufactures. Yet the very pressure of her necessities made her look at times in the direction in which, at the time of revolution, she found at last an escape from her financial embarrassments. Thus, in 1699, the Capitation was imposed. This was in name an income tax that should have been paid by the whole population of France, privileged and unprivileged. But the regime of privilege was too deeply rooted, not only in the laws but in the habits and ideas of the country. The Capitation was arbitrarily assessed by the Intendant, and in some districts of France they avowed that they made the tax press on the unprivileged with a weight nearly ten times as great as that which it brought to the nobility. For instance, in the Orléanais, the noble paid only a hundredth part of his income, the unprivileged an eleventh part. The Capitation was withdrawn at the time of the peace and re-established during the War of the Spanish Succession. But it was not enough, and in 1710 the dixième was established, an income tax which should have fallen on all incomes without exception. But, as before, the privileged managed in many instances to elude it, and the bankrupt government of France supported existence by means of affaires extraordinaires, that is to say, temporary expedients such as the sale of offices, forced loans from the clergy, debasement of the coinage, loans, lotteries, anticipations of revenue, and in spite of all, the balance during the Spanish War was increasingly against the state. As the glory of the Grand Monarque passed under heavy clouds, he became increasingly intolerant of criticism and opposition, but the situation was so serious that criticism made itself heard. Fenelon had been tutor to the Duke of Burgundy, and we may see from Telemaque what were the ideas with which he had tried to inspire his pupil. A warm spirit of humanity breathes through that and all Fenelon's writings, but his sympathies are with the aristocratic and feudal past, and his influence, if it had made itself felt in public affairs, would have told in favour of a restoration of the power of the nobility. 
His political ideas are expressed not only in Telemaque, but also in L'Examen de Conscience sur les devoirs de royauté, which he composed for the Duke of Burgundy, and in the Memoir concernant la guerre de la succession d'Espagne. But though all his writings imply a criticism on the absolutist system of Louis XIV, it is in a letter which he wrote to the king, probably in 1691, that the most hostile judgment is expressed. The fate of the letter is somewhat mysterious, and it is improbable that so bitter an indictment ever reached the eyes or the ears of the great king. In this letter he denounced the Dutch war as the source of all the others. He derided the king's military preparations and directly attacked the ideals and the character of the king. You are praised to the skies, he wrote, for having impoverished France and you have built your throne on the ruin of all classes in the state. Before the end of a reign, men of practical knowledge attacked the king's government with even greater energy. Pierre Le Pesson, sieur de Bois-Gilbert, was a magistrate at Rouen. He published in 1697 a book called The Détail de la France and another The Factum de la France, which is little more than a repetition of the conclusions of the first in 1707. He writes with vigour and occasionally with humour, his books are occupied to a large extent with theoretic problems of political economy, as to which he shows himself in advance of Colbert. But historically the most valuable part of his book is the picture that he gives of the working of the actual financial system of France, its clumsiness, its inefficiency, its tendency to discourage industry. The crown, he tells us, derives little advantage from the system, and the people lose the whole value of their labour. He was not content with pointing out the evil, he also suggested remedies. His suggestions fall into line with the general tendency of economic thought during the 18th century, to which he gave a powerful impulse. He demanded the abolition of pecuniary privilege, the establishment of free trade in corn, the removal of custom houses to the frontiers. His proposal for immediate application in the Détail de la France was an extension of a reformed taille to the privileged classes. In the Factum de la France, he goes further and suggests a capitation, which should amount to a tax of 10% on all incomes, whether derived from land or other resources. The books were little read, but Bois-Gilbert procured an interview with Chamillard, who seemed inclined to accept some of his ideas. Yet, when the reforms were postponed on the ground that the war made them impracticable, Bois-Gilbert published a bitter, ironic attack on the minister under the title of a supplement to the Détail de la France. This brought upon him the suppression of his books and his own exile from Rouen, 1707. But criticism of the methods of government could not be repressed, and in 1707 Vauban published his Projet d'une dîme royale. After Turenne and Louvois, the military glory of Louis XIV's reign owed most to Vauban, and he showed a moral courage and a social feeling that rank him, in truth, much higher than either of the other two. The Dim Royal is, in fact, a treatise on taxation, proposing to make a clean sweep of the whole existing arrangements and to substitute a simpler system which, by abolishing privilege, should be less burdensome to the people and more useful to the king. The preface justifies the search for a new system by showing the effects of the present one and contains an often quoted passage. From all the researches that I have been able to make during several years of close application, I have come to the clear conclusion that one-tenth of a people is reduced to beggary and does, as a matter of fact, live by begging. Of the nine-tenths remaining, five cannot give alms to the first tenth because they are very little better off. Of the other four-tenths, three are in far from comfortable circumstances. In the tenth that still remains, there cannot be more than 100,000 families. There is a good deal of confusion both in the arrangement and the style of the book, but its central contentions are placed beyond doubt. Vauban aimed at the destruction of the regime of privilege and the adoption of an income tax on land and property without privilege or exemption. He wished to sweep away the existing taxes, oppressive by reason of the exemptions allowed and the method of collecting them. He compared the ease with which the ecclesiastical tithe was realized and the absence of complaint against it with the vast expense and the constant irritation produced by the taille. He would, therefore, adapt the methods of the church to the needs of the state and suggest the following taxes. 
one, a tax of from 5 to 10 percent on all land without regard to privilege. Two, a graduated tax on incomes not derived from land, the working classes of France not to pay more than 3.5 percent, the incomes of a clergy to be taxed equally with those of other classes. Three, a modified salt monopoly. Four, a remodeled system of customs, which should be collected only at the frontier. But Vauban's attempt to circulate the book privately among his friends aroused the anger of D'Argenson and Pontchartrain. The book was condemned by royal edict, and the shock of disgrace hastened Vauban's death, 1707. The end of the Spanish War brought to France some return of military glory, but her finances were hopelessly exhausted, and her old king suffered from one shattering blow after another which fell on his domestic circle. No royal family could seem more firmly established than his. Maria Theresa had only borne one son to Louis XIV, who received the traditional name of Louis. But the king had three grandsons. Louis, the Duke of Burgundy, Philip, Duke of Anjou, since 1700, Philip V of Spain, and Charles, Duke of Berry. The Duke of Burgundy was happily married to Maria Adelaide of Savoy and had two children. Yet suddenly, in addition to all her other disasters, France was threatened by a difficult question of succession. The Dauphin died in April 1711. He had been completely effaced by his father, and men welcomed the prospect of the accession of the Duke of Burgundy, who had been the pupil of Fenelon and had adopted many of his aristocratic liberal ideas. Men repeated with astonishment and hope his saying that a king is made for his subjects, not the subject for the king. Had he lived to inherit the throne, there would have been an attempt made to alter the development of France, probably in a reactionary feudal direction, but in 1712, the Duke of Burgundy and his charming wife and eldest son were all carried off by a mysterious disease, which seems to have been smallpox, though it roused at the time suspicion of poison. The Duke of Berry, the third of a king's grandsons, died in 1714. The second, Philip, was king of Spain, and his claim to the French throne was expressly renounced by the Treaty of Utrecht. Any attempt to revive this claim would be the signal for a renewal of war. The direct heir to the throne was Louis, Duke of Anjou, who was afterwards Louis XV. He was two years of age and of feeble health. And if the boy were to live, according to all the traditions of France, the regency would come into the hands of the Duke of Orléans. All eyes were fixed on him, and his name awoke the wildest suspicions and fears. He had fought with distinction in Spain, and possessed a keen and inquisitive intellect, but he was of an indolent and self-indulgent nature, plunged in vice and drunkenness, openly opposed to the doctrines and neglectful of the practices of the church. Louis XIV and Madame de Maintenon saw with alarm the prospect of power coming into his hands, for it would mean a complete reaction against the policy which the dying monarch had pursued in church and state, both at home and abroad. Hence arose the last intrigue of the reign. The king's fondness for his illegitimate children had been manifested throughout the latter part of the reign, and now it was determined to give the reality of power to the Duke of Men, the son of Madame de Montespan and the pupil of Madame de Maintenon. He had shown himself unsuccessful and incapable in war, but it was determined to make him master of France after the king's death. Tradition made it impossible to deny to the Duke of Orléans the title of regent, but the custody of the young king was to be in the hands of the Duke of Men, and a council of regency was to be established by the will of the king, so arranged that the present regime would be prolonged, and Louis XIV would still rule France from his grave. But the king and his wife miscalculated the forces against them. The age was weary of the long and now disastrous reign. Men were more attracted by the known opposition of the Duke of Orléans to the reigning policy than frightened by his reputation. Thus, the king's schemes were foredoomed to failure when, after a reign of 72 years, the longest reign recorded in history, he died on September 1st, 1715. End of section 4「Section 5 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 5, The Age of Louis XIV. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2. The Foreign Policy of Louis XIV, 
1661-97, to by Arthur Hassel, Part 1. The prominent position occupied in Europe by France under Louis XIV, from the death of Mazarin in 1661 to the Treaty of Ryswick in 1697, affected in a marked, though varying degree, the politics of the whole of Western Christendom. In examining the causes and results of the rise of France to this position, a distinction must be drawn between the earlier and the later portion of the period. Till 1688, Louis succeeded in many of his aims, and during these 27 years, he secured for France territorial acquisitions of enormous value. After 1688, he was opposed by a European confederacy against which he barely managed to hold his own. Nevertheless, in 1697, France still stood forth not only as the nation most advanced in the arts of civilization, but also as the most powerful of European states and a danger to the balance of power among them. The supremacy which France had thus attained in both arms and arts, and the partial success which had attended Louis' policy of territorial aggression, were due to many causes, chief among which were the consistent internal policy of the two great cardinal ministers and the political condition of the chief European states. Richelieu and Mazarin had, after infinite labor, reduced the nobility to obedience and laid down the lines on which the development of France should proceed. At home, religious toleration, the reduction of provincial autonomy, and the subordination of the Parlement of Paris to the royal power, a broad alliance with England and the United Provinces, an encouragement of the independence of the princes of the empire, such was the substance of the political legacy bequeathed by the two far-sighted cardinals to the young king. It remained for Louis to take advantage of the political weakness of the great European states, and following the policy of the cardinals, so to strengthen the monarchy that no power or combination of powers could by whatever means weaken its foundations. In carrying out this scheme, Louis was aided by a variety of circumstances. England, under Charles II and James II, made no effective resistance to French projects. While the empire was as disunited as ever, and many of its members continued more jealous of the power of the emperor than they were of that of France. Moreover, the sudden recovery of Turkey under the Chiopriles kept the east of Europe in a state of continual alarm. Nor was it till the Treaty of Karlowitz in 1699 that the perennial menace to the Habsburg dominions was sensibly lessened. But the most alarming fact that Europe had to face was the fall of Spain from the position she had held under Charles V and his successors till the Peace of the Pyrenees. The disappearance of Spain from among the great European nations aided in a marked degree the rise of France under Louis XIV. At the time of Mazarin's death, the political outlook for France was promising. Louis XIV's marriage with Maria Theresa, the Spanish Infanta, brought with it possibilities of which time could alone determine the value. By the Treaty of the Pyrenees, France had strengthened herself on her northeastern frontier by the acquisition of Aven on the side of the Pyrenees, by finally securing Roussillon between Sambre and Meuse by the cession of Philippeville and Marienburg, and in Lorraine by that of Bar, Clermont, Stenay, Dun, and Jarmette. The Duke of Neuburg, the ally of France, had obtained Julich. French troops had acquired the right to march through Lorraine, the League of the Rhine still more or less looked towards France for guidance. The aspirations of the French nation were, however, by no means satisfied. The frontier of the Rhine had not yet been secured, and the Spanish Netherlands had not been conquered. Much, therefore, remained to be done, and by Louis XIV and his most astute advisers, the peace of the Pyrenees was regarded as merely a truce. Till the War of Devolution in 1667, Louis contented himself with making elaborate preparations, with secretly helping the Portuguese, with concluding alliances in 1663 with Denmark, 
and in 1664 with Brandenburg and Saxony, and with taking an active part in the same year in the internal conflicts of the empire. With the opening of the War of Devolution, France entered upon a period of conquest and expansion, and till 1688, success on the whole crowned her efforts. From 1688, however, to the Treaty of Ryswick in 1697, Louis XIV found himself confronted by an almost united Europe, and for the first time since the days of Mazarin, a definite check was inflicted on French arms and French diplomacy. Nevertheless, throughout these years, France held the foremost place in Europe. Had Louis XIV contented himself with following the policy of Richelieu, France would have been spared many disasters. But both in his home and foreign policy, he aimed at ideals which in certain respects resembled those pursued by the Emperor Charles V. No serious opposition to Louis' schemes was to be expected from Spain. That country was slowly but steadily declining in power and influence. Spain had made a brave show during the Thirty Years' War and the succeeding eleven years, but the revolt of Portugal, the alliance between the English Commonwealth and France, the loss of Jamaica, and the humiliating terms of the Peace of the Pyrenees were alike proofs of weakness. The failure of Philip IV between 1661 and 1665 to reconquer Portugal was still more significant. Portugal could only collect 13,000 men to oppose two Spanish armies, one of 20,000 and the other of 15,000 men. But Charles II of England, who in 1662 had married a Portuguese princess, placed an auxiliary force under the command of the able Comte Frédéric Hermann de Schomburg, who had several years earlier entered the Portuguese service on the recommendation of France, and the Count of Castel Melhor, who, owing to the imbecility of the young King Alfonso VI, was at the head of affairs, showed conspicuous energy. At Evora, Don John of Austria, the chief Spanish commander, was worsted, and at Amigial, on June 8, 1663, his army was, mainly through the gallantry of the English auxiliaries, disastrously defeated. In 1665, Count Caracena, who had superseded Don John, headed a Spanish army which had been reinforced from Italy and Flanders and besieged Villa Viciosa. On the approach of the Portuguese and English forces under Marialva and Schomburg, he advanced, and on June 17th gave battle at Montes Claros, where he suffered a crushing defeat. Philip IV had failed and recognized the humiliating character of his failure. On September 17th, 1665, he died, overwhelmed with a sense of Spain's ruin and degradation, leaving the crown to his son Charles II, who was only four years old. During the reign of Charles II, Spain sank to the lowest point ever touched in her history. The causes, both external and internal, of her decadence can be traced back to the days when she was governed by the Emperor Charles V and have been discussed in earlier volumes of this history. Under the rule of Charles II, no steps were taken to arrest the decline that had become almost irretrievable. The last representative of his race, Charles II, was small in stature, with large blue eyes, light hair, and a white skin. His health was always deplorable, and as he grew older, he was frequently attacked by fainting fits. But though he was so irresolute that he could settle nothing without advice, he was not wanting in intelligence, and the last act of his reign showed that in his own way he had the interests of Spain at heart. On his accession, Charles II was under the care of his mother, Maria Anna, sister of the Emperor Leopold. As he grew older, he became more and more indifferent to all his duties. Unlike Louis XIV, he detested the cares of government and rarely attended a council. If it was necessary that he should be a prince, said the Venetian ambassador, he ought to be a prince of the church. He married twice, first Marie-Louise of Orléans, who died in 1689, and after her Maria Anna of Neuburg, sister of Eleonora Magdalena, third wife of the Emperor Leopold, and of Maria Sophia, 
who married King Pedro of Portugal. To the Queen Mother and to Charles' second queen must in some measure be attributed the misfortunes of the reign. The Queen Mother was in close alliance with her confessor, Father Nitar, a German Jesuit. Both were unpopular in Spain, but they were able to expel from court Don John of Austria, an illegitimate son of Philip IV, who was a man of no capacity and eaten up with vanity. In 1669, Nitar was forced to retire, but his place was taken by Fernando de Valenzuela, who supported the cause of the Queen Mother. After failing in 1675 to carry out a coup d'etat, Don John proved successful in 1677. Valenzuela fled. The Queen Mother was sent to a convent at Tours, and Charles married in August 1679 Marie-Louise of Orléans. Don John's triumph was brief, for he died in September 1679, having outlived his popularity. His death was followed by the return of the Queen Mother and the triumph of the Austrian faction. Till April 1685, the Duke of Medina Celi made vain attempts to check the anarchy and misery which prevailed in Spain, and which was not lessened by the struggles at court between the Austrian and French parties. In April 1685, the Count of Oropesa succeeded Medina Celi and managed to carry out some reforms. He was a member of the Austrian party and on the death of Marie-Louise of Orléans, assisted the Queen Mother in bringing about the marriage of Charles to Maria Anna of Neuburg. The new queen soon turned against Oropesa, who fell in 1691, his duties being transferred at first to the Count of Melgar, Admiral of Castile. The rapacity of the queen and of her German followers made her very unpopular and prepared the way for the triumph of French influences in 1701. Thus, from the death of Mazarin in 1661 to the Treaty of Ryswick in 1697, Spain was unable to offer any effective resistance to the schemes of Louis XIV. The European balance was considerably affected by her disappearance as one of the great powers. The empire as a whole cannot be said to have realized the danger which threatened it from the ambitious projects of France till the formation of the Grand Alliance in 1689. The Augsburg Alliance of July 1686, though it united in it a considerable number of estates, including both Spain and Sweden for their German possessions, was only an extension of the Luxembourg Alliance of June 1682, which had been confined to the emperor and the Franconian and Upper Rhenish circles. Moreover, the Emperor Leopold was not able to offer any effective opposition to Louis. Till 1672, he was outwitted by French diplomatists, and after fighting against Louis from 1672 to 1679, was glad to make peace. The Hungarians, too, instigated in part by the diplomacy of the French Defensor Hungarie, had risen against Leopold under Count Emmerich Tuchkoli, 1677-82. Till 1689, the estates of the empire could not be relied upon to offer a united opposition to the French monarch. From the Peace of Nijmegen in 1678, their suspicions of the real aims of the German policy of Louis began to assume a definite shape. But the long war between Austria and the Turks, which broke out in 1682 and lasted till 1699, prevented Leopold from using the strength of the empire against its most dangerous adversary. During the period from 1661 to 1670, the weakness of the empire, the decadence of Spain, and the embittered war between England and Holland enabled Louis XIV to formulate and carry out an aggressive policy, deliberately calculated to extend the boundaries of France and to strengthen and consolidate her position in Europe. The only power which showed similar aggressive tendencies was Turkey. Under Mohammed IV, 1648 to 87, and the Kiyoprilis, the gradual decline of Turkey was checked, and from 1656 to the siege of Vienna in 1683, the Ottoman Empire, like the French Kingdom, enjoyed a period of success. The attacks of the Turks upon Transylvania, 
1661, upon Hungary, 1663, upon Candia, 1669, and upon Poland, 1672 to 78, indeed aided the projects of Louis XIV. For by diverting eastwards the attention of the Poles and Austrians, they weakened the emperor's power of resistance to the French aggressions. In the West, too, the years from the death of Mazarin in 1661 to the invasion of the Low Countries by France in 1667 constitute a period in which events favored Louis and facilitated his preparations for taking his first step towards the establishment of his claims upon the succession to the Spanish monarchy. As the Spanish throne was not then vacant, Louis contented himself with asserting his claim to the immediate possession of the Spanish Netherlands. It was based upon the so-called jus devolitionis, a local custom of Brabant and Hainaut, by which, though a man might have married more than once, the children of his first marriage succeeded to his property. Since Maria Theresa, the consort of Louis XIV, was the only surviving child of Philip IV's first marriage, Louis claimed the whole of the Low Countries, though in the course of his negotiations with Spain in 1662, he had declared his willingness to be satisfied with instant possession of Hainaut, Cambrai, Luxembourg, and Franche-Comté. The negotiations with Spain were resultless, but Louis never ceased his efforts to carry out his object. Already in April 1662, he had entered into friendly negotiations with the leading statesman of the United Provinces, John de Witt, Grand Pensionary of Holland, and had concluded a treaty guaranteeing all the Dutch possessions in Europe. He had hoped at the same time to arrive at some arrangement with regard to the Spanish Netherlands. The plan of equal partition between France and the United Provinces was eventually rejected by de Witt, who preferred that the Spanish Netherlands should be erected into an independent Catholic Republic or remain under Spain if the latter power entered into a close alliance with the Free Provinces. To Louis, who, like Mazarin, desired the annexation to France of the Spanish Low Countries, none of de Witt's suggestions were acceptable, and the death of Philip IV of Spain on September 17, 1665, seemed a suitable opportunity for pressing the supposed claims of the King of France. But in March 1665, war had broken out between England and Holland, and Louis was, by the Treaty of April 1662, bound to aid the Dutch. Though they were able to assert their supremacy at sea, the alliance of Charles II of England with the warlike Bishop of Münster resulted in his raising a large army and overrunning the province of Overissel. De Witt, however, succeeded in persuading Louis XIV to carry out his treaty engagements, though the behavior of the French troops, nominally hostile to the Bishop of Münster, tended to increase the dislike felt by the Dutch for their allies. In January 1666, Louis, fearing that De Witt might conclude peace with Charles II, reluctantly declared war against England. The French alliance affected the fortunes of Holland in a variety of ways. It strengthened the hands of the Dutch, who early in 1666 won a series of diplomatic successes. Denmark concluded an alliance with them. Sweden was induced not to unite with England. At the same time, some of the German princes became fearful of the results of a too close dependence of the United Provinces upon France. In October 1666, the United Provinces were enabled, through the influence of the great elector, who had in February 1666 threatened the Bishop of Münster, to form a quadruple alliance with Brandenburg, the brunswick lurenburg princes, and Denmark. England was thus left practically without an ally, and the Dutch were free from the necessity of placing too much reliance upon France. During 1666, the war between England and the United Provinces continued with varying results. In 1667, two important events took place. On March 31st, Charles made the first of his secret treaties with Louis XIV, agreeing not to oppose a French invasion of the Spanish Netherlands, on the understanding that the French fleet withheld all assistance from the Dutch. 
but the calculations of Charles were upset in June 1667 by the Dutch attack on the English ships in the Thames and Medway, which compelled Charles to agree to the Treaty of Breda on July 31, 1667. For the United Provinces, peace was absolutely necessary, since on May 24th, French troops had crossed the frontier of the Spanish Low Countries and the War of Devolution had begun. For this war, Louis' preparations had been carefully made by a treaty with Portugal concluded in March 1667. It was arranged that hostilities between that country and Spain should continue. By the Treaty of 1662 with the United Provinces, their hands were tied. And by the secret treaty of March 31, 1667, Charles II had bound himself not to enter into an alliance with the emperor against Louis XIV during the year 1667. Secure of a free hand in the Spanish Low Countries, Louis ordered his troops to cross the frontier, May 24, 1667. The southern portion of the Spanish Low Countries was speedily overrun, and Lille, the most important of the Belgian cities, was taken, August 27. This rapid success alarmed Europe, and signs of opposition to France at once appeared. Spain hastily recognized the independence of Portugal, February 1668, and freed from all necessity of continuing her attempts to reconquer that kingdom, endeavored to secure the assistance of the Emperor Leopold in the Low Countries. Her efforts were in vain. Louis, by the able diplomacy of his ambassador Gravel, contrived to induce the imperial diet in October 1667 to abstain from active assistance to the Spanish Low Countries, which technically formed part of the Circle of Burgundy, one of the ten imperial circles. But he was unable to succeed in bringing about, by the same means, the continuance of the League of the Rhine beyond its formal term, August 1668, when, after much negotiation, it came to an end. Further, by means of his able agent, de Grimonville, Louis not only persuaded the Emperor Leopold to withhold all assistance from Spain, but actually induced him to agree to a treaty, signed on January 19, 1668, for the eventual partition of the Spanish monarchy between himself and Louis, should King Charles II, as seemed probable, die without children. So far, the success of the French king had been remarkable and unchecked. Having secured by various means the neutrality of Brandenburg and that of Sweden, and having encouraged the war between England and Holland, Louis had met with no serious resistance in his subjugation of the Spanish Low Countries. By the beginning of 1668, Spain was isolated and the alliance, or at all events the quiescence, of the emperor secured. But it was these extraordinary successes of Louis which brought about the formation of the coalition between England, the United Provinces, and Sweden, almost distinctively known as the Triple Alliance. Some such coalition was justified, not only by the French invasion of the Spanish Netherlands, but by the French conquest of Franche-Comté, which was effected in February 1668. On January 23rd, England and the United Provinces concluded an alliance which in April was on certain conditions joined by Sweden. Louis had thus to face a formidable adverse combination. The importance of the Triple Alliance lies in the fact that it was the first formal expression of European resistance to the aggressions of Louis, the first attempt to check a power which continued to dominate Europe till the Treaty of Ryswick. Spain and Portugal were now at peace. February 1668. The influence of England being paramount in the latter kingdom, and Louis could no longer rely upon the abstention of Spain from active measures in the Low Countries. Moreover, by consenting to make peace, he would lose little and would break up the coalition which was being formed against him. By his recent secret partition treaty with the Emperor Leopold, Louis was eventually to receive as his share the Low Countries and Franche Comte though his pride caused him to resent the necessity of yielding to the Triple Alliance, Louis, in the end, agreed to come to terms with England, Holland, and Sweden. On May 2, 1668, 
the Peace of Aix-la-Chapelle was signed. In this compact, Louis strengthened his northeastern frontier by the acquisition of certain fortresses in the Netherlands with their districts. Franche-Comté, Cambrai, Saint-Omer, and Aire were given up by the King of France, but by the secret partition treaty with Leopold, it had been arranged that on the King of Spain's death, all these were to be incorporated in the French dominions. In face of the growing hostility of Europe, Louis showed wisdom in agreeing to the Peace of Aix-la-Chapelle and in adopting a waiting policy. Yet Europe was far from being united. Brandenburg and other German states were jealous of the emperor. England and the United Provinces regarded each other with hostility. Sweden was ready to fall in with the highest bidder. Some 20 years had yet to pass before the chief European states, recognizing the danger which threatened them from France, were found prepared to sink minor differences in a united effort to reduce the power of the aggressive French monarch. Louis XIV, however, bitterly resented the necessity which forced him to agree to the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, and from the moment of its signature seems to have resolved to gain his ends in the Spanish Netherlands by means of a direct attack upon the United Provinces. This decision ran counter to the policy to which the French monarchy had adhered since the days of Francis I. For it was distinctly opposed to the principle of pursuing Catholic interests at home and Protestant abroad, which had enabled France to secure allies against the emperor among the German Protestant princes. Louis, however, was bent on the reduction of the Spanish Netherlands, and the surest means to that end seemed to be found in the overthrow of the Dutch Republic. The magnitude of this blunder became more and more apparent as the reign of Louis XIV proceeded. In Holland, writes Minier, the old political system of France suffered shipwreck. In order to achieve the end which Louis proposed to himself, the overthrow of the new combination which had led to the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle was necessary. The task was at once undertaken. The years between 1668 and 1672, writes Camille Rousset, were years of preparation. When Lyon was laboring with all his might to find allies, Colbert money, and Louvois soldiers for Louis. The task of breaking up the Triple Alliance itself, however, did not prove to be one of insuperable difficulty. For a short period after the formation of this alliance, Western Europe remained in a condition of uneasy peace, while the obnoxious compact was being rapidly undermined. The three partners in it were ill-assorted and without any real ground of agreement. Sweden had little to fear from Louis. Her interest required constant watchfulness as towards Denmark and northern Germany. With Denmark, Sweden was in an almost unending feud, while by her successes in the Thirty Years' War, she had acquired possessions in northern Germany, which could not be regarded as definitively united to the Swedish monarchy. The rise of Brandenburg already threatened the stability of the arrangements made by the Treaty of Westphalia in the northeast of the empire. Moreover, Sweden was a poor country, and her government was ready to unite with any power that offered regular subsidies, especially if combined with military assistance for the defense of Swedish Pomerania. From England and Holland, no adequate help, either in money or men, could be looked for in the event of an attack upon Swedish Pomerania by any German power. It was therefore not surprising that Sweden was easily detached from the Triple Alliance and made a treaty with Louis on May 6, 1672. Charles II of England had already, by the secret treaty of Dover, signed on June 1, 1670, deserted the Triple Alliance and promised to join France in a war against the Dutch Republic. The Triple Alliance was thus broken up, and four years after its conclusion, Louis XIV was able to invade the United Provinces. Till 1688, constant attempts were made to form coalitions against France. But owing to the policy of Charles II and James II of England, to the Franco-Swedish alliance, to the necessity of defending Germany and Hungary against the Turks, to the divisions existing among the various German states, and to their suspicions of the emperor, no organized opposition was possible. Unfortunately for the peace of the whole continent, the aggressions of Louis XIV in the West, 
which definitely began in 1672, coincided with the attempts of the Turks to dominate Eastern Europe. In 1656, the appointment of Mohammed Kiyoprili as Grand Vizier marked the beginning of the sudden revival of the Ottoman power, of which some account will be given in a later chapter. His successor, Ahmad Kiyoprili, continued his policy of reform at home and aggressions abroad, with the help of Louis XIV, who sent a French force to his help. The Emperor Leopold defeated the Turks in the Battle of St. Gotthard on August 1, 1664, and concluded the Truce of Basvar on August 10. Vienna was saved, but the hold which the Turks had established over Hungary remained unshaken, and a compromise was arranged with regard to Transylvania. The outbreak of war between Turkey and Venice, resulting in the capture of Crete, September 1669, show that the ambitious, aggressive policy of the Ottoman power was as dangerous to the integrity and peace of Eastern as that of Louis XIV was to that of Western Europe. In 1669, the Polish Diet elected not the French candidate, the Count Palatine, Philip William of Neuburg, but Mikhail Wisniewiecki, the national candidate, who was married to Eleonora Maria, the sister of the Emperor Leopold, and looked to him for support. It was impossible to hope for united resistance to the French king, so long as there was the possibility of a Turkish attack upon Vienna, an opportunity for which was afforded by the disturbed condition of Poland. In 1672, that country was invaded by Ahmad Kiyoprili, but the Turks were defeated by John Sobieski, both before and after he had, in 1674, succeeded the weak Mikhail on the Polish throne. In June 1674, Louis XIV made a treaty with the new king, who, in consideration for French subsidies, promised to support the malcontents in Hungary against the emperor. The war between Poland and Turkey was brought to an end by the Treaty of Zorana, concluded under French mediation on October 27, 1676. But, though by this treaty Ahmad Kiyoprili, who died three days after its conclusion, left his country in a position in Eastern Europe not very unlike that occupied by France in Western, his alliance with Poland was of little benefit to Louis XIV, and in 1683, when Vienna was besieged by the Turks, it was the King of Poland who bore away the glory of the rescue. While, however, John Sobieski was defending Eastern Europe during the years 1674 to 77, the Emperor, even though aided by Spain, the Dutch, Brandenburg, and Denmark, proved unable to place any substantial check upon the ambitious policy of Louis XIV. In 1670, Louis had been resolved to win eventually the imperial crown, to secure part of the Spanish possessions, and to conquer the United Provinces. On February 17th of that year, he had concluded a treaty with Ferdinand Maria, Elector of Bavaria, whose daughter, Maria Anna, was to marry the Dauphin, providing that in the event of the Emperor's death, every possible effort should be made to secure his own election to the imperial throne. The Treaty of Dover of the same year, followed by the formal detachment of Sweden from the Triple Alliance, April 14, 1672, left the United Netherlands open to a French attack, while the secret partition treaty concluded with the Emperor in 1668, followed by a treaty of neutrality in 1671, left it in the power of Louis to renew his occupation of Franche-Comté. Sweden had been gained by the payment of 400,000 crowns and the promise of an annual payment of 40,000 crowns. In return, Sweden undertook, in concert with Denmark, to close the Baltic to the Dutch fleet and to land a force in the north of Germany. Like the alliance with England, that with Sweden proved of great value to France during the ensuing war. On December 31, 1669, Louis had made a secret treaty with the Elector of Brandenburg, who in return for subsidies, to which was afterwards added the promise of the province of Spanish Gelders, 
undertook to aid France in conquering the Spanish Netherlands and to support the interests of France in all the affairs of the empire. Behind the plan of conquering first the United Provinces and then the Spanish Netherlands lay, therefore, the design of securing for Louis a position of authority and power such as had been held by Charles the Great. The Devolution War had thus not only disunited Europe, but had been followed by unexpected developments. In more or less intimate connection with the rivalry of France and Spain, which at the time of the death of Mazarin was the most momentous fact in European politics, and remained such throughout Louis XIV's reign, arose other important questions. In 1668, Louis had, as has been seen, concluded with the emperor a secret partition treaty, which was to come into force in the event of the death of Charles II of Spain. Would that treaty hinder the emperor from opposing the schemes of Louis with regard to the United Netherlands, Flanders, the German lands on the Rhine, and Poland, or interfere with his intrigues in Hungary? Though the League of the Rhine was no longer in existence, Louis had, as has been seen, entered into separate treaties with several of the German powers, such as Bavaria and Brandenburg. Would they remain loyal to their alliance with France, should Louis adopt an aggressive attitude towards the empire? By the Treaty of Dover, England had been detached from the Triple Alliance, but would the English people consent to support the action of the French king when once they realized the import of his ambitious schemes, and would they allow the national interests of England to be subordinated to the designs of Charles II for the maintenance of his personal power? Thus, at the opening of the French War with the United Provinces in 1672, the European situation was extremely complicated. For a time, each of the various states seemed to pursue its separate interests regardless of the welfare of Europe, and the diplomacy of the period was more than usually tangled. Yet the policy of Louis had never been clearer. For a successful attack on the Dutch, it was necessary, after breaking up the Triple Alliance, to secure the alliance or neutrality of the emperor and of as many German princes as possible. The Treaty of Dover had placed at Louis' disposal the English fleet, which alone could render useless the Dutch navy. The Treaty of April 14, 1672, had secured the invaluable help of a Swedish army in northern Germany. Treaties with Münster, Cologne, Hanover in July, and with Osnabrück in October 1671, provided for the unhindered passage of French troops. And on December 18, 1671, the Emperor Leopold, fearing that Louis might stir up the Hungarians to rebellion, and encourage the German princes to combine against him, promised neutrality so long as Louis abstained from attacking Spain or the Empire. Alone among the chief German princes, the great elector, whose strong Protestant feeling contributed to his decision, declined Louis' proposals, and in February 1671 concluded a treaty with the Dutch Republic to become effectual in April 1672, by which he promised armed assistance. Spain also, in December 1671, signed a treaty with the States General for Mutual Defense, and the Elector of Mainz, though he maintained friendly relations with France, also resolved to support the Dutch. Early in 1672, a powerful French force was collected at Charlois, and on May 5th, it was joined by Louis XIV in person. The invasion of the United Provinces at once took place, while the forces of Luxembourg, Cologne, and Münster occupied Overissel and besieged Grüningen, which they failed to take. Meanwhile, the French overran the southern portion of the United Provinces, but on June 18th, the dikes were cut, and the sluices opened in front of Amsterdam, which was thereby saved. Louis' failure to overrun Holland synchronized with the defeat of a French force which endeavored to overcome Zealand. Moreover, on June 7th, a combined Anglo-French fleet had been defeated by de Rutter in the Battle of Southwold Bay. On July 6th and 8th, William of Orange was proclaimed Stadtholder of Holland and Zealand. On August 1st, as will be narrated in a subsequent chapter, the French invasion came to an end. 
and Louis returned to Saint-Germain, having conquered Gelders, Utrecht, and over Issel. On August 20th, John and Cornelius de Witt were murdered at The Hague. These events created profound alarm in Europe, although for some years the attitude of the various European powers with regard to the French aggressions was uncertain, and their opposition betrayed great lack of vigor. On June 23, 1672, the Emperor Leopold concluded an alliance with Frederick William of Brandenburg, and on October 27, another with the States General. This coalition, sometimes called the Great Coalition of The Hague, did not prove very effective. Turenne's successes on the Lower Rhine and the Weser, and his march upon the Elbe, forced Frederick William to make peace on June 6, 1673, and thus deprived the Dutch of their most valuable ally. A peace conference, which met in June 1673 at Cologne, having proved a failure, the emperor formed a second coalition, which was joined in the autumn of 1673 by Spain and the Duke of Lorraine, and in 1674 by Denmark, the Elector Palatine, the brunswick lueneburg Dukes, and on July 1st by the Great Elector. Further, the English Parliament forced Charles II to abandon his alliance with Louis and to make peace with the Dutch on February 19th, 1674. End of section 5, read by Martha Weller, Champagne, March 17th, 2023. Section 6 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 5, The Age of Louis XIV. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2, The Foreign Policy of Louis XIV, 1661-97, to by Arthur Hassel, Part 2. In June 1672, the States General had offered Louis Maastricht and its dependencies, a number of fortresses stretching from the Meuse to the mouth of the Scheldt, and six millions of livres. By the advice of Louvois, Louis had rejected this offer. At the beginning of 1674, the only Dutch towns in his possession were Maastricht and Grave. Nevertheless, in spite of his mistakes, and notwithstanding the number of his foes, Louis, in 1674, won some brilliant successes. In June, Franche-Comté was conquered. On August 11th, Condé checked William of Orange in the Battle of Seneff in Flanders. While on the Rhine, Turenne conducted a most brilliant campaign. He defeated the imperialists on June 16th at Sinsheim, driving them across the Neckar, and then, acting in accordance with the orders of Louvois, he devastated the Palatinate. A further victory at Ensheim on October 4th had no definite result, as a fresh concentration of his adversaries, reinforced by 20,000 Brandenburgers, forced Turenne to retire into winter quarters in Lorraine. His enemies thought that the campaign was over and took no precautions. This was Turenne's opportunity, and in spite of the opposition of Louis and Louvois, he determined to reconquer Alsace. In December 1674, he carried out his brilliant Vosges campaign, which closed with the defeat of the great elector on January 5, 1675, at Colmar, and the expulsion of the enemy from the country on the left bank of the Rhine. In 1675, Turenne continued his successful campaign, outmaneuvering the imperialist general Montecuculli and forcing him to retire to Sasbach, to the east of Strasbourg. There, on July 27, 1675, Turenne fell, and with his death, the great successes of the French ended. Though Condé preserved Alsace for France, the Duc de Crequy was defeated on the Moselle on August 11th, and Trier and Philipsburg were lost. The Swedes, 
on whose intervention in Brandenburg the French had placed high hopes, had on June 18th been decisively defeated in the Battle of Ferbellen by the great elector and forced to beat a disastrous retreat. The campaigns of 1676 and 1677 were generally favorable to France. The towns of Condé and Bouchain were taken by Louis in 1676, and in 1677, Valenciennes, Cambrai, and Saint-Omer fell into French hands. William of Orange also suffered a disastrous defeat at Cassel, and Christian V of Denmark was overthrown by the Swedes at London. In the Mediterranean, the French fleet was on the whole successful. There, Duquesne fought engagements off Stromboli, January 8, 1676, and Catania, April 22nd, with the Dutch fleet under de Ruyter. But both battles remained undecided. The death of de Ruyter, however, was of immense advantage to the French, who for a time remained supreme in the Mediterranean. In 1678, all the powers were ready for peace. On November 15, 1677, William of Orange had married Mary, daughter of the Duke of York, and on January 10, 1678, a treaty between England and the Republic was signed. It seemed that at last France would encounter the united opposition of the two countries. But William's hopes were almost immediately disappointed for the treaty was never ratified, owing to the resolution of the Republic, in consequence of its suspicions of the terms of the Treaty of January 10th, to make a separate peace with Louis. In May, William, convinced of the treachery of Charles, who the same month signed a secret agreement with Louis, consented to negotiate. But Louis' attempts to gain undue advantages suddenly changed the whole situation. Charles was compelled to tear up his secret agreement with Louis and to sign, on July 26th, a treaty with the Dutch. Recognizing the strength of public opinion in England and Holland, Louis finally agreed to make peace with the Republic on August 10th, 1678. France ceding Maastricht and the Dutch occurring no loss. A second treaty relating to commerce abolished the onerous tariffs of 1667 and restored the more moderate of 1664. On August 14th, William of Orange and Luxembourg fought before Mons, then invested by the French, the Battle of Saint-Denis. Both generals knew that peace had been concluded, but William had no official knowledge of the fact. A treaty between France and Spain was signed on September 17th. Spain was not in a condition to continue the war. Her king, Charles II, had attained his majority on November 6, 1675. This event was soon followed by the overthrow of Fernando de Valenzuela, who, with the Queen Regent, now fell into disgrace, and by the temporary ascendancy of Don John of Austria, the king's illegitimate brother. Don John, however, soon became unpopular and finding himself surrounded by internal difficulties, was anxious for peace with France. Spain yielded Franche-Comté, Valenciennes, Air, Saint-Omer, Cassel, Bayeul, Pauperange, Warnton, Ypres, Cambrai, and the Cambraises, Bouchen, Condé, and Maubeuge all of which were regarded as necessary for the defense of the French frontier. France, on her part, restored to Spain Courtrai, Oudenard, At, Ghent, Bench, Charlois, and the duchy and town of Limburg. With the emperor and empire, peace was signed by France on February 26, 1679. Louis restored Philipsburg, but kept Breisach and Freiburg. To Duke Charles V of Lorraine, his duchy was restored on certain conditions, namely that France should keep Nancy, Longwy, and Marsal, and control the four principal roads traversing the country. The Duke refused to accept these conditions, 
and the duchy remained in French hands till the Peace of Ryswick. These four treaties are known as the Peace of Nijmegen and were supplemented by the Treaty of Saint-Germain-en-Laye between Brandenburg and Sweden and by the Treaty of Fontainebleau between Denmark and Sweden. The first of these treaties was signed on June 29, 1679. During the war with Sweden, the great elector had, besides winning the Battle of Verbellen, taken Stetten and Strasland. But the emperor, having in the name of the empire agreed to the restoration of Sweden's German possessions, Frederick William was compelled to give up to the Swedes nearly all his conquests in western Pomerania. By the Treaty of Fontainebleau, signed on September 26, 1679, Denmark also restored to Sweden the conquests made in Scania and the Baltic. The treaties of Zerwana and Nijmegen re-established peace in Europe, which now enjoyed a short period of rest. Though the Treaty of Nijmegen had, in a general way, reaffirmed the terms of the Peace of Westphalia, France was in a far stronger position in 1678 than in 1648. Spain, in 1678, was in a condition of decadence, while the empire was not only involved in troubles in Hungary, but was seriously threatened by the resurrection of Turkey. Moreover, though the League of the Rhine no longer existed, the suspicious attitude of the German princes towards the emperor was not as yet thoroughly changed. This suspicious attitude was encouraged and strengthened by Louis, who by adroitly distributing pensions to certain princes and influential personages in various German states, secured, if not their active support, at any rate their neutrality. In its origin, the war was an attempt of Louis to conquer and destroy the United Provinces. It had developed into a European struggle, and its end had been that the United Provinces had secured the abolition of the hostile tariffs of 1667 and had gained Maastricht without losing any territory, while Louis secured Franche-Comté and some towns in the Spanish Netherlands. Louis's object in entering the war had not been attained, and his triumph was far from being complete. Moreover, he had roused the suspicions of Europe, and the attitude of the German princes towards France in 1678 was very different from what it had been in 1658. Nevertheless, the concert of Europe was partial and ill-cemented, and although peace had been made, could not be other than short-lived in face of the jealousies of the various states which the fear of France had temporarily united. The conclusion of the Peace of Nijmegen in 1679 seemed, with reason, to the French people to mark a fresh triumph on the part of their king. In their eyes, Louis XIV had brought additional glory to himself and his country, which had never stood so high in the eyes of Europe, nor had appeared so strong or so great. At the Peace of Nijmegen, Louis reached the greatest height of his power. A large part of the Spanish Netherlands had been added to France. Freiburg in the Breisgau had been retained. Franche-Comté had been definitely conquered. One of Louis's great aims since 1661 had been to enlarge and to fortify the boundary of France. Though he had not acquired the whole of the Spanish Netherlands, and though he had failed in his attempt to destroy the Dutch Republic, Louis could at any rate view with satisfaction the extension of the French frontier towards the Rhine, the acquisition of 16 fortresses in the Spanish Netherlands, as well as the possession of Franche-Comté. With the King of England, he had made a treaty in May 1678, which had nullified the effects of the marriage of William of Orange with the Princess Mary. Till 1689, England remained a cipher in European politics and offered no opposition to the execution of Louis' schemes. There seemed to be no obstacle to the attainment of the main object of Louis' policy, that the Bourbon House should take the position hitherto occupied in Europe by the Habsburgs. This implied the enlargement of the Kingdom of France, the recognition of Louis as the defender of the Church, 
the acquisition, if possible, of the imperial crown for the French kings. A French empire extending over the continent was to be the crowning result of Louis' efforts. In 1679, and during the succeeding ten years, such a result seemed capable of realization. The Mediterranean was practically a French lake. England, under Charles II and James II, showed no desire to oppose Louis' aims. Central Europe was divided. The Emperor Leopold was powerless. A Turkish invasion of Austria was imminent. Till the Peace of Nijmegen, Louis had directed his chief attention to Spain and, taking advantage of her weakness, had enlarged and strengthened the French frontier on the northeastern side of France. After 1679, Louis was chiefly interested in his plans for strengthening his position in Germany with the view of ultimately securing the imperial crown. Till 1697, Spanish affairs fell into the background nor do they again become prominent till the era of the partition treaties. The time seemed opportune for a further attempt on the part of Louis to push forward his candidature for the imperial crown. The treaty concluded with Bavaria in 1670, by which the elector had promised to advance Louis' claims to the imperial dignity in the event of the Emperor Leopold's death had roused opposition in Germany, and for a brief period, the empire stood united for its emperor. But the Peace of Nijmegen found Germany again disunited, and the reputation of the French king at a greater height than ever. The times were therefore propitious for a new attempt on the part of Louis to secure, in the event of Leopold's death, the imperial dignity. In October 1679, by a secret treaty with Louis, the Elector of Brandenburg engaged, in the event of the Emperor's death, to secure the election of his most Christian majesty. The danger to Europe was real and unmistakable, for the jealousies and selfishness of the various European powers rendered them blind to the true meaning of Louis's ambitious policy and unwilling to combine in the defense of the liberties of Europe. Hardly had the treaties of Nijmegen been signed than Louis entered upon a fresh phase of the policy which he hoped would gain for him the imperial crown. It was necessary, in his opinion, to strengthen France on her northeastern and eastern frontiers. Lorraine was practically in his hands. The possession of Alsace and Luxembourg would complete the ceinture de frontières, and in Louis's opinion, would give greater weight to his influence in Germany whenever the Emperor Leopold should die or whenever it should be attempted to make his son Joseph, who was born in July 1678, King of the Romans. Placing his own interpretation upon certain clauses in the Treaty of Westphalia and adopting the view that the German Charles the Great was in reality a French Charlemagne, Louis resolved that what once belonged to France continued to be, by right, the inalienable possession of the French crown, though it had been sold, exchanged, or given away. At Metz, Besançon, Breisach, and Tournay, chambers of reunion were set up for the purpose of adjudging to France certain territories and towns on the left bank of the Rhine. What these courts did not declare to have been ceded to France at the Peace of Westphalia was held to be a dependency, and under this head came Luxembourg and Strasbourg. By means of these two fortresses, the French king would have the three spiritual electors of Mainz, Cologne, and Trier, as well as the elector Palatine in his power, so that by means of them he would be able to carry through without much trouble his election to the Roman kingship. On March 22, 1680, the Parlement of Breisach gave the support of legal authority to Louis' claim of absolute sovereignty over Alsace. On September 30, 1681, French troops occupied Strasbourg, and on the same day, a French force seized Casale. 
Two of the places which were deemed essential for the rounding off of French territory had fallen into the hands of Louis. It only remained to occupy Luxembourg in order to make France practical mistress of the Netherlands. The first reply to these aggressions was seen in the opposition in England and Holland to Louis' siege of Luxembourg, which began in November 1681. So antagonistic were the Dutch to the idea of the town falling into French hands that in spite of their dread of the outbreak of a fresh European war, William of Orange was instructed to march to the relief of Luxembourg whenever its capture by Louis seemed imminent. The outbreak of such a war would have enlisted public opinion in England in opposition to Louis, who at that moment desired above everything to avert a European conflagration. In order, therefore, to tranquilize public opinion in Holland and England, Louis consented early in 1682 to raise the siege of Luxembourg. Louis had indeed endeavored to win over Charles to consent to the French occupation of Luxembourg, and in 1680, the King of England had refused to be united with William of Orange in laying the foundations of a general alliance against France. Thus, Charles, if left to himself, would no doubt have consented to be gained. But on the question of Luxembourg, the English nation was peculiarly sensitive, and Charles realized that the occupation of the fortress by Louis would probably rouse great indignation in England, necessitating the summoning of Parliament. There was thus, as Ranke says, a close connection between the siege of Luxembourg and the internal affairs of England. Charles II himself professed to believe Louis' assurance that he merely wished to dismantle the place, not to use it as a point whence to attack others. He therefore undertook to reassure Louis' opponents on this point, but insisted that while the negotiations were proceeding, Louis should not, by a strict blockade, force the surrender of Luxembourg. During the negotiations, the divergence between the views held by William of Orange and those held by Charles II and James, Duke of York, became very apparent. William desired to preserve the balance of power in Europe by means of English intervention, and he was supported by the Spaniards. On the other hand, the English king saw no objection to the French conquest of Luxembourg so long as the fortress was raised, and in the United Netherlands, his views were supported by a small party of the opponents of William. To Louis, it was of the utmost importance that the English Parliament should not be summoned. It would undoubtedly support the views of William of Orange, and in the event of the European war which seemed likely to follow the French occupation of Luxembourg, England would side with Louis' enemies. At that moment, Hungary and Austria were threatened by a Turkish invasion, and Louis with great acuteness declared that in order not to hamper the German princes in their efforts to resist the Ottoman forces, he had withdrawn his troops from Luxembourg. The real motives which induced him to take this step were therefore not avowed, and the French king gained the credit for moderation and for taking a keen interest in the welfare of Christendom. The year 1682 was thus marked both by the preparations made by the emperor to resist the threatened invasion of Germany by the Turks, and by a great political activity on the part of Louis XIV, as shown by his treaty with Denmark and his intrigues in Sweden, Poland, Hungary, and Holland, and by his attempt to secure the independence of the Gallican Church. Throughout this and the following years, the general uneasiness in Europe caused by Louis' activity and pretensions steadily increased. A notable instance of the effects was the association formed at The Hague in February 1683, the origin of which is to be found in efforts set on foot by Charles XI of Sweden and William of Orange in 1681, directly after the seizure of Strasbourg and Casale for the maintenance of the Treaty of Nijmegen and which was joined by the Emperor and the King of Spain. It was rendered ineffective by the Turkish advance on Vienna. That advance, followed by the siege of the Austrian capital, roused the interest of Europe 
and enlisted its sympathy on behalf of the emperor. John Sobieski and the United Polish and German armies saved Vienna in September 1683, and the opportunity for Louis to come forward as the defender of Christian Europe against the infidel had passed away. This success, which once more placed Austria in the center of the resistance to the infidel, imparted fresh confidence to the Spaniards, who in December 1683 declared war against France. Luxembourg was at once seriously besieged by the French troops and was taken in the beginning of June 1684. It was impossible for the emperor, with the Turkish war on his hands, to oppose the French successfully. And on August 15th, the truce of Ratisbon was concluded by Leopold and the empire with Louis. By this truce, it was arranged that for 20 years, Louis should continue to hold in addition to Strasbourg, all the places assigned to him before August 1, 1681, by the Chambers of Reunion. The Spaniards were compelled to make larger concessions to France, including the transfer of many villages in Hainault and Luxembourg, and the establishment of a Spanish protectorate over Genoa, while the Dutch, finding it impossible to secure any united opposition to Louis, accepted a 20 years truce. It was necessary for the emperor, who was engaged in his great struggle with the Turks, it was acceptable to Louis, who confidently anticipated that the armistice would be converted into a general peace, and that all the territory and places made over to him provisionally would become permanent portions of the French kingdom. So far, Louis had owed much of his success to the neutrality of England, Charles II had consistently refused to unite with William of Orange and Spain in checking the French aggressions on the northeastern and eastern frontiers. Louis was thus freed from all fear of an attack on his flank and enabled to concentrate all his attention upon his aggressive schemes with regard to Germany and the Spanish Netherlands. The sole chance of successfully resisting these schemes lay in a close alliance between England and the continental enemies of the French king. Charles II had thus facilitated the execution of several of Louis' most important designs. It remained to be seen whether James II, who succeeded to the English throne in February 1685, would be equally friendly to the French projects. Owing to Charles II's compliant attitude, France was, in 1685, obtaining a position of incontestable preponderance in continental Europe. Nor had the monarchy ever seemed so strong at home. It was in 1685 that Louis felt able to expel the French Protestants and to establish religious uniformity. Under him, France had become a power uniform in its nationality and ecclesiastical system, with well-defined frontiers, admirably armed for offense and defense, both by land and sea. Previously to the succession of the Stuarts, English monarchs had for the most part carried out a policy of antagonism to France. From 1672 onwards, it is manifest that English foreign policy should have followed similar lines. The rivalry of England and France on the sea was becoming serious. The colonial interests of the two countries were certain to clash. The Protestant feeling in England was deeply moved by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes and was inclined to sympathize with the opposition of the Dutch and of several of the German states to the aggressive policy of Louis XIV. For three years, however, England was compelled to stand by and watch the preparations for establishing French predominance in Europe. These three years, 1685 to 88, proved to be decisive in the history of England and France, not less than in that of Germany and Holland. James II, owing to his change of religion, showed himself to be more closely attached to France than had been Charles II. His self-confidence was such as to make him believe that the conversion of England to Roman Catholicism was possible and could be brought about by his own efforts, backed up by the aid of the French king. He was resolved never to break off his alliance with France 
and if necessary to support Louis against William of Orange. In coming to a resolution of such significance at the very time when Europe was beginning to realize the danger of French preponderance, James was mainly actuated by religious considerations, which to him, as to Louis, were of paramount importance. James, almost openly, aimed at a restoration of the Roman Catholic religion so complete as to make its subsequent destruction impossible, and he perceived that only by means of a French alliance could he expect to carry out his policy. His accession at the beginning and the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, approved of by the English king, at the close of the year 1685, were thus calculated not only to give to the religious question the foremost place in European affairs, but also to impress forcibly upon Europe the existence of a close understanding between the kings of England and France. Before the end of 1685, James had assured Louis that he hoped to carry out his own religious views in close alliance with France. For a time, however, the sympathy of the English people for the French Protestants forced him to take up a moderate attitude. By the beginning of 1686, it was becoming evident that a great European crisis was at hand. The proceedings of Louis and James II implied the existence of projects for strengthening Roman Catholicism in England and France. The action of the French king with regard to the reunions in Luxembourg signified a definite resolution on his part to gain the imperial dignity for himself or his son. The truce of Ratisbon had given France for 20 years the left bank of the Upper Rhine, which constituted an eighth part of the empire. And henceforward, Louis aimed at converting the truce into a permanent peace. In 1686, the predominance of Louis was fully established. His ally, James II, was on the English throne the emperor was busy with the Turkish war. The situation was not unlike that of 1672. Had James II remained king of England and the unswerving ally of the French king, Louis' chances of success in his next European war would have been decidedly good. The events in England during the next two years were therefore of immense importance to Europe, and the struggle on the eve of being decided in England became an important feature of the great conflict which was about to engross the attention of the civilized world. The longer hostilities were averted, the stronger became the position of the opponents of Louis. The Emperor Leopold had greatly improved his own by carrying on a crusade against the Turks. He thus secured the support of Innocent XI, and as a Catholic sovereign, furthering the cause of Catholicism, assumed the preeminence which Louis had hoped to assert. Moreover, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685 roused all the Protestant countries in Europe, while Pope Innocent XI had been alienated by the French king's declaration of the independence of the Gallican Church. Already in February 1685, the great elector, abandoning his alliance with Louis, had made an alliance with William of Orange, and the revocation of the Edict of Nantes only confirmed him in his Protestant attitude. The resolution arrived at by the great elector was all the more important, seeing that the year 1686 might bring with it a joint attack upon Holland by the forces of England and France. The emperor and the elector of Bavaria were occupied by the war against the Turks, and James II was the firm ally of Louis XIV, who was resolved to transform the Truce of Ratisbon into a peace. He himself declared that he could not doubt that he should be attacked so soon as the war with the Turks had been brought to an end. The formation on July 6, 1686, of the Augsburg Alliance, with the object of preserving the treaties of Münster and Nijmegen, together with the Armistice of 1684, justified Louis' apprehensions. It was a defensive alliance between the emperor and members of the empire due to fear of a French attack upon the Palatinate, and Louis was convinced of its hostile purpose. The successes of the imperialists against the Turks, therefore, 
could hardly fail to stir Louis into action. In 1686, Buda fell at last, and in August 1687, the emperor won a great victory at Mohacs, in consequence of which the Hungarian throne was, in December, declared to be hereditary in the Habsburg line. As the clouds darkened in the east, Louis prepared to take action. He fortified many of the towns provisionally in his occupation, and it was thus quite evident that he intended to enforce their definite cession to him. He openly aimed at acquiring complete military preponderance in Europe. The ecclesiastical independence of France and the imperial dignity for himself or his son. In the pursuit of these aims, he received the full support of James II, under whose rule England had become the cornerstone of the fabric of French aggression. The situation in the early months of 1688 was on the whole favorable to the execution of Louis' designs. Though his position with regard to the lesser German powers had become far from satisfactory. The Elector of Brandenburg had definitely thrown in his lot with the Emperor and with William of Orange, and the Elector Maximilian Emmanuel of Bavaria, who in 1685 had married the Emperor Leopold's daughter, Maria Antonia, took a leading part in opposing Louis' schemes. Marshal de Villars had, in 1687, been sent by Louis to Munich, to win over the Elector of Bavaria to the French cause. Through Villars, Louis offered the Elector, in exchange for an offensive and defensive alliance, his good offices to obtain the dignity of King of the Romans for him and to recover Bavaria's former rights over Ratisbon, Nuremberg, Augsburg, and the territories between the Inn and the Danube. He also promised subsidies. In return for these advantages, the elector was to further the candidature of the Dauphin to the throne of Spain, should Charles II die without children. In that event, however, the kingdoms of Naples and Sicily would be handed over to Bavaria. The elector, however, was proof against these offers of Louis, who further urged him to shake off the Habsburg yoke and to emancipate Germany, and he decided to support the emperor, who appealed to his German sympathies, upheld the claims of his brother Joseph Clement, Bishop of Freisingen and Ratisbon, to the electorate of Cologne, and proposed, with the consent of Spain, that part of Flanders should be ceded to Maximilian. End of section 6, read by Martha Weller, Champagne, March 15th, 2023. Section 7 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 5, The Age of Louis XIV. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2, The Foreign Policy of Louis XIV, 1661-97, to by Arthur Hassel, Part 3. The year 1688 proved decisive for the future of Europe. The ascendancy of France had become a standing menace to the peace of Europe. The domination of Louis XIV was not less dangerous to the European world than was that of Napoleon in the early years of the 19th century. Under a vigorous, intelligent, and centralized despotism, France, with her immense material resources as yet unimpaired, held an undisputed supremacy in the West. The French armies were accounted the best in Europe, and the French fleets commanded the Mediterranean and rivaled those of England and Holland. French diplomacy had no equal. The effects of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes were not yet felt, and the resources of France had not yet been squandered by interminable wars. So far, all attempts to form coalitions against the French predominance in Europe had failed, and the League of Augsburg had had humbler aims. It was not till the revolution in England which placed William of Orange on the throne of the Stuarts that the foundation was laid of the Grand Alliance, which checked the arrogant pretensions of Louis XIV and eventually removed the danger of French supremacy in Europe. 
Until that revolution had been accomplished, there was a well-founded fear in the minds of the enemies of France that the events of 1672 might be reproduced, and that Holland might again be found helpless before the forces of England and France. The danger was a real one, for while all the powers from whom the Dutch government could look for support were occupied in the war against the Turks, James and Louis had come to an understanding with regard to operations against Holland and the Empire. A quarrel between Denmark, the ally of France, and Sweden about Schleswig-Holstein had led to an agreement between James and Louis with the object of preventing a combination between Sweden and Holland. It was arranged that an English fleet should put to sea and make a demonstration so as to prevent Dutch aid being given to Sweden in an attempt upon the Danish islands. In June 1688, an English fleet of 20 ships anchored in the Downs, and Louis undertook that it should shortly be joined by the French fleet, which had been sent to the Mediterranean to bombard Algiers. In the same month, the empire was also threatened. In January 1688, Maximilian Henry, Archbishop and Elector of Cologne, a Bavarian prince, who also held the important bishoprics of Liège and Hildesheim, appointed Cardinal William von Furstenberg, a nominee of the French king, his coadjutor in the archbishopric. Maximilian had for some years been practically the vassal of France and had supported the French cause in Germany. On his death in June 1688, Louis determined to secure the archbishopric for Furstenberg in order to retain the control of so important an electorate and ecclesiastical province. As Furstenberg was most active of all the dependents who remained to France in Germany, his election as Archbishop of Cologne would imply the dominance of the French power in the northwest of the empire. Though Furstenberg received a majority of votes at the election, the emperor determined, with the full agreement of the pope, to uphold Prince Joseph Clement of Bavaria, the candidate of the minority. French troops at once occupied Cologne, and it was evident that Louis intended at all costs to carry Furstenberg. There seemed indeed, in the summer of 1688, little chance of any successful resistance being offered to the execution of Louis's schemes. He was allied with Denmark. He had made an agreement with Hanover. His fleet was supreme in the Mediterranean. James II was his supporter. The continuance of the Turkish war seriously hampered his opponents. The preponderance of France in Europe implied the complete overthrow of the balance of power. For not only would Germany be weakened and divided, but the very existence of the United Provinces would be constantly threatened by Louis' supremacy on the Rhine. He would acquire complete military domination in Central Europe, while at the same time asserting the ecclesiastical independence of France. So long as James II, who cared nothing for the balance of power in Europe, was on the English throne, there was small chance of any successful resistance being made to the French king. Thus the revolution of 1688 in England, the deposition and flight of James II, and the accession of William of Orange to the English throne were events of the utmost importance in the history of Europe. So long as Louis felt safe from attack on the part of England, he was able to concentrate his energies upon his German schemes. The withdrawal of the English regiments from the Dutch service in the spring of 1688, the attitude of England and France with regard to the quarrel between Denmark and Holstein, the appearance in June of an English fleet of men of war in the Downs, the intention of Louis to bring the fleet then employed off Algiers up the English Channel, all convinced the Dutch of the danger which threatened the balance of power and the cause of Protestantism. A clear perception of the full significance of Louis' policy was shared with the Dutch by the Protestant princes of northern Germany. Among these, Frederick William, the great elector of Brandenburg, who died in April 1688, had for some time been convinced that it would be necessary for the European states to unite against the rising predominance of France. 
His successor, Frederick III, who opposed Furstenberg's claim to the Archbishopric of Cologne, made a treaty with Landgrave Charles of hesse cassel with the object of protecting Protestantism and of preserving from French conquest the United Netherlands and the towns of Cologne and Koblenz. These princes were thus acting in full agreement with the views of William of Orange, who desired, before he set sail for England, to see northern Germany and the Netherlands ready to offer a combined resistance to Louis. On his part, Louis realized in the autumn of 1688 that the continuance of the imperial successes against the Turks would imperil his chances of converting the truce of Ratisbon into a permanent peace. He also found in the claim to the Palatinate put forward by him on behalf, but against the wish, of Charlotte Elizabeth, wife of the Duke of Orléans, and last descendant of the Samaritan line, another reason for invading Germany. Accordingly, in September, his ambassador at The Hague warned the Dutch government against taking any hostile action against James II, and in the same month French troops invaded Upper Germany and besieged Philipsburg, which fell on October 29th. This action on the part of France rallied the princes of Germany to the defense of the emperor. John George, elector of Saxony, at once agreed to march with his forces to the Middle Rhine, thus cooperating with the emperor on the upper and with Brandenburg on the lower Rhine. Equally anxious to assist in the defense of Germany were the brunswick lurnberg dukes at Salle and Hanover and the Duke of brunswick wolfenbüttel Innocent XI had already shown his apprehension of the growing ascendancy of France. He realized that the triumph of Roman Catholicism in England would bring with it a close alliance between the English and French governments. To avert French predominance in Europe, the Pope therefore felt constrained to support the European opposition to Louis, October. All that was now necessary to prevent the triumph of Louis was the adhesion of England to the opposition offered to him by continental Europe. On the day of the fall of Philipsburg, William of Orange first set sail for England. He had satisfied the emperor that his expedition was not directed against the cause either of legitimacy or of Catholicism, but was simply intended to destroy the alliance between England and France. Had Louis attacked Holland instead of Philipsburg, William's expedition could not have taken place. Fortunately, the relations of James and Louis were at the time somewhat strained. James had taken exception to Louis' declaration at The Hague, which he thought implied that England depended upon France and could only defend itself with French aid. It was also the view of some of Louis' advisers that a civil war in England would best ensure English neutrality during the Continental War. Even with James II on the throne, it was by no means certain that a wave of popular feeling might not force him, as it had forced Charles II, into war with France. Thus, while French troops fought on the Rhine, William of Orange sailed to England and carried out the Revolution of 1688. Louis XIV, anxious to throw his forces against Germany and to increase and strengthen his frontier on the Middle Rhine, and not altogether satisfied with the independent tone assumed by James II, left him to struggle with his assailant. He had convinced himself that they might be left to carry on a long struggle which would occupy their energies and resources while he conquered the Palatinate, and by his intervention in Western Germany, hampered the emperor's chances of a decisive victory against the Turks. There was no time to be lost, for on September 6, 1688, the emperor captured Belgrade, a success which seemed likely to prove decisive. Louis at once determined not to besiege Maastricht, though its siege might have compelled the continued presence of William of Orange in Holland, and thus postponed for a time the overthrow of James II. He decided instead to declare war against the emperor and to invade Germany. He had already shown his determination to allow no scruple to interfere with his settled plan of acquiring complete military preponderance in Europe 
both for defense and offense. The election of his nominee, William von Furstenberg, at Cologne, June, and the fall of Belgrade, September, decided Louis to take the equally important step of evading the Palatinate on September 25th. In deciding on this course, Louis and his ministers showed that they considered the interests of France were best served by insisting upon the permanent cession of the territories provisionally allotted to the French crown by the Truce of Ratisbon in 1684 and by asserting the claims of the Duke of Orléans in the name of his wife to the Palatinate. William of Orange landed at Torbay on November 15th and entered London on December 28th. James II fled and on January 4th, 1689, reached the French coast. The House of Stuart had fallen and Louis XIV could no longer look upon England as an ally or as a quantité négligeable. The rapid success of William of Orange and his coronation as King of Great Britain and Ireland were events of immense importance for Europe. The whole fabric of Louis XIV's foreign policy was overthrown, and the year 1689 marked the close of the period of French aggression. England was no longer a possible ally. Denmark was unable to make any diversion in favor of France. The Turks were being driven back. Wishing to concentrate his chief efforts upon Roussillon, Italy, and the Lower Rhine, Louis decided to evacuate the Palatinate. And by the advice of Louvois, orders were given in December 1688 to devastate the country. Heidelberg was sacked in March 1689, and shortly afterwards, Mannheim, Spire, and Worms suffered a similar fate. Ladenburg and Oppenheim were burnt, and a large tract of country, including not only the Palatinate, but parts of the Electorate of Trier and of the Margravate of Baden were also ravaged. The Rhine district was in great measure ruined, with the result that the hostility to France among the German states was aggravated. Louis had been persuaded by Louvois that the devastation of the Palatinate, like that of 1674, was justifiable by custom and necessary from a military point of view. Marshal de Villars, in his memoirs, condemns the devastation as unnecessary and opposed to the true science of war. It certainly united Germany in opposition to Louis, and it did not prevent the Germans from taking Bonn and Mainz. Thus, from a military as well as from a political point of view, Louis' action in the Palatinate and surrounding country was a blunder. In many respects, the year 1689 forms an epoch in the history of Europe as well as in that of France. The fall of the Stuarts and the accession of William of Orange marked the return of England to the position which she had held in the days of Elizabeth. In 1689, England had again become the bulwark against all attacks upon religious freedom and the champion of the balance of power. Further, the year 1689 marked the beginning of the struggle between England and France for supremacy in India and America and for the command of the sea. It also marked the destruction of Louis' hopes of securing the imperial crown for himself or for a French prince. The revocation of the Edict of Nantes followed by the devastation of the Palatinate, had for time united Germany, and indeed the greater part of Europe, in opposition to the ambition of France. Failure also attended the French schemes for the restoration of James II and the overthrow of the English sea power. Consequently, Louis was thrown back upon his early project of securing the Spanish monarchy for his house. For some four years, however, after the Revolution of 1688, he still cherished the hope that with James II, his queen, and his son in France, he had the means of stirring up civil war in England and rendering her a useless member of the European coalition against him. At first, Louis intended to bring about the restoration of James II by advocating a religious crusade. He hoped to unite all the Catholic powers of Europe including the emperor and the Spanish king, for the overthrow of the English and Dutch governments. But since the Peace of Westphalia, religion had been steadily losing its influence as an active force 
in European politics. In 1688 and 1689, political necessity silenced the advocacy of religious partisans. The emperor was satisfied that William of Orange had no anti-Catholic aims in invading England. When James II, early in 1689, appealed to Leopold for assistance, the emperor pointed out that the Catholic religion had suffered no greater injury than from the French themselves, who had taken the opportunity of the Turkish war to attack in the most savage and unjust manner the western portions of the empire. On May 12, 1689, the Grand Alliance was signed by Leopold and the government of Holland, Leopold recognizing William III as King of England. While the emperor thus undertook to defend Holland from French invasion, William bound himself to defend Germany from future attacks on the part of Louis XIV. Denmark had already come to terms with the Allies, and the Duke of Savoy was firmly united with the Emperor in Spain. In April 1689, Louis, who was already engaged in hostilities with Holland, declared war upon Spain, which country, then under the guidance of Count Oropesa, had refused to observe such a neutrality in the coming struggle as Louis desired. Early in 1689, it was clearly apparent that all idea of a crusade in the West must be given up. Neither Innocent XI, who died in August 1689, nor Alexander VIII, nor again Innocent XII, who became Pope in July 1691, would give any real support to James II, so long as it was apparent that he was being used by Louis XIV in the attempt to make France all-powerful in Europe. In a great struggle which began in 1689 and continued without intermission till 1697, Louis arranged France as if she had been a huge fortress in the heart of Europe. Her troops would on occasion make forward movements, but if pressed by the enemy, they could retire to a safe position under cover of the numerous fortresses on the frontier. The center of the operations was Belgium, and its conquest by France entailed the conquest of Holland. The overthrow of William III was therefore essential for the success of Louis. The French king's attempt to organize a crusade on behalf of James II had failed. He next endeavored to secure supremacy in the English Channel and to stir up in Ireland a civil war which should occupy the attention and energies of William III. Ireland would thus be the means of creating a diversion against England. A long war would ensue, and Louis, unhampered by his chief opponent, would be able to carry out his aims on the continent. For the realization of this scheme, the supremacy of the French fleet in the Irish and English channels was absolutely necessary. Unfortunately for the success of the plan, Louis miscalculated the strength of Irish resistance, he sent only 2,000 French troops to Ireland, and he made no attempt to secure supremacy in the Irish Channel. On July 11, 1690, the Battle of the Boyne overthrew the hopes entertained by Louis of a long, drawn-out struggle in Ireland, and the fall of Limerick, October 1691, rendered futile all plans for the restoration of James II by way of Ireland. Had Louis realized the importance of sea power, a French fleet could have commanded the Irish Channel, and the Battle of the Boyne would not have been fought. As it was, on July 10th, the day before that battle, Admiral de Tourville, in command of 75 French men of war, defeated a combined English and Dutch fleet in the Battle of Beachy Head. On July 1st, the French, under Luxembourg, had won the Battle of Fleurus over the Dutch and their allies who were commanded by Prince George Frederick of Waldeck. The time seemed opportune for an invasion of England on behalf of James II, while William III was still in Ireland. But Louis insisted upon a Jacobite rising as a necessary preliminary to the landing of any French troops in England. Still under the influence of Louvois, Louis attached more importance to the operations in the Netherlands and Italy than to the naval operations in the English Channel. In April 1691, Louis himself was present at the capture of Mons, and in June, Halle also fell into the hands of the French. 
The same year saw Savoy overrun by the armies of France, while the Duc de Noailles took advantage of the discontent of the Catalans and captured Ripoli and other towns. Had Seignelay's advice been taken, the French might have secured naval supremacy in the Channel, and by the destruction of some of the southern English towns and of English commerce, if not by an actual invasion, seriously interfered with William III's projects. The victory of Beachy Head was, however, not followed up, and on May 29, 1692, Tourville was utterly defeated by the English and Dutch fleets under Russell in the Battle of La Hogue. The importance of the Battle of La Hogue, so far as the restoration of James II and the security of England were concerned, cannot be overestimated. Before the battle took place, James II was confident that an attempt on England would be followed by his own restoration and by the triumph of the principle of legitimacy. Louis XIV had equally satisfied himself that the probability of success was considerable. His agents reported that there were few troops in England and that the fleet was unprepared. He accordingly placed under Marshal de Bellefond a force of 30,000 men who, in anticipation of Napoleon's arrangements in 1805, were to be conveyed across the Channel and to accomplish the conquest of England. As in 1805, all depended upon the superiority of the French sea power and the command of the Channel. A fleet from Toulon was to meet the Brest fleet under Tourville and to carry out the invasion of England. Luckily, tidings of these plans reached the English government, which at once took energetic measures. The English and Dutch fleets having been ordered to unite, Tourville was ordered to prevent, if possible, the junction, and though the Toulon fleet, owing to contrary winds, had not yet reached Brest, to attack the enemy. His defeat in the Battle of La Hogue meant that the plan adopted by Louis XIV and James II for the invasion of England had utterly failed, that in spite of the success of French privateers under such men as Jean Bart, Du Guétroin, Du Casse, Pointis, and others, the command of the Channel had definitely passed into the hands of England, and that William would be able to devote all his attention to the war in the Netherlands. There the struggle was of a fierce and prolonged character. It was impossible for the Dutch to allow the Spanish Netherlands to fall into the hands of the French. The Spanish Netherlands were the bulwark of the United Provinces. The loss of the former would leave the Dutch at the mercy of Louis. Moreover, their conquest by the French would mean the subjection of Spain to the will of Louis XIV. Though defeated in Ireland and on the sea, Louis could boast of successes in the Netherlands. In June 1692, shortly after the Battle of La Hogue, he had followed up his successes of 1691 by the capture of Namur, the bulwark of Brabant and Liège. Nor did the fall of Namur complete the list of Louis' successes on land in 1692, for on August the 3rd, William of Orange was defeated by Luxembourg in the Battle of Steinkirche. The French defeat at La Hogue was thus to some extent balanced by the disasters to William of Orange in the Netherlands. What was more serious, the French naval power, though crippled in the Channel, had still to be reckoned with in the Mediterranean. Nor, moreover, had the army which Victor Amadeus, Duke of Savoy, had collected in Piedmont, won any signal success during its invasion of Dauphiné in 1692. No valuable position was captured, and owing to the presence of Catanat and the illness of Victor Amadeus, the invading army fell back, having accomplished nothing of importance. Thus the close of 1692 left the issue of the struggle between Louis XIV and the Grand Alliance still uncertain, and four more years of warfare followed, during which the influence of the sea power of England gradually made itself felt. For some years, however, it was doubtful if the Allies would be able to hold their own against the French armies. The Emperor had on his hands a war with the Turks. The English fleet had by no means acquired an unquestioned supremacy at sea, and both Spain and Savoy seemed likely to be compelled to make terms with the French king. Moreover, the English attacks upon Martinique, Newfoundland, Guadalupe, and San Domingo failed. 
and in 1694, the French reconquered Senegal and Gorée. The complete triumph of the Austrians over the Turks and the establishment of British supremacy in the Mediterranean and in the Channel were needed in order to assure the victory of the Grand Alliance. Fortunately, the emperor in the end proved triumphant over the Turks, and the English government, supreme in the Channel after the victory of La Hogue, recognized the necessity of sending a powerful fleet into the Mediterranean. It was not, however, till after some years of fighting that the victory of the emperor over the sultan was assured. The outbreak of the war on the Rhine had at first a serious effect upon the course of the struggle between the Austrians and the Turks. Up to 1689, the imperialists, owing to the uneasy peace that prevailed in Western Europe, had been able to win a series of almost uninterrupted successes. The continuance of these, which are narrated in a later chapter, was checked by the outbreak of the war on the Rhine. The Grand Vizier Mustafa Kiuprili at once advanced and in 1690 reconquered Servia, Viden, and Belgrade. However, at the Battle of Zalankamen, Margrave Louis of Baden, on August 19, 1691, defeated the Turks after a terrific struggle. Grosvardine was taken, but hostilities languished during the next few years, and it was not till September 11, 1697, that Prince Eugene was able to deliver an overwhelming blow upon the Turks in the Battle of Zenta. In January 1699, the Treaty of Karlovitz closed a war in satisfactory fashion for Austria and enabled the Emperor Leopold to concentrate his attention upon the Spanish succession question. During the four remaining years, 1693 to 97, of the war in Western Europe, while the financial distress of France, aggravated by bad harvests of 1692 and 1693, became more and more serious, the importance of the command of the Mediterranean was emphasized in a striking fashion. The withdrawal of English troops from Tangier in 1684 had been followed by the establishment of French supremacy in the Mediterranean and by the culmination of Louis' triumphs. The Truce of Ratisbon was signed six months after the retirement of the English fleet from the Mediterranean, and it was not till 1693 that any real attempt was made to interfere seriously with French naval preponderance in the south of Europe. In that year, William had been defeated at Neerwinden, London, and Tourville had captured a portion of the great Anglo-Dutch fleet which was making for Smyrna. The Duke of Savoy had been defeated in the Battle of Marsaglia by Catinat, who was thus enabled to invade Piedmont, while the Spaniards had failed to check the advance of another French army under the Duc de Noailles in Catalonia. Unless the English fleet made a demonstration in the Mediterranean, it seemed more than likely that Louis would force Spain and Savoy to retire from the war. French supremacy in the Mediterranean being thus secured, Louis could withdraw his forces from the south of Europe and concentrate his attacks upon William III and the Emperor. Immediate action was therefore necessary. The Tory admirals were dismissed. Russell was restored to his former position of commander-in-chief, and in May 1694, he sailed for the Mediterranean. He arrived at a critical moment. Aided by the French fleet under Tourville, Noailles had invaded Spain, capturing Palomas and Girona. The fall of Barcelona was imminent. The entry of Russell with his fleet into the Mediterranean at once changed the aspect of affairs. The advance of Noailles was checked. Barcelona was saved, and Tourville retired to Toulon. It was obvious that the recovery by the English fleet of the command of the Mediterranean would overthrow the plans of the French king and would probably hasten the conclusion of peace. In 1695, Russell, who had wintered at Cadiz, planned to attack Toulon or Marseille to overthrow Tourville's fleet and with the cooperation of Duke Victor Amadeus of Savoy to deal the French sea power in the Mediterranean an overwhelming blow but the Duke was already meditating an arrangement with Louis, and Tourville continued his defensive tactics and remained safely in the harbor of Toulon, while the English fleet was unable to bring on a decisive action. Yet the presence of the fleet in the Mediterranean 
and the tenacity shown by William III in the Netherlands, where he had besieged Namur, prevented Louis from achieving any striking success and tended to exhaust the French resources. Nevertheless, during the later months of 1695 and throughout 1696, Louis was able to profit from the weakness and treachery of some of his opponents. The Duke of Savoy deserted the Grand Alliance, and in consequence of this defection, the King of Spain and the Emperor were compelled to consent to the neutralization of Italy. An attempted invasion of England in the winter of 1695-96 to had indeed ended in failure, but the English government had decided to recall the fleet from the Mediterranean so that in 1696, Tourville was able to bring his squadron safely from Toulon to Brest. The results of the English command of the Mediterranean during the years 1694 to 95 had, however, exercised a most profound effect upon the course of the war. Louis' plans had been upset. Spain had not been conquered, and the French fleet was no longer in a condition to carry out any important movement. The adhesion of the Duke of Savoy on August 29, 1696, to the French cause, and the neutralization of Italy, tended to reconcile William III to the prospect of peace. For the defection of Savoy would enable Louis to bring some 30,000 troops under Catinat into the Netherlands. William, indeed, on September 5, 1695, had taken advantage of the death of Luxembourg in the previous January and had followed up the seizure by the allies of Dixmude and Huy by himself capturing Namur. For the first time during the war, the French armies had been badly beaten, and Europe was encouraged to find that Louis was not invincible. This success, however, was counterbalanced by the defection of Savoy in the following year, by Vendôme's reduction of Barcelona after 52 days' siege, and by Catinet's capture of several important Spanish towns in Flanders. In spite of these proofs of the growing weakness of the Grand Alliance, and in spite of the overtures of peace made by Louis to Holland and England, William III was, in the autumn of 1696, supported by Parliament in his determination not to treat with France except with our swords in our hands. Early in 1697, however, to his astonishment, Louis expressed his willingness to restore Lorraine and Luxembourg to their lawful owners, to recognize William as King of England, and to surrender all the conquests made by France during the war. Accordingly, negotiations under the mediation of Sweden were begun. In May 1697, the Congress of Ryswick was opened, and on September 20th, a general peace was concluded. The first treaty was made by France with England, Spain, and Holland. William III was recognized by Louis as King of Great Britain and Ireland, and Anne, second daughter of James II, was declared heiress to the throne of Great Britain and Ireland. Louis, moreover, promised not to encourage plots against William III. All places won since the Peace of Nijmegen were to be restored, France thus regaining Pondicherry and Nova Scotia, and Spain recovering Catalonia, Mons, Luxembourg, Ath, and Courtrai. On the other hand, France restored Fort Albany to the Hudson's Bay Company, which had been driven out of most of its possessions in 1685. The chief forts in the Spanish Netherlands, such as Namur, Ypres, and Menin, were to be garrisoned by Dutch troops, and the Dutch were to obtain an advantageous treaty of commerce with France. The emperor made peace with France very reluctantly, and it was not till October 30th that William III induced him to agree to a treaty with Louis. By it, France ceded all places taken since the Treaty of Nijmegen, except Strasbourg and Landau. She also withdrew from the right bank of the Rhine, yielding Philipsburg, Freiburg, and Breisach, and she restored Lorraine to its duke, keeping only Saar Louis in her hands. Louis, moreover, abandoned his candidate for the electorate of Cologne and renounced the claims of the Duchess of Orléans to the Palatinate for a sum of money. In view of the imminence of the Spanish succession question and of the financial distress in France, Louis acted wisely in coming to terms with his foes. He hoped, moreover, 
by his concessions to win over to his side a number of the German princes, who presumably might be expected to regard with alarm the great increase of the imperial power consequent upon the defeat of the Turks and the annexation of all Hungary and Transylvania. At any rate, the Grand Alliance was broken up, and France, with her recuperative powers and her well-organized government, remained the strongest and most united power in Europe. End of Section 7 Read by Martha Weller, Champaign, March 16, 2023Section 8 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 5, The Age of Louis XIV. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3. French 17th Century Literature and its European Influence by Émile Fauget. The literature of France in the 17th century has always been regarded both by other European peoples and, with the exception of a few writers whose influence is not perhaps of much weight, by the French themselves, as most thoroughly representative of the literature of which it forms part. In no other period have the distinguishing characteristics of French intellect and genius, method, logical sequence of ideas, and lucidity of style been so conspicuous. The classical tradition of Greece and Rome, followed by the great poets and prose writers of the 16th century with a zeal as overmastering as it was injudicious and transmitted by them to those of the 17th, was handled by their successors with so fine an insight, so sure a sense of proportion, and so instinctive an art of combining national originality with the inspiration of classical tradition, in short, with such felicity and propriety and skill as to have resulted in a success almost unparalleled in the whole history of literature. Innumerable influences were intermingled and interwoven in this period of literary worksmanship, but three of them, at least, proved so strong, so striking, and so continuous throughout the whole of the century that a kind of authoritative rank ought to be assigned to them. These are the influences of Montaigne, that of Malherbe, and that of Descartes. By virtue of the power which Montaigne exercised, he belongs rather to the 17th than to the 16th century. Every 17th century man of letters read his works incessantly and was deeply imbued with their spirit. In all these writers are to be found deep traces, echoes, imitations, and even plagiarisms of Montaigne. It is a striking indication of this all-pervading influence that the two chief representatives in the 17th century of whatsoever in it was most Christian and most Catholic, the two most deeply religious men of the age, and therefore those furthest removed from the spirit of Montaigne, that is to say, Pascal and Bossuet, found Montaigne, as it were, blocking their way, and became intent upon refuting his principles. This proves how living was the influence exercised by Montaigne on the minds of men, and how those who differed from him in their ways of thought and feeling still felt it incumbent on them to wage war against him as against a present, and indeed an omnipotent, adversary. Although Montaigne represented the classical tradition in perfection, and borrowed from it all that was most refined and best suited to the French mind, he himself represented, or it might even be said, evolved the true French spirit. From him his compatriots learned delicacy of treatment and derived the taste for a searching but dexterously and gracefully conducted analysis of ideas, together with their love of the study of characters. 
pursued with ardor, but not without the sure touch of the master's hand, in short, every tendency proper to the humanist and the moralist, who is at the same time a man of genius. The literature of the 17th century, which concerned itself almost exclusively with the study of man, owes its bent in large measure to him. In a word, Montaigne might almost be described as the literary father-confessor of the 17th century. Descartes, himself a moralist, for we must not forget his marvelous Traité des Passions, bestowed on the 17th century those qualities which Montaigne either naturally lacked or did not deign to acquire. Careful arrangement, a sense of order, the rectilinear sequence of ideas, the art of boldly tracing the grand outlines of general conceptions with a sure touch of a master hand. Teacher in this respect of Bossuet, of Bourdaloo, of Boileau, even of Molière and of Racine, as well as of Malbranche, he mapped out the high roads along which the French intellect was to travel. Had Montaigne been the only writer to exercise a controlling influence over French minds, they might perhaps have become too much attached to winding bypaths. Had Descartes been the sole influence, they might have fallen into the habit of keeping to the high road. Thus it is fortunate that one of those two great personalities revealed the charm of the labyrinths of literature through which the visitant strays, not however dropping the thread from his hand, while the other grandly opened out the royal highway straight through the forest intellectual. Last, Malherbe, following in the footsteps of Ronsard, but with none of Ronsard's defects, taught Frenchmen, first of all, the use of plain, clear, and concise language, which had rejected everything superfluous and bore no trace of piercing. More especially, he taught them rhetorical poetry, eloquence clothed in noble verse, the amplitude and the movement of stately sentences. He taught the French to become perfect orators in verse as well as in prose, for we learn from poets how to write prose, and his influence, which in a measure had long been latent, made itself felt to an enormous extent throughout the school of 1660, the central rallying place of all French literary effort. The members of this school included orators in verse as well as orators in prose, who set forth abstract ideas in harmonious and ample style. In other words, in the style best fitted for them, since it placed their finest qualities in the strongest light. In Montaigne, then, we find a delicacy of diction which is full at the same time of grace and of strength. In Descartes, order and strength in composition. In Malherbe, a sure and expressive oratorical form. And in one and all, we find reasonableness. These qualities in combination formed the essence of the classical French of 1660, which in its turn has exercised so profound and, all things considered, so salutary an influence on the different literatures of Europe. The school of 1660 included at least a dozen writers of the first rank, each with his own distinctly defined originality, but each possessing qualities common to all, and each exhibiting close affinities to the rest. Only a few of the chief among these writers can be here mentioned and characterized. Corneille, who, however, preceded the others, and who only belongs to this group in the sense in which a father belongs to his family, was as much of a Stoic as was Montaigne. But although he took delight in posing as such, he was, in the main, the poet of that doctrine of free will, 
of which Descartes was the convinced and eloquent exponent. Corneille sang of magnanimity, of loftiness of soul, though he was not thereby prevented from frequently drawing base and vile characters, or from displaying singular penetration in the analysis of complex individualities. But he is preeminently the poet of the human will. He portrays man struggling against the blows of fate and prevailing against them by means of his trust in himself and the inward strength with which he feels himself in doubt. He depicted those quote-unquote warrior souls whom Bossuet was later to call to mind, and at his bidding there passes before our eyes a long procession of combatant spirits. Corneille remains the very type of those artists who aspire towards the things that are great and who hold that the highest kind of beauty is to be found in the beauty of holiness. Bossuet pressed the most powerful eloquence, and a verbal but yet disciplined vehemence into the service of the religion he expounded. The impetuous arguments with which he stormed the enemy's citadel were tempered by order and method, and each was advanced in its own place and season. Indeed, he conveys the impression of a general who has weighty and powerful forces under his control, which he pushes to the front with equal rapidity and precision in an assault that never breaks the ranks or mars the symmetry of their lines. La Fontaine, the most self-contained and original of the poets, and indeed of all the writers of the 17th century, owes little to Montaigne, little to Malherbe, although he loved him greatly, and little to Descartes, although he read him incessantly and rendered him worthy homage. He was a 16th-century poet, matured by the ideas of the 17th century and the various influences that circulated round him. His ingenuity rises into elegance, while the freshness of his originality might have tempted him to superfluity had it not been kept within nice and just limits by the good taste of the time, so that he actually became concise while remaining easy and supple. He had at his command an inconceivable variety of turns of style and mannerisms derived, in the first instance, from his own intellectual nature, and secondarily, from his wide reading of authors of every age, country, and style. Above all else, he had the quality of life, that sense which makes even the slightest of his stories a miniature drama and endows each of his characters with a physiognomy all its own in its features, actions, and bearing. The most poetical of French poets, he stands, as it were, alone, and seems beyond the reach of extraneous influences, because he outvies them all. Boileau is, strictly speaking, the pupil of Malherbe, and, whether for better or for worse, just as one may view it, a pupil turned teacher, a pupil, that is to say, who fears to go further than his master and shrinks from nothing so much as from being original. Possessed of wit, especially of that satirical wit which is not the highest kind, he had good judgment, a logical mind, and even eloquence, he knew how to draw a portrait, or at least how to block out a sketch. His style, when defining literary precepts, was clear and fairly powerful. He discoursed on questions of morals as one possessing authority and capable of some emphasis, and he could be carried away by feverish indignation in rebuking an indifferent writer. He ought to be, although he probably is not, the idol of the quote-unquote aesthetic school, since he exhibited against the writers of other schools than his own a spirit of indignation which found its vent in invective such as is usually reserved for criminals. Thus he possessed all the qualities, 
together with the chief failing of men of letters. Everything that can be said about Molière has been said, as to his wonderful gift for making even the most complex of his characters alive and real, until their conversation and even their very gestures have become proverbial. His comic power, or in other words, his art of arousing and of at the same time satisfying more and more fully as he proceeds the interest of curiosity seasoned by malice, his depth of conception, which is a very different thing from close observation of life, and which consists in the creation of characters capable of being viewed from ever fresh standpoints and possessing an inexhaustible interest for those who subject them to analysis so that they offer a new revelation to readers of each successive generation. But it has not been sufficiently pointed out that, like Corneille, like Boileau, and like La Bruyère at later date, Molière has often, indeed almost always, the dogmatism of a preacher, that his most important comedies are theses, that his aim was to teach, to exercise moral control, to impress his precepts on all who listened to him. And he too would have applauded the saying, quote, Woe to him who is content with applause, end quote. In common with most of the French writers of the 17th century, he was an eloquent expounder of morality, and such he intended to be. Finally, for we must not unduly prolong this rapid survey, Racine showed throughout his work what Corneille showed only on occasion, that he was a delicate and subtle and profound painter of the passions. It is true that, strictly speaking, he only studied the three passions of love and jealousy and ambition, but he treated these with great skill in all their devious movements, he traced their development, and he depicted every shade in their operation, even the most fleeting, without, however, losing himself in a maze of detail, and never forgetting the broad outline. Hence his gallery of living portraits, admirably managed from the point of view of technique, which time will never obliterate or change or tarnish. These great men were the admiration of all Europe in their day, and they exercised a very powerful influence over the European literatures of their times. In Germany, this influence lasted for nearly a century, from the Thirty Years' War until the middle of the 18th century. Mention must be made of Martin Opitz, who, copying the example of his Dutch master, Daniel Hansius, had imbibed the leading principles of French literature in such a degree as to earn for himself the name of the German Malherbe. He was a pronounced partisan of the system of imitation, and, far more like Ronsard than Malherbe, he strove to introduce into the literature of his own country the distinguishing beauties of every other literature. We should also mention Fleming, who imitated the French, especially where they in their turn had borrowed from the Italian school. Andreas Griffius, a rather florid copyist of Corneille, a writer whom, had he been French, would have found an acknowledged place between Rotrou and Rouillet. The various imitators of the French romances of the first half of the 17th century, imitators who really derived more from the Spanish influence in French literature than from French literature itself. Nor, above all, must we forget Gottsched, translator of Racine's Iphigenie and author of The Dying Cato, the German ultra-classic, who was at the same time the most thoroughgoing of the imitators of the French school, and also the last, or nearly the last, of these copyists, and who was speedily dethroned by the national school. And for a moment we feel impelled to call from oblivion the worthy and genial fabulist Gellert, 
who derived almost as much inspiration from La Fontaine as from his own kindly nature, and who thus possessed two excellent sources, from which, in point of fact, he might have drawn far more than he did. But the great name which dominates the whole of the period from 1650 to about 1750 is that of Leibniz. He was great enough to need no master. Nevertheless, he owed to Descartes his first incentive, the foundation of his inspiration, more especially, and beyond doubt, the very tone of his mind, that wide and tolerant optimism which runs throughout the whole of his work and animates it with confidence and with hope. Leibniz might almost be said to impersonate a French idea, which, after sounding the depths of a German mind, comes forth the richer and fuller for the experience, while still retaining the distinctive style and characteristics of its origin. After him, Lessing appeared above the literary horizon, who dealt the Gouffre Francais such a blow that, after 1760, the influence of French on German literature practically ceased to exist, a fact which should not be treated as a grievance, since it is best for every nation to live its own life both intellectually and morally. Italy, too, came under French influence after 1650, having in its day exercised an immense effect upon the literature of France. The Seicentisti, from the middle of the century onwards, were strongly colored with French influence. Guidi bears the stamp of Malherbe, but his style is more inflated. Testi, a faithful disciple of Horace, also possesses something of the grace of Maynard and of Racan. Chiabrera, the Italian pinder, learns lessons from the French poets rather than copies them. But his confirmed habit of imitating the classics is very evidently traceable to French influence, and his pupils, Filicaia and Menzini, followed the same course, perhaps almost too faithfully. Finally, in 1713, Italian tragedy, after keeping silent long after the profound slumber in which it had been sung during the whole of the 17th century, was reawakened by the inspiring touch of the Merope of Maffei, who was, like Voltaire, one of the most brilliant pupils of the French tragic writers of the 17th century. The Spanish writers of the 17th century scarcely borrowed anything from the French. It was rather the French who imitated them. But from the beginning of the 18th century, it might almost be said that Spain was a pupil of the French school. To Ignacio de Luzan y Guerra, the disciple of Descartes and of Port Royal, Spain owed the logic of Port Royal, and he also introduced Milton to his countrymen. Moratin wrote both tragedies and comedies entirely in the French style. Cadalso, after finishing his student days in Paris, imitated the Lettres Persanes in his Cartas Maroecas, and Voltaire in his tragedy Don Sancho Garcia. Jovellanos, who also translated Milton, produced in the same epoch on the Spanish stage his tragedy Pelaje, written on French lines. Spain had to wait until the 19th century before she again reverted to her own literary idiosyncrasy, which, assuredly in no sense to her discredit, altogether differs from that of the French nation. Finally, from 1700 onwards, England came under French influence in a very clear and unmistakable manner. Addison is the pupil of Boileau, more gifted, more refined, and more brilliant than his master, but still never forgetful of his master's teaching. Moralist, satirist, and critic, a poet equally at home in the romantic, allegorical, and tragic styles, he could turn with ease from French wit to English humor, and often seems even to combine, 
mix and blend the two together. Taking everything into account, we find Edison so exquisitely French in his methods, as Valentine of Milan said of Dunois, he was stolen from us. Pope, who has inevitably been much imitated in France, owed much to her in his earlier days. The style and manner of his letters remind us of Balzac and of Voiture. His moral poems have the precise turn of wit characteristic of Boileau. He represents, as it were, the transition between Boileau and Voltaire. Moreover, the Danciad reads as though it were copied from the Lutrin, the evident relationship between the two poems being shown by their close similarity of style. These great names must be supplemented by those of Waller, the friend of saint Evremont, and the correspondent of La Fontaine, in whom we might almost say was revived all that was finest in our witty précieux of the seventeenth century. Garth, the amusing humorist, who recalls the French burlesque, and whose works Voltaire so highly appreciated as to translate some of them. Arbuthnot, Gay, Lord Boilingbroke, Lord Chesterfield. The name of Swift may be omitted from the list inasmuch as, in the first instance, if he borrowed at all from the French, it was rather from the writers of the 16th than from those of the 17th century, and secondly, because Swift's was too original and too individual in nature to allow of his being cited as an example of any kind of external influence. But here it is necessary to stop, in view of the well-known fact that, if the English humorists of the early 18th century certainly owe much to the French, the English quote-unquote sentimentalists of the middle of the 18th century no less certainly exercised a very strong and deep influence over Diderot, Rousseau, and Sedan. This outline, for it is nothing more, indicates the general characteristics of the great French writers of the 17th century, who made themselves heard and felt throughout the European world of letters of that century and the early years of its successor. It was a glorious era in French history, however diversely it may be regarded according to the national standpoint of the student. As had been her lot in the 13th century, so again in the 17th, France was unanimously acclaimed the intellectual sovereign of Europe, all eyes being turned towards her and all ears listening for her action. The predominant influence of French literature is everywhere perceptible. For a time, its prestige blocked the way and arrested the action of every individual impulse, every national movement, in the literary history of every nation. Especially was this the case in Italy and Spain. It was also partially true of Germany and England. Perhaps, after all, it is not a bad thing, in the long run, for a people to put itself to school for a time to another nation, or rather, since this is never really done, to enter upon a period of diligent, careful, and devoted study of the literature of another people. The French nation ought to be aware of this truth, for not less than four times in its history a period of imitation of foreign work has been succeeded by a brilliant and in some ways a glorious literary revival, by no means to be explained as a mere coincidence. First, after a searching study of the classics, came the Pléiade. Then came the literature of 1660, after an intimate study of Italian and Spanish writers. Then the period of Diderot and Rousseau, after a salutary enthusiasm for English literature. And lastly, the French Romantic Revival, after a time of devotion to English and German literature. It may be, for on these inevitably obscure and extremely complex matters it is better not to dogmatize, 
that contact with a foreign influence enriches, in a general way, the national literary sense. Or, again, certain sides of the national mind which were unaware of their own existence, or at all events hardly suspected it, may awake and become conscious of their existence when they recognize themselves in the literature of a foreign land. Or, yet again, the real essence of a nation's intellectual life may be distilled and acquire fresh strength by the very reaction against a foreign literature that has for a time been injudiciously worshipped. And in this case, too, good arises, though indirectly. For example, English humor will endure for all time but we have seen that it was developed to a singularly high degree in England after contact with French wit. And again, in Germany, the National Revolution brought about by Lessing and the great literary results that ensued for German literature were stimulated by French influence, which not only invigorated German wit, but incited it to the assertion of its own independence. We are reminded of the saying of La Bruyère concerning strong and sturdy children who fight their nurses. Nurses give sustenance to their foster children for the very purpose of making them strong and able, if need be, to fight their foster mothers. They perform this task in perfect consciousness and cheerfully undertake the risk which it implies. Whatever the explanation may be, for nearly a hundred years, France occupied a position towards every other European nation analogous to that of a nurse, and, on the whole, she cannot assert that, when she remembers this experience, it is wholly unsatisfactory to her. End of section 8 Section 9 of the Cambridge Modern History Volume 5. The Age of Louis the Fourteenth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sean Stutz. Chapter 4. The Gallican Church by Vicomte saint Cyr. Part 1. During the first half of the 17th century, French religion went through a somewhat chaotic stage. Catholicism had triumphed under Henry IV, but the whole reign of his successor was taken up by discussions as to the particular form which Catholicism should assume. For a long while the country swung to and fro between two rival schools of extremists, neither of which was strong enough to crush the other. At one end of the line were the ultra-clerical party, headed successively by Mary de' Medici and Anne of Austria. At the opposite end were the upholders of a purely official religion. Their strength lay chiefly in the legal and administrative class, which Richelieu had raised to power. They were ready enough to call themselves Catholics and perform the ancient ceremonies of their country with decent moderation, as one of their own great writers enjoins. But they insisted that Catholicism should be kept under the strict surveillance of the civil powers. Its profession was not so much a duty to God as a duty to the state. Their real religion they found in the books of such men as Guillaume du Ver, 1556 to 1621, Bishop of Lisieux and Lord Keeper during the regency of Mary de' Medici. He offered them a purely natural religion, set out in singularly impressive language, largely borrowed from the ancient Stoics. Intensely moral and patriotic, it is touched throughout with Christian sentiment, but it owes quite as much to Epictetus as to the Sermon on the Mount. Where the fathers swore by Duver, children passed on to Descartes, 1596 to 1650. The philosopher posed as an excellent churchman, and when Protestant friends in Holland tried to convert him, he answered that the religion of his king and of his nurse was good enough for him. But his real work was to finish what Duver had began. His meditations gave the world what the world had never seen before, proofs of God, freedom, and immortality, put into language strictly reasoned, but not too hard for average minds to follow. These three things once proved, however, Descartes made his bow and departed, leaving the field clear for theology. What God was like, he did not pretend to say, nor how eternal happiness was to be compassed or our freedom to be used. That was a matter of faith, not reason. 
and he only dealt with the domain where philosophy and religion overlapped. Hereupon followed the natural results. Most Cartesians' imaginations fastened on to the truths of reason, and but little occupied themselves with those of faith. The first were the essentials of religion, the second its accidental clothings, mere ancient ceremonies of one's country. Not that this consequence showed itself at once. Churchmen were a long while in deciding whether Cartesianism did more good or harm. The great Jansenist Antoine Arnaud spoke up warmly in its favor. Bousquet was much more doubtful, but Pascal was the one Christian thinker of the age who steadily opposed it. Nor were the rationalists themselves quite clear whither they were bound. At first sight, no one looks more negative than Guy Patin, 1601-72, an eminent but very cross-grained professor from the Collège de France. He was always congratulating himself on being delivered from the nightmare, and he rivals the 18th century in the scorn he pours on priests, monks, and especially that black Loyolic scum from Spain, which called itself the Society of Jesus. Yet Patin was no free thinker. Skeptics who made a game of the kernel of religion came quite as much under the lash of his tongue as bigots who dared defend its husks. His letters end with a characteristic confession, Credo and Deum, Christum crucifixum, etc. De minimis non curat praetor. At the opposite pole from Pétain stood the party of the so-called Devaux. Patronized successively by the two foreign queens, its first object was to introduce new fashions and devotion, and new religious orders, from Italy or Spain. For French religion and French literature were alike impoverished, and must borrow from abroad. The Devaux were only doing in one field what Preciosité accomplished in another, when it brought in gongorisme, or exaggerated emphasis, from beyond the Pyrenees, and a little concité from beyond the Alps. In neither case did native taste take altogether kindly to the loan. The barefoot Carmelites, for instance, were brought to France, under the patronage of one queen, and warmly encouraged by the other. Daughters of St. Teresa, they represented the fine flower of the Spanish counter-reformation. They brought with them a glow of torrid romance, that set well enough on the countrywomen of Don Quixote, but was utterly out of place in the Paris of Descartes and Guy Patin. Their religion was all violent contrasts of light and shade. In their churches was a great show of perfumes, flowers, and fine linen. In their cloisters, extraordinary austerities, terrible scourgings, the most humiliating penances, and fasts on bread and water. Louis de Valliere, flying from the arms of Louis XIV to scrub floors in a Carmelite convent, is a typical example of their picturesque sensationalism. Still less acceptable to most Frenchmen was the piety of the Italians. Here, artistic triviality reigned. Patin is never tired of denouncing their bad little books of devotion, full of miracles and monkish revelations, cords of St. Francis and girdles of St. Margaret. Nor was their want of taste their only fault. They, and all they represented, widened the breach between Cartesian rationalism and the Church, in particular, they exasperated the Huguenots, had stood wantingly in the way of their reconciliation with the Roman Church, and that was an object that most good Frenchmen had very much at heart, though often for political reasons quite as much as for religious. A good instance is the skeptical critic St. Evermont, 1613-1703. He quite agreed with the Protestants that they would not find a rational religion in Italy or Spain. Thanks to the Gallican liberties, however, he thought they might find it in France, if they left the girdle of St. Margaret alone and took to reading Bousquet. The liberties in question were certain ancient rites, in which most Frenchmen took a patriotic pride. They were peculiar to France, and, as the crown lawyer said, they had never been granted like a privilege, but grew up in the very nature of things. They consisted chiefly in four points. Papal bulls might not come into France without leave of the crown, the decisions of the Roman congregations had no legal weight in France. French subjects could not be cited before a Roman tribunal. French civil courts took cognizance in ecclesiastical affairs whenever the law of the land was thought to be broken. And inasmuch Catholicism was part and parcel of the common law, the parliaments could and did give this last article a very wide extension. They were perfectly ready to enter into the merits of an excommunication, and force bishops or cardinals to withdraw it if they thought it improperly launched. There are even cases in which they adjudged the sacraments to those who could not obtain it from their parish priest. However, these abuses were the exception. 
and the mass of the French clergy put up with the parliaments easy enough. After all, the only alternative was an appeal to the Pope, and to him they were by no means anxious to go, even had their government allowed it. Most visitors to Rome told the same tale. They were scandalized at its pettiness, especially at its neglect of theological scholarship. Much more secular branches of learning tempted Italian ambition. The road to the purple lay through nunciatures and administrative offices. Divinity was left to the friars, who had no other chance of advancement. But indifference leads as straight to intolerance as ever can fanaticism. When a too original book was published, the cardinals made haste to put it on the index and troubled themselves no more about it, sure that it would soon be forgotten. In France, this irresponsible high-handedness was neither possible nor desired. A single example would have drawn down on the offending prelate a swarm of jeering pamphlets. For the Huguenots were always on watch to spy out a joint in Goliath's armor, and herein they were supported by lay Catholic opinion. Most Frenchmen liked authority well enough within its proper sphere, but they expected it to obey the law and common sense. All these things inspired a strong dislike of the doctrine of papal infallibility. Dogmatically speaking, Frenchmen thought it unhistorical, and opposed to the ancient traditions of their church. Administratively speaking, it meant a revolution. Hitherto they had settled their ecclesiastical disputes at home. Once admit infallibility, and appeals innumerable would go from their own highly competent tribunals to a set of incapable judges in a foreign land. Lastly, Bellarmine and the Roman Ultramontanes had grafted on to the theological dogma a set of political consequences highly exasperating to French national pride. It was argued that ecclesiastical interests took precedent over all other interests, and of these the Pope was the only judge. Hence he had the right to dictate his will to temporal sovereigns whenever he thought such interests were concerned. If they refused to listen, he could punish them in any manner he thought fit. In the last resort, he could depose them, incite their subjects to rebellion, and head a crusade of Catholic powers against them. Much of this, no doubt, was simply dialectical steam, blown off by heated professors in a classroom. But steam can drive small wheels as well as great. The French ministers knew very well that ultramontanism could not depose Louis XIII from his throne. It could, and did, write seditious pamphlets whenever Richelieu supported a Protestant power against a Catholic. But in their foreign policy, at any rate, Richelieu and his successors meant to keep their hands entirely free. Here they must be able to ignore ecclesiastical interest as much as they pleased without fear of ecclesiastical disturbance. Hence the need of a doctrine that would bind the consciences of all Frenchmen to obey no master but their king. This need Gallicanism supplied. It may be described as a generalization of the ancient Gallican liberties, evolved as a counterblast to ultramontanism. Like the rival theory, it developed a theological and a political side. Theological Gallicanism maintained that the supreme infallible authority of the Church was committed to Pope and bishops jointly. Political Gallicanism declared that no amount of misconduct or neglect of Catholic interests justified the Pope in interfering with a temporal sovereign. The two doctrines grew up independently, and even under Louis XIV, many Jesuits and other divines were politically Gallican and theologically ultramontane. But early in the 17th century, the two sides of Gallicanism were welded together by Edmond Richet, 1559-1631, a famous doctor of the Sorbonne. To the Richelieu's and the Colbert's, Gallicanism was a mere device for snuffing out clerical opposition. In the hands of Richet and his successors, it became an honest attempt to solve the great problem of the age and show Frenchmen how to be at once good citizens and good Catholics. For a new era was dawning. On the divisions of the wars of religion, there followed an irresistible reaction toward patriotism and national unity. France had suddenly grown to her full stature. Like the contemporary England of John Milton, she was become a noble and puissant nation, rousing herself like a strong man after sleep. Ultramontanism strove hard to check what it called this separatist tendency, and to strangle national aspirations in the leading strings of the papacy. But even the clergy were swept away by the current, and meant to be patriots like everyone else. Before my ordination, said Richer, I was subject to the King of France. Why should that ceremony make me subject of the Pope? His eccentric follower, Michael Cretin, went further still and exhorted the assembled Sorbonne to rally to the service of its king. Exabimus nos galos e non galines, he cried. Before long the Gallican wave had invaded the Jesuits themselves. 
When Louis XIV, after a period of diplomatic coolness, again sent an ambassador to Alexander VII, Father Repin overflows about his royal condescension in thus honoring the Pope. And in the great quarrel with Innocent XI, the society was among the strongest supporters of the crown. Gallicanism necessarily led up to the doctrine of divine right of kings. This doctrine is developed by Bousset in his Politique Trié de l'Écriture Sainte, written between 1675 and 1680, while the author was tutor to Louis XIV's only son. Bousset by no means followed the same lines as his contemporaries across the Channel. The theologians of Charles II upheld the divine right of legitimate monarchy, as opposed to other forms of government. Bousset's object was to show that all established sovereignties, whether monarchical or republican, hold the power directly of God, and not mediately through the Pope. God wills that in every country there should be some settled constitution. What particular form it takes, the customs of the country will decide. But once a particular form of government has established its prescriptive right, no power on earth can interfere with either the system itself or with its lawfully appointed officers. A bad but legitimate king can no more be exchanged for a good than an established republic can transform itself into a monarchy. In short, Bousset's book is a plea for political stability at all costs. He was old enough to remember the Fronde and the misery its flighty constitutional experiments brought upon the common folk. He was writing a manual for the sons of Louis XIV at a time when Louis's methods of government had culminated in a blaze of glory. Naturally, he wished those methods to continue forever. No doubt this royalist enthusiasm acquired a thick enough coating of vulgarity by the time it reached the lower strata of the clergy. The great Huguenot controversialist Giraud has much to say about a thesis on the argument from design maintained by certain Franciscans of Marseilles, whereupon the chief proofs of a deity's existence was drawn from the triumphs of Louis the Great. But the worst effect of this perpetual incense was on the character of Louis himself. It is true it did not touch his religion, for that was a mass of Spanish superstitions inherited from his mother. As Madame Maintenon told Cardinal de Noailles, the king would never miss a sermon or a fast day, but no one could make him understand what was meant by humility or repentance. His private superstitions had, however, little to do with his public policy. Here he walked in the steps of Richelieu, and made the glory of God come altogether second to the glory of the king of France. The church was a most effective instrument of government, and therefore he supported the church, but he expected pope and bishops to take their marching orders from him. If they refused, he was perfectly ready to make war on one and send the others to the Bastille. The clergy were in fact supernumerary members of the civil service. By the Concordant of 1516, the crown appointed to all bishoprics and abbeys. The mere nomination was the least part of the business. The real strength of the crown lay in its power to raise or lower clerical incomes as it pleased. It could burden an incoming bishop's revenues with pensions to whomever it chose. It could reward good service with fat sinecures. Of these, the most important were the abbeys in Commandam. They could be granted to whomsoever the king chose. No resident or other duty was expected from the abbot. He need only to be in holy orders. He might be a child or even a Huguenot. Indeed, it could be anything except a monk. For if a qualified person were appointed, the abbey was restored to rule, and further abuse became impossible. Still more curious was the royal perquisite of the regal, or right to the temporalities of a vacant bishopric. Of these, by far the most important was the patronage of benefices in the bishop's gift, chiefly canonries, archdeaconries, and a host of minor appointments in cathedrals and collegiate churches. Parochial livings were excluded as directly involving cure of souls. In the hands of successive generations of crown lawyers, this prerogative was developed to an incredible extent. It was held that prescription could not be pleaded against the crown, Hence, if a benefice once fell under the regal, there it remained, until the crown had exercised its right. As a matter of grace, the crown seldom interfered with a dignitary who had been in possession of his stall for thirty years. But any time within that period, an episcopally appointed canon was liable to injectment, on the grounds that the patronage of his place rightfully belonged to the crown. Hence, to present a man a canonry was often equivalent to presenting him a costly lawsuit. Quite apart from the regal, however, litigiousness was a besetting sin of the French clergy. Cathedral chapters, in particular, were proverbial for their lawyers' bills. Their great object was to make themselves as independent as possible of the bishop, and herein their lead was followed by numberless deans of particulars, rectors, incumbents of donatives, and the like. 
The lichen of exemption, said St. Francis of Sallus, is fast eating away the trunk of the church. Another great evil was non-residence. Bishops no longer commanded fleets, nor could they throw up their pastoral charges in Mary, as more than once happened under Louis the Thirteenth. But most of them would very much rather serve at court than reign in their cathedral cities. And to banish a prelate to his diocese was one of the heaviest sentences Louis the Fourteenth could pronounce. Even Felanon talks of his palace at Cambrai much as Ovid talks of Tommy. These non-resident pluralists were divided by a yawning gulf from the humble country curates. Most of these were miserably poor, even poorer, relatively speaking, than their successors in modern France. Of education, they had little. No means existed for obtaining it. The Sorbonne, or theological faculty of Paris University, gave an elaborate education in divinity, but few young men could afford to spend seven years over their degree. Few of the provincial universities taught theology at all, and seminaries, or diocesan colleges preparing directly for the priesthood, were only just beginning to be founded. On the other hand, the bishops expected nothing more from a candidate for holy orders than some evidence to character and enough Latin to stumble through a few lines of the breviary. Hence, the most astounding ignorance was common enough. Priests were found who did not know the common formula of absolution. St. Vincent de Patille had trouble persuading others that they ought not to take money for hearing confessions. Jean-Jacques Allier, founder of the Seminary of Saint-Sulpice, came across a priest in his parish who was in the habit of praying to St. Beelzebub. The awakening of these poor curates and their flocks became the favorite project of St. Vincent de Paul, 1576 to 1660. His Lazarists, or priests of the mission, were to evangelize the country districts. His sisters of charity were to relieve their temporal distresses. These two bodies represented the triumph of two important innovations. The old-fashioned nun had spent her whole time behind high walls in prayer and contemplation. The one object of the Sisters of Charity was the service of her neighbors. The first aim of an old-fashioned order was to make itself independent of all existing authorities. St. Vincent's two institutions were expressly intended to collaborate with the bishops and the parochial clergy. This last idea was not absolutely new. Cardinal de Beru, 1574-1629, had founded the French Oratory, a very free adaptation of the original Institute of St. Philip Neri in order to train up clergy for country dioceses, but the oratory proved too lettered for its work. Instead of a popular training college, it became the home of speculative recluses, such as the philosopher Malebranche, 1638-1715, or Ricard Simon, 1638-1715, founder of biblical criticism in France. As a nursery of clerical scholars, the oratory had only one rival. This was the Congregation of St. Mar, 1627 an offshoot of the Benedictine order. Under the guidance of Malbihan, 1632-1707, it developed an invaluable school of critics and ecclesiastical historians. Malbihan and Malabranque only touched the few. The education of the masses of the clergy fell into the hands of the Sulpicians, founded by Abbé Allier in 1641, and the Eudists, 1643, so called for their founder, the Abbé Eudist de Marzerai. Following their lead came the Christian Brothers, 1680, an association of celibate laymen who furnished teachers for the humbler class of schools. But all three bodies laid much more stress on piety than on learning. Sensal Peace, in particular, devoted itself not so much to theological science as to the practice of that science and the virtues proper to the clerical state. An abounding interest in applied religion marks the whole revival. Perhaps its most characteristic outcome was the rise of professed directors of conscience, divines who specialized in spiritual ailments. They stood to ordinary confessors much as a consulting physician stands to a general practitioner. No doubt their rise was not an altogether healthy sign, and a director often aggravated the ills he was sent to cure. He became the natural target for all the morbid scrupulosity and self-analysis which idle and luxurious lives produce. Fenelon, a great expert in these matters, has many hard things to say about the valetudinarians in Seoul, who felt their pulses twenty times a day and sent continually to the director to beg new drugs or promises of quick recovery. But the prominence of direction was a strong acknowledgment of the needs of personal religion. It was felt, on the one hand, that something more than routine religious duties was demanded of the laity. It was felt, on the other, that they could not be trusted to pick out the vital elements in religion for themselves. Some were too feeble, others too erratic, hence the use of a director. 
he kept flightiness from trying dangerous experiments and broke up the bread of doctrine into morsels suited for a feeble appetite. Direction, however, was only for the few. For the many, the one means of instruction was the sermon. Nowadays, it is hard to realize how large a part the pulpit played in the life of 17th century France. Political assemblies were unknown. Journalism, still in its infancy, was closely muzzled. The pulpit was the only place where popular criticism of those in high places could safely make itself heard. Nor did preachers always resist the obvious temptation of airing their views on subjects in general, just to show off their own cleverness. Labriere declares that they made their pulpit a means of advancement as rapid, but not less hazardous than the profession of arms. Others gave in to the dominant preciosité, Mascaron, 1634-1703, and Flechier, 1632-1710, the two earliest of Louis XIV's court preachers, could generally be trusted not to say things in a simple way, if it was possible to put them in an artificial. But the religious revival waged war on preciosité. St. Vincent de Paul is said to have thrown himself at the feet of a flowery young orator, and begged him to give up ornaments so unworthy of a crucified Jesus. This spirit triumphed in Bousset, 1627-1704, to greatest of all the preachers. Quite apart from their literary qualities, his sermons are distinguished by a fervor at once evangelical and practical. His aim was to so interweave doctrine and morality that each would lend assistance to the other. Faith would be the inspiration of all Christian practice, while practice in its turn would lead to a deeper grasp of faith. But, except on a few state occasions, Bousset seldom mounted a Paris pulpit after he became tutor to the Dauphin, 1670, and his mantle fell on the Jesuit Bordelot, 1632-1704. In him, however, a moralistic, argumentative tone makes itself heard beside the evangelical. As Fenelon said, his sermons were magnificent reasonings about Christianity, but they were not religion. This criticism is still more true of Massillon, 1663-1742, last of the great court preachers. Preachers and directors might make much of personal religion, but there was a general tendency to treat it as the crown and the flower of religion, rather than its root. For any high degree of sanctity it was indispensable, but it was thought a man could scrape into a humble place in paradise without possessing even its germs. This view is more especially common among the Jesuits. Not that it was peculiar to them. The Jesuits have invented little but their energy, their boldness, their elastic organization, unfettered by any ancient traditions, make them peculiarly conspicuous champions of whatever ideas they may adopt. In this matter of personal piety, their sympathies were specially engaged. It appealed to individual experience, and such experience had been the great weapon of Luther and Calvin. But the Jesuits were sworn enemies of the Reformation and all its works. They boasted that they were nothing that Protestantism was, and all that Protestantism was not. Then, too, individual experience was cloudy and anarchic. But the Jesuits were essentially a combatant body, brought up to a more than military discipline. Their sympathies were all for military precision. Dogma is as clear-cut as a proposition of Euclid. Pascal might object that in religion what is clear-cut and precise is seldom true, but the Jesuits had no time to listen to such scruples. Practical efficiency was their aim, and efficiency required a positive base of operations. Hence they were forever extending the scope of papal infallibility. Nor did these devotees of the practical take pains to distinguish between the ideal interests of a religion and the terrestrial interests of the church. It was God's vice-regent, and to appeal, as Pascal had appealed, from its decision to the judgment seat of Christ was alike blasphemous and foolish. Right-minded men trained themselves to believe that, whatever she did, the church was always right. But a church ridden by the specter of efficiency is like to end in frank utilitarianism. And during the 17th century there was a continually smoldering contest between the Jesuits and the divines of a less worldly school as to exactly how far utility should be allowed to go. The great fight was over the confessional. Should priests pitch their standards high or low? Jesuits argued that severity scared many away altogether, a contingency the more to be regretted in the case of the rich and influential. Accordingly, they began a campaign to force confessors to be lax. The famous doctrine of probabilism, 
first broached about the beginning of the 17th century, made it a grave sin in the priest to refuse absolution if there were any good reason for giving it, even when there were other and better reasons for refusing it, and to determine what such good reason was fell to Escobar and the causists. These writers developed a whole system of expedients for protecting the penitent from a too zealous confessor. The kind of question he might ask was carefully defined. He must not cast about for general information as to his penitent's disposition, as would a physician. He must try each offense strictly on its merits, as would a magistrate. He must always lean toward the most benign interpretation of the law, and for his guidance, casuistry ran many an ingenious coach and four through inconvenient enactments. In matter of detail, most of these are harmless enough. They are chiefly concerned with proving that common piccadillos, the white lies of the ladies of fashion, the trade customs of the shopkeeper, are not grievous sins. Nevertheless, in the opinion of Pascal, Milton, and other contemporary critics, causes degraded morality. They encourage men to take over their ideas of right and wrong, ready-made from the priests, and thus save themselves the trouble of thinking. As Milton said, their consciences became a individual movable, left entirely in charge of the priest. He, in his turn, must be content with the low quality of achievement. He might urge his penitents to do more, but human nature seldom resists the charms of a fixed standard, least of all when it is administered by a live judge in a visible court. If he must be satisfied with little, why be at the trouble of offering more? But the less he could expect from them, the more he was driven to trust the miraculous efficiency of sacramental grace. By hook or by crook, get the sinners to confession, and the whole work was done. However bad his natural character, the magical words of absolution would make him a new man. These abuses called forth a series of protests from eminent divines, among whom Bousset was the most conspicuous. And during the later years of the century, probabilism disappeared altogether from the French divinity schools. But Bousset only struck at isolated points. Meanwhile, a movement was springing up, which aspiring to cut down at the root of the whole Jesuit conception of religion. This was the revival known as Jansenism, so called for the name of its founder, Cornelius Jansen, 1585-1638, a Dutch divine, long professor of divinity at Louvain University, and afterwards bishop of Ypres in Belgium. His doctrines are contained in a bulky treatise on the theology of St. Augustine, posthumously published in 1640. Meanwhile, however, his ideas had been popularized in France by his friend Jean du Verger de Heran, 1581 to 1643, commendatory abbot of St. Cyrin. Both men were strongly gifted with the evangelical impulse, and both had early been brought into conflicts with the Jesuits. St. Cyrin, like many other French divines, sympathized warmly with the secular Catholic missionaries in England in their interminable quarrel with their Jesuit rivals. Jansen had early taken sides in the controversy that had raged in Louvain ever since the days of its celebrated professor Michael Bias, 1513-89, and the eminent Jesuit Leonard Lesius, 1554-1625. The great question at stake was the right way of teaching theology. The Jesuits partly stood for the strictly logical scholastic method. The followers of Bias were for an appeal to mysticism and subjective experience. End of section 9 Section 10 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 5, The Age of Louis XIV. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sean Stutz. Chapter 4, The Gallican Church, by Vicomte Sanseri. Part 2. Not that Jansen or his masters had any conscious tendencies toward Protestantism. They might be willing to encounter the Reformation by its own weapons, and show that Catholic Louvain could be quite as evangelical as Presbyterian Leyden. But party feeling was kept hot on both sides by continual border affrays. Jansen himself had a long battle with the learned Calvinist Botius, still remembered as an antagonist of Descartes. This double line of warfare shaped the ideals of the two friends. They were in search of a theology which could be Catholic, but not Jesuit, evangelical, but not Protestant. They found it in the writings of St. Augustine who offered them a strongly individualistic, mystical religion, dexterously interwoven with a high sacramental theory of the Church. Accordingly, Augustine became their oracle, and for years a sullen controversy raged as to whether Jansen had really understood his master. With the mass of his followers, however, these questions of scholarship were an altogether secondary matter. 
They valued his teachings because he gave them neither ceremonial nor theology, but genuine religion. For the great work of Jansenism was to insist that piety does not mean believing a particular opinion or adopting a particular mode of life. It means conversion, becoming a new creature. Morality, church-going, orthodox opinions might be excellent things in their place, but through them no man has ever saved his soul. His fate in the next world depended on whether his life in this had been informed by the love of God. And by the love of God, Jansen meant simply the religious sense. This might be weak or it might be strong, but even its humblest forms were enough to distinguish him who had it from those who had it not, to draw all his actions into a new perspective and put a different coloring on all his thoughts. But insomuch as a radical change of character is beyond a man's power to effect, grace must descend upon him like a whirlwind, as it had once descended on Jansen's two spiritual heroes, St. Augustine and St. Paul and draw his will irresistibly, unfailingly, victoriously, out of darkness and into light. Thus Jansen's doctrine of conversion melted into predestination. God calls certain souls to himself, the rest he leaves to perish in their sins. Surprise has sometimes been expressed that Jansen should have made so many converts to so terrible a doctrine. Even in his own day, deists had arisen to protest against a God, whose justice human misery exalted, whose essence human ills enriched. But the mass of Frenchmen conceived their maker as a hypostasized absolute sovereign. Like Louis XIV of Saint-Saint, he commanded and gave his reasons to none. Moreover, Jansen's doctrine of conversion softened the grimness of his predestinarianism. A man might be unregenerate today, but tomorrow it might please God to convert him, as he once converted St. Paul, model of all penitents. But Jansen's real object was to teach men that they cannot make their own religion for themselves. Left to their undisciplined fancy, they were straying on every side. Some were experimenting with the geometrical god of Descartes, others with ultramontane girdle of St. Margaret. Jansen answered that they cannot choose how or when they will be pious. They must wait till their maker touches their heart and tells them what he would have them do. Those who really long for God, said Pascal, long also to approach him only by means he has himself ordained. Thus the ultimate religious sanction became subjective, an inward witness of the spirit. And herein the French authorities saw endless possibilities of insubordination, both in church and state. For in the French 17th century, a theological opinion was a political event. A disaffected party in the church was sure to develop some kind of organized machinery for the furtherance of its views. And on this machinery, all disaffected parties in the state threw a wistful eye. The Fondura, in particular, would have given much for Jansenist support. But the Fronde was still to come, when Jansenism gave its first great manifesto to the world. One of Saint-Cyrin's most important converts was Angélique Arnaud, 1591-1661, abbess of Port Royal, a convent near Versailles, and thenceforth the headquarters of the party. She converted her brother Antoine, 1612-94, a young doctor of the Sorbonne. In 1643, Antoine Arnaud published a book, Frequent Communion, an attack on the confessors who gave absolution easily without inquiry into the penitent's character or the sincerity of his repentance. The book raised a violent storm, but many divines supported Arnaud, and no official action was taken against his party until 1649. Then the Sorbonne condemned five propositions from Jansen's Augustinius, all relating to predestination. This censure, backed by the signatures of 85 bishops, was sent up to Rome for confirmation, and in 1653 Innocent X declared all five propositions heretical. His judgment put the Jansenists between two fires. To accept it meant a surrender of their whole position. To reject it would put them outside the Roman Church. Accordingly, they temporized. They accepted the censure in the abstract, but denied that Jansen had held the positions in the sense condemned. In one sense, this was true. For a book may well mean one thing to spiritual experience, and quite another to an ecclesiastical lawyer. But the authorities could not be expected to listen to such reasonings. In 1656, Arnaud was expelled from the Sorbonne, in spite of Pascal's provincial letters, begun in an attempt to save him. The letters, 1656 and 7, soon left Arnaud behind, however, and go on to a general attack on Jesuit casuistry and devotion Isaïe. In October 1656, Alexander VII cut away the ground from under Arnaud's feet by declaring that his predecessor had condemned the Augustinius 
in the sense intended by Jansen. Arnault promptly set up the legal distinction of law and fact. In matters of dogma, he says, the church was certainly infallible, but about the private intentions of an author, it knew no more than anyone else. However, the authorities were obdurate. A formulary, or declaration that the Augustinius had been rightly condemned, in the sense intended by its author, was presently drawn up, and signature was made binding on all nuns as well as priests. At first, however, it was only imposed on suspected Jansenists, 1661, most of whom had refused to sign. The priests went into hiding, and the government began to prosecute the nuns of Port Royal. But in 1665, Pope and King resolved to make the signature really universal. Hereupon four bishops protested, those of Alette, Angers, Beauvais, Pommiers, and were only induced to make a very ambiguous submission in 1668. With this, however, the Pacific Clement IX declared himself satisfied, and the very secular French ministers, who were frankly weary of the whole affair, persuaded the king to seize this opportunity of admitting the Jansenists generally to grace, 1669. Hence the so-called peace of Clement IX is treated by Jansenist writers as a triumph. Really, it was the beginning of their downfall. They had set out to reform the church. They ended by having to fight hard for a doubtful foothold within it. And under the leadership of Arnaud, scion of a family of lawyers, the party itself had gone downhill. A controversial, argumentative impulse was shouldering out the spiritual. Everyone admired Arnaud's talents, for he was not only the party leader, but a considerable geometer and metaphysician. But in admiring, the world agreed with Bousset, who said that Arnaud was inexcusable for having squandered his great abilities in an attempt to prove that Jansen had not been condemned. Besides, the peace was much too artificial an affair to be loyally observed, least of all at a time when Louis XIV was preparing to enforce a rigid uniformity throughout his dominions. The Catholics he had well in hand already, the Huguenots he was soon going to expel from France. Why then show mercy to a handful of eccentric recluses who believed themselves to be in special touch with heaven, and therefore might at any moment set their conscience up against the law? Nor was an object lesson wanting. For many years past, the crown lawyers had been extending the regal, though a few dioceses, mainly in the south of France, still claimed exemption on the grounds of ancient usage. But in 1673, the government thought the time had come for enforcing uniformity, and Louis formally declared the regal universally binding throughout the realm. Only two bishops protested, Pavillon of Alette and Collet of Palmiers, both of whom had taken the Jansenist side in the matters of the formulary. The storm broke loose in 1675, when Louis presented to the canonry at Alette. Pavillon excommunicated the royal nominee. His metropolitan, the Archbishop of Narbonne, supported the crown. Pavillon appealed to the Pope. Very soon afterwards he died, 1677, leaving Collet to carry on the struggle alone. Collet, whose temporalities were by this time confiscated, made a series of appeals to Innocent XI, a high-minded but very undecided pontiff, and at last persuaded him to interfere, December 1679. In 1680, Collet died, but his cathedral chapter more than replaced him. The Metropolitan tried to interfere. Innocent declared his actions intrusive and threatened him with excommunication, January 1681. This invasion of the canonical rights of a Metropolitan for Innocent had prejudged the case, without listening to what the archbishop might have to say, was bitterly resented in France as a gross invasion of the Gallican liberties. After much consultation between the court and the leading prelates, it was agreed to convoke a special assembly of the clergy, a body roughly answering to the Anglican convocation, to deal with the whole question. The assembly met in October 1681. At its opening session, Bousset, just appointed Bishop of Meaux, preached a great sermon on the unity of the church. The regal was soon settled by a compromise, carried through by Louis himself against the advice of his ministers and greatly to the advantage of the clergy. Colbert now suggested that this would be an excellent chance of setting at rest forever the much-debated question as to the exact relationship of the Gallican Church to the papacy. Bousset and other bishops objected, on the ground that a declaration on this subject could do no good and would give mortal offense to Rome. But Colbert persisted, and in March 1682, the Assembly unanimously voted assent to four articles drawn up by Bousset. These are skillful compromise. On the one hand, they assert the main points of Gallican belief. 1. The Pope has no jurisdiction over temporal sovereigns. 2. He is below a general council. 3. The Gallican liberties are sacred. 4. The right of judging matters of doctrine belong to the Pope and bishops jointly. 
On the other hand, the article steered clear of the extremer forms of Gallicanism. The chief share in judging questions of doctrine is reserved to the Pope, and the declaration carefully leaves room for Bousquet's personal opinion, already expressed in his opening sermon, that the See of Rome, though not infallible, is indefectible, not necessarily right at any particular moment. It cannot fall permanently into error. These concessions did not satisfy the Pope. Peace with Rome was only made in 1691. But Bousquet's statesmanship won him enormous credit at home. For the next 20 years, he was the dominant figure in the church. A moderate and reasonable orthodoxy became the order of the day. As ultramontanism receded into the background, independent spirits of the type of Guy Patin began to gravitate back to the church. Even Cartesianism yielded for the moment to the spell of Malebranche and arrayed itself in the dress of a rationalistic and very much etherealized Catholicism. To the world at large, however, Bousquet was the great reconciler of faith and reason. On the lines sketched out in his Traite de la connaissance des dieux et des saumons and his Discours sur l'histoire universale, both these books were written between 1670 and 1680, while their author was tutor to the Dauphin. Their great aim is to prove by reason that men ought to submit to authority. Philosophy, argued the trade, shows that a god exists, and that he governs and controls the affairs of men. History, continues the discourse, teaches that his governance is mainly indirect. It is exercised by certain venerable corporations, ecclesiastical and civil, acting as his lawful representatives. Therefore, the discourse rejoins the politique terrie de l'écriture sainte, the third member of the trilogy. But Bousquet's great object in life was the conversion of the Huguenots. In 1678, he had overcome the scruples of Turin. Two years later, he published an exposition de la doctrine catholique, so moderate in tone that his adversaries accused him of having fraudulently watered down the Roman doctrines to suit a Protestant taste. On the other hand, he never doubted the right of the state to enforce religious uniformity at the point of a sword. This, as he more than once boasted in his controversial writings, was one of the few points on which Catholic and Protestant doctors were agreed. Besides, the French churchmen of the time were brought up to look on the Huguenots as a serious political danger. Saint-Simon only expressed this common belief when he calls them a, a sect which has become a state within a state, dependent on the king no more than it chooses, always loud in complaints and ready on the slightest pretext to embroil the whole kingdom by an appeal to arms. This passage represents what the Huguenots would have liked to do, rather than what they did, but in the few places where they were strong, they had undoubtedly encroached on their legal rights. Wherever they were weak, however, the government had long gone consistently on the plan of giving them less than their due, with small regard to the Edict of Nantes. Hence its revocation, of which an account has been given earlier in this volume, appeared to the clergy as simply the last term in a logical series. Concerning the dragonades that followed, opinion was divided. Some divines, of whom Bousquet was one, honestly did their best for the sufferers. Others agreed with the cynical sayings of Madame de Maintenon that there might be some hypocrisy among the adults, but the children, at any rate, would be gained to the church. Others, again, were chiefly concerned to protect the sacraments from the kind of profanation alluded to by Saint-Simon, when he said that twenty-four hours were often enough to bring a neophyte from torture to abjuration, and from abjuration to communion. Revocation by no means interrupted Bousquet's appeal to his other methods of persuasion. In 1668, he brought out his Histoire de Variations des Anglais Protestants, in which he sought to prove that variation is necessarily a sign of error. Soon after, he began to correspond with Leibniz with a view to the reconciliation of the German Lutherans with the Roman Church. But negotiations broke down on this point of variation. Individual Catholic doctrines, such as purgatory or the Mass, Leibniz thought that his countrymen might accept but he refused to guarantee that they would believe tomorrow what they believed today. We prefer, he said, to belong to a church eternally variable and forever moving forwards. Nor was it only in Germany that Bousquet taught the Protestants to glory in their variations. Giroux and other Huguenot controversialists fully accepted the idea of progress, and they presently went on to ask whether Rome itself was quite so unchangeable as Bousquet supposed. Herein they were supported by the oratorian scholar Richard Simon. He accused St. Augustine, Bousquet's own special master, of having corrupted the primitive doctrine of grace. Bousquet set to work on a defense de la tradition et de saints Perez, but Simone only went on to raise issues graver still. 
Under a veil of polite circumlocutions, such as did not deceive the Bishop of Mo, he claimed the right of interpreting the Bible like any other book. Bousuet denounced him again and again, and even set the police in motion. Simone answered that he could afford to wait until the old fellow was no more. Another oratorian was more dangerous still. Malebranc prided himself on having brought numbers of Jansenists, Cartesians, and other misbelievers back within the Catholic pale. But his remedies appeared to Bousuet almost as bad as their disease. Simon had endangered the belief in miracles by bringing lay rules of evidence into play, but Malebranc abrogated miracles altogether. On his principle, it was blasphemous to suppose that the author of nature would break through a reign of law he had himself established in the universe. Bousuet might burst forth into refutations and urge Fenelon to do the like. The philosopher courteously replied that to be answered by such pens did him too much honor. But the worst rebel of all was Fenelon himself, 1651 to 1715. The author of Telemaque had early made a great name for himself as director of conscience and as tutor to the Duke of Burgundy, eldest son of the Dauphin. But in contemporary eyes, he was not so much a theologian as a master of eloquence, or what would nowadays be called an accomplished man of letters. In the background also were larger projects of political reform. These multitudinous interests gave him a far wider outlook than Bousuet, though his grasp of realities was not so sure, and an intellectual curiosity more than once led him into dangerous paths. About 1689, he became much impressed by the ideas of Madame Guillaume, 1648-1717, a lady of good family, considerable abilities, and a great charm of manner. But the very hysterical representative in France of the religious revival known as Quietism. This was an outgrowth of the Spanish mysticism of St. Teresa, though it was first popularized in Italy by the Spanish priest Michael de Molinos, 1640-97. In his hands, it became a violent means of escape from the petty ceremonialism of Italian religion. Molinus was always bidding the soul rise above sacrament and attributes and dogmas, beyond the Trinity and the Incarnations, to a view wholly obscure and indistinct and general of the divine essence as it was. The one means of approach to this deity was the ancient Via Negationis. All hope and fear, all thought and action, all life and feeling must be laid aside. The soul must enwrap itself in the soft and savory sleep of nothingness, wherein it receives in silence and enjoys it knows not what. Such an attitude of mind might easily lead to antinomianism, but Fenelon thought a change of language would be enough to guard against the danger, while keeping all that was good in quietism. Molinos had spoken as though mere thinking of ourselves was the great evil. Fenelon's enemy is self-interest. In his Explanation of the Maxims of the Saints, 1697, he argues that as men grow in holiness, they become indifferent to themselves. Not only do they not value religion for its consolations, but they cease to take an incidental pleasure in its exercise. Their whole soul is taken up in a loving God, and they neither know nor care whether God loves them in return. Bousuet attacked this principle as inconsistent with Christianity, and for the next two years a bitter conflict raged between the two prelates, which did no great credit to either. Meanwhile, however, Fenelon had appealed to Rome. Early in 1699, Innocent gave judgment condemning the Maxims, although in very moderate terms. Fenelon at once submitted, and thereafter took small part in church affairs, except to wage a vigorous war against the Jansenists. For Jansenism was by no means dead, although the government tried hard to kill it. For a while, Louis XIV had stayed his hand, mainly out of regard for his cousin Madame de Longueville, once the heroine of the Fronde, and now the great patroness of Port Royal. But in 1679 she died, and the court at once proceeded to severities. The nuns of Port Royal were forbidden to admit new members to their community, and Arnaud fled from France never to return. Following the king's lead, the oratory and other societies where Jansenism had found an entrance began to keep a closer watch over the opinions of their members. Nonetheless, what is known as mitigated Jansenism, a doctrine which just managed to keep within the four corners of orthodoxy, found a large number of upholders. Among the laity, a Jansenist spirit was kept alive by the Reflexions Morales sur le Nouveau Testament of Pasquier Quesnel, 1634-1719. to 1719. This book, a popular devotional commentary first published in 1671, went through a number of editions without incurring any official censure, although the author was well known to be a Jansenist. In 1685, he had gone to share Arnaud's exile at Brussels, and on Arnaud's death in 1694, he succeeded to the official party leadership. Round his reflections was now spun a web of complicated intrigues. 
As Louis XIV grew older and more devout, there began a fight for his soul between the Jesuit confessor, Father Lachaise, 1624-1709, and Madame de Maintenon, an ardent disciple of the moderate school of Bousquet. In 1695, she secured the Archbishopric of Paris for her friend Noailles, Bishop of Chalon, a pious and well-meaning aristocrat, but woefully tactless and undecided. He was suspected also of a tenderness for Jansenism, he had certainly given official approval to Quesnel's reflections at Chalon, and this approbation he renewed at Paris, 1699. Accordingly, the reflections became the chief target of ultramontane attack, so much so, almost to supplant the Augustinius itself. While the work of denunciation was proceeding, a much more dangerous issue was unexpectedly raised. In 1701, an indiscreet Jansenist consulted the Sorbonne as to whether it was enough to receive the condemnation of the Augustinius in respectful silence. That is, with the purely external deference which good citizens might show to a law that they privately believed unwise. This casual question stirred the fires of fifty years before, and soon ecclesiastical France was in a blaze. In 1703, Louis wrote to Clement XI, suggesting that they should take concerted action to put an end to Jansenism forever. In 1705, the Pope replied with a bull condemning respectful silence outright. The bull only whetted Louis's appetite. The older he grew and the thicker disasters rained upon him, the more the ugly superstitious side of his character awoke. A frenzied anxiety seized him to propitiate his maker and save himself from another Blenheim or Malplaque by exterminating the enemies of the church. This resolution was by no means weakened when Father Lachaise died in 1709 and was succeeded by Father Tellier, 1643-1719, a Jesuit of blood and iron who had been immortalized by Saint-Simon in one of the most repulsive portraits in literature. Almost immediately he persuaded the king to expel the few remaining nuns from Port Royal, the holy place of Jansenism. In 1711 their cemetery was violated and their convent buildings pulled down. After Port Royal came the turn of Quesnel. In the winter of 1711, Louis proposed to the Pope to condemn the reflections in the most solemn possible form. In 1713 appeared the bull Eugenitus, a censure not only of all that Jansenism said, but of all that it had tried to say. Even Fenelon, although a warm admirer of the bull, admits that popular opinion credited it with having condemned St. Augustine, St. Paul, and even Jesus Christ. It went altogether beyond the technical questions raised by Jansenism, notably when it dealt a heavy blow against the practice of Bible reading lately sprung up among French Catholics, under the auspices of Bousquet, quite as much as of Port Royal. Hence, the appearance of the bull was the signal of a popular outcry. Even some fifteen bishops supported Noel's in refusing to accept it. The next two years were spent by the court in a feverish endeavor to force it down their throats. Noailles was only saved from deposition by the death of Louis in 1715. On the ascension of the regent Orléans, bigotry at once gave place to cynical indifference. Orléans was a free thinker, and all he cared for was to keep the clergy quiet, hence he always sided with the stronger party, in hopes of crushing out the weaker. As the bull was generally unpopular, he began by taking the part of its opponents. Tellier was got rid of, and Noailles became the chief ecclesiastical advisor to the court. But the regent soon found that he had underrated the strength of the Pope and the Ultramontanes. Besides, his two chief ministers, Dubois, 1656-1723, and Fleury, 1653-1743, were ecclesiastics and wanted a cardinal's hat. The regent accordingly swung round to the side of the bull. Nothing daunted by this, its foremost resolute opponents among the bishops published an appeal from the Pope to a general council, 1717. After some wavering, Noel supported them, but in 1720, Dubois patched up a truce between him and the Pope. This really satisfied neither party, though it obtained for Dubois a red hat. But in 1723, both he and the regent died, leaving Fleury to carry on their policy. Meanwhile, the appellate bishops had reappealed against the truce of 1720. So Fleury resolved to make an example of the most determined, Sewin of Senez, 1647 to 1740. He was suspended from his functions and exiled to a remote monastery in Avern. Noailles protested against this treatment, but soon afterwards he died, 1629, characteristically signing two documents on his deathbed, one of which accepted the bull, while the other rejected it. The chief appellant out of the way, Fleury proceeded to sharper measures. In 1730, Louis XV proclaimed the Eugenitus part and parcel of the law of the land, and ordered all the clergy to accept it on pain of deprivation. 
This edict the Parliament refused to register, and a bitter struggle ensued, which lasted throughout the 18th century. But the questions at stake were really Gallican, rather than religious. The lawyers called themselves Jansenists because they hated the Eugenites, but they hated it mainly as a triumph of their hereditary foes, the Jesuits and the Pope. Genuine Jansenism only survived among the handful of Quesnalists, and even they had fallen on evil days. Persecution can generally be trusted to induce hysteria in its victims, all the more so when they already accept a strong doctrine of conversion. Belief in one kind of miracle easily leads to belief in another, and even the great days of Port Royal could furnish a long list of special providences, miracles, and signs. As Jansenism shrunk more and more to the proportions of a harassed sect, these were multiplied a hundredfold. About 1728, the miracles of St. Medard became the talk of Paris. These were a series of astonishing cures, mostly of nervous diseases, affected at the tomb of the deacon Paris, a cleric of singularly holy life, and a perfervid opponent of the Eugenitus. On mere miracles followed the speaking with tongues and the rise of the convulsionaries. These worked themselves up, mainly by means of self-torture, into a state of frenzy in which they prophesied and cured diseases. They were, however, soon disowned by the more serious Jansenists. Banished from France, these had taken refuge in Holland, where the Catholic minority was in close sympathy with Jansenism. In 1702, it had broken loose from Rome and was now organizing itself into an independent old Roman Catholic church. But the old spirit of Port Royal still lingered in many a convent and country parsonage in France, and led throughout the 18th century to chronic conflicts with authority. Often the causes of quarrel were trumpery enough, and Jansen's latter-day descendants by no means always showed themselves reasonable or broad-minded. Still, in their dim fashion, they upheld the great principle of their school, that religion begins and ends as an inward touch of the spirit, and over the movements of that spirit, no church has jurisdiction. End of part 10. Section 11 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 5, The Age of Louis the Fourteenth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Adrian Stevens. Chapter 5. The Stuart Restoration by C. H. Firth. Part 1. Though the restoration of Charles the Second was unconditional, it was nonetheless a compromise. The monarchy, which was restored, was not the purely personal rule which Charles I had endeavoured to establish, but the parliamentary monarchy which the statesmen of the Long Parliament had set up on its ruins in 1641. Theoretically, the constitution, as it existed in March 1642, before the outbreak of the war, came into force again as the basis of the new settlement. Practically, any settlement must also contain some guarantee for the new interests which had developed during the last 18 years, and it was only through Parliament that such security could be obtained. The Declaration of Breda had outlined such a scheme of settlement, but the extent to which the King's suggestions would be adopted depended upon the temper of the nation, or rather of the House of Commons, and on the statesmanship of the King and his ministers. On the day when he re-entered London, he was now in the twelfth year of his reign by right, but, as he had been for the last eleven, a king without a kingdom. He possessed no experience of administration. While he had a large knowledge of men, he had none of popular assemblies. Yet he had great popular gifts when he chose to exert them, and was at once pliable and persistent. In the vicissitudes of his life he had learnt to adapt himself to the exigencies of the moment, and to adopt without scruple any expedient which seemed necessary for success. His political aims were simple and varied little throughout his reign. He desired to make the crown independent of Parliament, but in order to be free from control rather than from love of power. He took throughout a genuine interest in the development of the commercial and naval power of England and in the extension of its colonies. In religion, he was half a follower of Hobbes 
and half a Catholic, with a preference for toleration, based partly on policy and partly on indifference, but not strong enough to resist the pressure of circumstances. It would be unjust to say that his policy was purely selfish, but in the long run, personal considerations or family ties exercised a predominant influence on his political actions. At the end of his reign, events gave him, for a moment, almost absolute power, but he used it with comparative moderation, because he was resolved, as he said, not to go on his travels again. At the beginning of his reign, when his position was infinitely less secure, the same motive was still stronger. Added to this, the king's pleasures made him incapable of prolonged attention to public business, and obliged him to devolve the burden of public affairs upon a minister. Naturally, I am more lazy than I ought to be, Charles frankly confessed, but nature had given him great abilities, and he possessed a fund of dormant energy which time revealed. Edward Hyde, who had been Lord Chancellor since 1658, and the King's chief adviser since 1652, became the ruling spirit of the government. The hostility of the Presbyterian leaders and the intrigues of the Queen Mother failed to overthrow his influence, and even the marriage of his daughter with the Duke of York in the end confirmed it. In November 1660, he was raised to the peerage, and at the King's coronation in April 1661, he was made Earl of Clarendon. In most respects, Clarendon was well fitted for his task. Upright, laborious, and faithful to his master's interests, he did not shrink from maintaining them against court intrigue or popular opposition, or the king's own fluctuating will. In his political aims he was consistent, in his choice of means a strict observer of legality. No man was better qualified to restore the reign of law after a period of revolution, but very imperfectly appreciated the changes which that period had effected in the temper of the English nation. Intellectually, he was a contrast to his master, a slow-moving mind, inaccessible to new ideas, and neither quick to grasp new conditions, nor ready to adapt his policy to them. He could rebuild the Constitution upon the old lines, but he was not the man to reconcile conflicting parties, and his settlement contained the seeds of future strife. In Clarendon's conception of the Constitution, the most important organ was a well-composed council. Through it, rather than through Parliament, the machine of government was to be animated and directed. The Privy Council formed in June 1660, represented the union of parties which had brought about the restoration. Monk, now Duke of Albemarle, Montague and Cooper, both also raised to the peerage. Manchester, Robartes and Say sat in it side by side with Hyde, Ormond, Nicholas and Southampton. In this, and in other branches of the administration, the fact that the royalist nobles had long been debarred from the management of affairs, while the ex-rebels were frequently experienced officials, gave the latter a weight out of proportion to their comparative numbers. As a preliminary to the legislative settlement of the kingdom, it was necessary first to confirm the authority of the convention itself, which, since it had not been summoned by the king's writ, was not legally a parliament, an act for removing all questions and disputes on this point received the king's assent on June the 11th, 1660, and all the chief measures of the convention were subsequently confirmed by an act of the next parliament, which became law on July the 8th, 1661. The principle on which the convention proceeded in making the settlement of 1660 was the illegality of all the de facto governments which had existed since 1642 and the invalidity of all their acts. One exception only was made. 
on August the 29th, an act for the confirmation of judicial proceedings since May the 1st, 1642, received the king's assent. But all the acts and ordinances of the long parliament and its successors were swept away, none of them having received the assent of Charles I or his son. It was necessary, however, to reenact some few of these measures without delay. Hence, an act was passed for the confirmation of the civil marriages which had taken place under the provisions of the measure passed by the Little Parliament of 1653. To conciliate the commercial classes, the Navigation Act of 1651 was re-enacted with but slight modification. To conciliate the country gentry, the abolition of wardship and other feudal incidents, completed by Cromwell's Second Parliament in 1656, was maintained by the passing of an Act which abolished the Court of Wards, tenures in capite, and by night service and purveyance. The king was compensated for the loss of revenue by moiety of the excise on beer and other liquors. A question which, for political reasons, was much more pressing was the confirmation of the amnesty promised in the Declaration of Breda. The Indemnity Bill led to a conflict between the two houses, in which the Lords urged more severity than the Commons were willing to permit, while Charles and Hyde intervened in favour of lenity. "'Let it be in no man's power,' said the King, "'to charge me or you with a breach of our word or promise, which can never be a good ingredient to our future security.' In the end, punishment fell almost exclusively upon the regicides. Thirteen suffered capitally, ten in 1660, and three who were subsequently captured in Holland in 1662, while about twenty-five were imprisoned for life. Three politicians deeply compromised in the later troubles, though not guilty of the king's death, were also accepted. Hambert and Hesselridge, being imprisoned for life, while Sir Henry Vane was tried and executed for high treason in June 1662. He is too dangerous a man to let live if we can honestly put him out of the way, wrote Charles to Clarendon. For other persons, the amnesty was complete and comprehensive, securing those who had fought against the Crown from judicial proceedings of any kind, though they were liable to be arrested and imprisoned whenever the government suspected the existence of a plot. Far more difficult to settle, though it provoked less public dispute, was the question of the land settlement. A bill for the satisfaction of purchasers of public lands failed to pass. The crown lands and the jointure of the Queen Mother were restored by general vote. Newcastle, Buckingham, and a few favoured noblemen were restored by special acts to the possession of all they had held before the wars began. The lands of other noblemen and gentlemen, whose estates had been confiscated and sold by the successive governments of the revolutionary period, reverted to their original owners, on the ground that sales by an unlawful authority could give no valid title. The restitution of the lands of the church, estimated to be worth £2,400,000, met with more delay. A commission was appointed to mediate between the purchasers and the rightful owners, but no agreement was arrived at. In this case, as in other cases in which lands had been sold by the state, the purchasers received no compensation for their outlay, though some became leaseholders, on more or less advantageous terms. Thus, a sweeping transference of landed property took place throughout England, and those who had invested their money in public lands became permanently alienated from the new government. While the sales made by the state were thus nullified, private contracts were rigidly maintained. But since the late governments had usually punished political delinquents by fines, which often obliged them to sell parts of their estates to find the money, a large amount of land had changed hands in consequence of the war, 
and many royalist families were permanently impoverished. The royalists would have had these sales also annulled, but failed to effect this, and since they received no compensation for their losses, they too were alienated from the government. Moreover, the permanent feud between the royalists, who had sold their lands, and the roundheads, who had bought them, embittered English politics for the next generation, and underlay the later animosities of Whig and Tory. Statesmanship might have done something to mitigate the hardships which this rough settlement of the land question caused, but, with the rudimentary machinery of public credit which then existed, any large measure of compensation for the sufferers was impossible. Moreover, England was on the brink of national bankruptcy. At the moment, all the resources of the state were strained in order to pay off the army and navy. Besides the fleet, there were in England and Scotland about 35,000 troops to be disbanded, and both soldiers and sailors had been promised their arrears in full. Parliament voted about £850,000 for the purpose, of which £210,000 was raised by a poll tax and the rest by monthly assessments. By February 1661 the work was completed. Simultaneously, the general question of the revenue was taken in hand. On September the 4th, 1660, the House of Commons pledged itself to make up the income of the government to the sum of £1,200,000 a year, but the various sources of revenue allocated for this purpose failed to produce their estimated yield, and in 1661 it became necessary to increase the excise and to impose the hearth tax, March 1662, to make up the deficit. Even so, the shrinkage in the revenue continued, and from the commencement of the reign, the government of Charles II had to struggle with pecuniary difficulties which were not of its own making. Burnett's story that Clarendon might have obtained a larger revenue for the king if he had asked for it, but that he preferred to keep Charles dependent upon Parliament is a mere fiction. The religious difficulty proved as hard to solve as the financial. At the moment when the king returned, the probable solution seemed to be some kind of a union between moderate Presbyterians and Episcopalians. The king's declaration had held out the prospect of liberty to tender consciences and promised that no man should be disquieted or called in question for differences of opinion in matters of religion, which did not disturb the peace of the kingdom. Since the king's assent was secure beforehand, nothing remained but to draw up an act of parliament for the full granting of that indulgence. All that the convention could achieve was, however, the passing of an act for the restoration of ejected ministers to their livings and for the confirmation of the present holders of livings in cases where the rightful incumbent was dead. A bill for the settlement of the true Protestant religion was read twice, but dropped in committee, and the matter was then referred to the king and such divines as he should select. The king then put forward a scheme of comprehension which he embodied in a declaration published on October the 25th, 1660. Its basis was limited episcopacy, bishops were to be assisted and advised in the exercise of their spiritual jurisdiction by elected presbyters. The liturgy was to be revised by a committee of divines of both parties selected by the king. Questions of ritual were to be determined by a future synod, and in the meantime certain ceremonial requirements were to be relaxed in the interest of scrupulous consciences. The Presbyterians were full of hope. Reynolds accepted a bishopric, and Baxter thought of accepting one. The scheme, said Baxter, though not such as we desired, was such as any honest sober minister might submit to. But when Sir Matthew Hale introduced a bill for converting the declaration into law, it was rejected on the second reading by 183 to 157 votes. 
November the 20th, 1660. Since courtiers and officials both voted with the nose, it seems clear that the government did not really desire the bill to pass. Charles had ceased to take much interest in the scheme for comprehension since the opposition of the Presbyterian ministers had obliged him to omit a provision in favour of toleration. Hyde had determined that the restoration of the monarchy should be accompanied by the restoration of episcopacy in its integrity, and that the church should be put in the position which it was held before the revolution. Thus the Anglican opposition had free play. On December 29, 1660, the Convention Parliament was dissolved, and the work it left unfinished devolved on its successor. In the interim, a conference took place in the Savoy between the twelve bishops and twelve Presbyterian divines, with eighteen assistants of lower rank. Baxter produced a brand new liturgy, and his colleagues a paper of objections to that already in existence. The bishops gave in a list of fourteen minor concessions which they were prepared to make, and for the rest stood rigidly on the defensive. They said that they had nothing to do till their opponents had proved there was a necessity for alteration, which they had not yet done. Then followed a discussion, or rather a disputation, in which Baxter and Gunning were the protagonists. Baxter and he, says Burnett, spent some days in much logical arguing to the diversion of the town, who thought here were a couple of fences engaged in a thread of disputes that could never be brought to an end, nor have any good effect. So it proved, and at the close of the conference the commissioners reported that the church's welfare, unity and peace, and his majesty's satisfaction were ends on which they all agreed but as to the means, they could not come to an harmony. Before the Savoy Conference had ended, the new Parliament, which met on May the 8th, 1661, was at work. Few but thoroughgoing Royalists and Anglicans had found seats there, and its ardour for crown and church was difficult for the government to control. In its temper, it resembled the French Chambre Introuvable of 1815, which was the product of a similar reaction, and had to deal with like problems. But while the French chamber lasted for but one year, the English Parliament sat till January 1679, and left a more lasting trace on the history of its country. In secular matters, its views, for some years, were in harmony with those of the government. Clarendon held that the late rebellion could never be extirpated, and pulled up by the roots, till the king's regal and inherent power should be fully avowed and vindicated, until the usurpations in both houses of parliament since the year 1640 were disclaimed and made odious. The first step which parliament took to effect this was the passing of an act for the preservation of the king's person, in which it was affirmed that neither one house nor both together had any legislative power without the king. A second act declared that the sole command of the militia and of all forces by sea and land belonged to the king, and that neither house had any claim to it, nor could lawfully levy war against his majesty. A third provided that no petition should be presented to the king by more than ten persons, and none which sought for the alteration of things established by law in church or state, should be circulated for signature, unless it had been previously approved by the magistrates. These measures were followed in December 1661 by the Corporation Act, which provided for purging the government bodies in all corporate towns by the imposition of a double test. A declaration that the covenant was an unlawful oath excluded the nonconformists while another, that it was not lawful under any pretext to bear arms against the king, shut out all political opponents of the government. Next came a press act, May the 19th, 1662, establishing a rigid censorship, 
requiring a license for all new books, restricting the importation of printed matter from abroad, and reducing the number both of presses and printers. The reconstruction of the Constitution was completed two years later by the repeal of the Triennial Act, April 5, 1664. Charles boldly told the two houses that he would never suffer a Parliament to come together by the means prescribed in that bill, and the Commons obeyed, though not without some resistance. There are many in the House displeased at it, though they dare not say much, noted Pepys. A clause was added to the bill, stipulating that thereafter the holding of Parliaments should not be intermitted above three years at the most, and this compromise disarmed the nascent opposition. Politically, the House of Lords was still more reactionary than the Commons. If the majority could have had their will, they would have repealed not only the Triennial Act, but all the Acts passed in the first two sessions of the Long Parliament, and a committee reported in favour of the revival of the Star Chamber. The same uncompromising spirit was shown in the ecclesiastical legislation of these three years, 1661 to 1664. The act by which the Long Parliament had disabled all persons in holy orders from exercising any temporal jurisdiction or authority was promptly repealed, and, on November the 20th, 1661, the bishops once more reappeared in the upper house. A second act restored the disciplinary jurisdiction of the ecclesiastical courts, which the Long Parliament had abolished, and enabled them once more to punish blasphemies or excommunicate nonconformists for non-payment of tithes. In their zeal, the Commons, without waiting for the Savoy Conference to end, took in hand the amendment of the prayer book, and read three times a bill for imposing it. Then the government intervened, and by the king's orders, convocation undertook the revision of the prayer book, which it completed in December 1661. Some 600 alterations were made, tending for the most part to make the liturgy less palatable to Puritans, rather than to meet any of their objections. In addition, which testified to the neglect of the church ordinances during the Troubles, was that of a form of baptism, for such as are of riper years, while the memory of civil discord was made more lasting by the insertion of services to be used on January the 30th and May the 29th. During the spring of 1662, the revised prayer book was approved by the two houses, and on May the 19th, the Act of Uniformity was passed which imposed on clergymen of every rank, on all fellows of colleges and university officials, on all tutors and schoolmasters, a declaration of their unfeigned assent and consent to all that the prayer book contained. All were also obliged to take the non-resistance oath and the renunciation of the covenant imposed in the Corporation Act. Those who did not comply with these conditions by St. Bartholomew's Day, next were to vacate their livings. When that date came, August the 24th, 1662, about 1,100 or 1,200 refused to conform, and since it is probable that about 800 more had been deprived during the two years which had elapsed since the king's return, the total number of nonconformists ejected must have been about 2,000. The Lords had wished to allow one-fifth of the income of a living to the ejected minister. The Commons rejected this provision. Hence, as Baxter says, hundreds of able ministers with their wives and children had neither house nor bread. Since they were allowed neither to preach nor to teach, while the severity of the censorship made it difficult for them to earn their bread by writing, Many were driven to maintain themselves by handicrafts or husbandry. Others became dependent on the charity of their late congregations. The Act of Uniformity marked the close of a period in the history of the Church of England. 
the policy of comprehension was permanently defeated, and the half-hearted attempt to revive it after the revolution only emphasised the final character of the decision made in 1662. For the best part of a century, the Puritan party had striven to alter the government, the doctrine and the ceremonial of the church while remaining within it. Henceforth, it was outside the church that Puritanism must seek to realise its ideals. For the next generation, the question at issue was whether Puritanism, or rather nonconformity as it had now come to be called, should be allowed to exist and to develop itself in freedom, or whether it should be suppressed by penal laws as Catholicism had been. The king was pledged to a policy of toleration. During his exile, he had promised the Pope and the Catholic princes of Europe to repeal the penal laws. By the Declaration of Breda, he had promised toleration to the Protestant nonconformists. The king was honourably anxious to keep his pledges. He owed much to the Presbyterians for the share they had taken in his restoration, and still more to the English Catholics for their devoted loyalty during the war. But both Protestant nonconformity and Catholicism were politically discredited. Catholicism by the Irish rebellion, nonconformity by the English. Independency in all its forms was still more odious, and to talk of conscience had come to be regarded as an excuse for sedition. Public opinion looked back on the late times as a period when, in Dryden's words, quote, Sanhedrin and priest enslaved the nation and justified their spoils by inspiration. End quote. Both hot Levites and dreaming saints were equally distrusted, and Venner's rising in January 1661 supplied a pretext for confounding independence in general with fifth monarchy men and Anabaptists. End of section 11. Section 12 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 5, The Age of Louis the Fourteenth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Adrian Stevens. Chapter 5, The Stuart Restoration by C. H. Firth, Part 2. Whilst the feeling of the nation was hostile to all who stood outside the pale of the National Church, Protestant nonconformists in general regarded Catholics with hatred and suspicion, and Presbyterians felt a similar aversion from the extreme sects of Protestant nonconformists. A period of common suffering was necessary in order to produce mutual tolerance. When the King's declaration of October the 25th 1660, was under discussion, it was proposed to add to it, on the petition of the Independents and Anabaptists, a proviso authorising those sects and others to meet together for public worship, so long as they did not disturb the public peace. Baxter protested against toleration. As to Papists, all that was wanted was the enforcement of the laws against them, as to sectaries, he said, quote, We distinguish the tolerable parties from the intolerable. End quote. In consequence of this, the clause was dropped. Presbyterians adhered too strongly to the idea of a national church to throw in their lot with those who demanded religious freedom. A similar failure followed the attempt of the Catholics to obtain toleration for themselves. Upon their petition, the House of Lords on June the 10th, 1661, appointed a committee to take the penal laws into consideration and ordered a bill for the relaxation of those laws to be prepared. But the bill was never introduced, and the restoration of the bishops to their seats in the Lords made its prospects hopeless. For Catholics, as for Protestant nonconformists, the only hope lay in the constancy of the King. On March the 17th, 1662, 
when the Act of Uniformity was under discussion, Clarendon presented on the King's behalf a proviso allowing Charles, if he thought fit, to exempt from deprivation ministers whose sole objection was to the wearing of the surplice and the use of the cross in baptism. But while the Lords accepted this proviso, the Commons rejected it, April 22, 1662. After the passing of the Act, the King made a renewed attempt. On the petition of the Nonconformists, which was backed by Albemarle and Manchester, he promised to suspend the execution of the Act for three months. But this plan was frustrated by the opposition of Clarendon and Archbishop Sheldon. These schemes would have relieved Protestant Nonconformists only and done nothing for the Catholics. Under the influence of Bennett, who became Secretary of State in October 1662, and of the Earl of Bristol, who assumed the leadership of the English Catholics, Charles issued on December 26, 1662, a declaration announcing his intention of exempting from the penalties of the Act of Uniformity peaceable persons whose conscientious scruples prevented them from conforming. Parliament was invited to pass an Act which would enable him to exercise, with a more universal satisfaction, his inherent dispensing power. I am, in my nature, Charles told Parliament when it next met, an enemy to all severity for religion and conscience, how mistaken soe'er it be when it extends to capital and sanguinary punishments. Lord Robarts brought in an act concerning His Majesty's power in ecclesiastical affairs, which would enable the King, by the issue of letters patent, to grant dispensations from the Act of Uniformity and from other laws requiring oaths and subscriptions of the same kind, February 23, 1663. It was read twice in the House of Lords, but met with great opposition. While Lord Ashley spoke strongly in its favour, Clarendon was vehement against it. The Lords limited the operation of the bill to Protestant nonconformists. The Commons protested against it, declaring that it would establish schism by law. Both houses together presented a petition for the enforcement of the laws against the Catholics, and the bill was subsequently dropped. Charles was, in Clarendon's phrase, infinitely troubled by this defeat. His feeling in favour of toleration was sincere, if not very deep, and it is significant that the passage of the Act of Uniformity was accompanied by a proclamation for the release of imprisoned Quakers, August 22, 1662. In the colonies he could carry his intentions into effect. The charters of Rhode Island and Carolina, the instructions to the governors of Jamaica and Virginia, attest the king's tolerant policy. But at home, the sons of Levi were too strong for him. After this, according to Clarendon, Charles never treated any of the bishops with the respect he had formerly showed them, and often spoke of them slightingly. For the same reason, the king was angry with Clarendon himself. The chancellor had been in favour of comprehension in a general way, and had at first sought to conciliate the Presbyterians. But when he found the slight concessions he thought sufficient, ineffectual, he declared it useless to concede anything. Their faction, said he, is their religion. In the same way, Clarendon would have been glad if the act of uniformity had been less rigorous, but when it was passed, he thought that it ought to be obeyed without any connivance, and he was still more opposed to a systematic plan of toleration based upon the dispensing power. In spite of his protests, he was credited with inspiring the opposition to the bill, and its promoters, who were also his rivals, made the most of the charge with the king. Clarendon's power seemed shaken. The Earl of Bristol seized the opportunity to bring forward a charge of high treason against him, July 10th, 1663, but the accusation was ill-managed, and the articles extravagant and ill-supported. Among other things, Bristol alleged that Clarendon had said that the king was popishly inclined, and that he intended to legitimate the Duke of Monmouth. 
suggestions, which it was so undesirable to put into circulation, that Charles declared the charge a libel against himself and his government. Bristol was ruined instead of Clarendon. From this time forward, Clarendon's favour with the king sensibly diminished, but his retention of power depended now more on Parliament than the king. Parliament, and in it the House of Commons, was more and more the dominant factor in determining the policy of the state. In 1660, the nation had surrendered itself unconditionally to the king, quote, We submit and oblige ourselves and our posterities to your majesty for ever, end quote, said the commons, but in reality the last twenty years had but strengthened the resolution of England to control its own fate. Foreign observers who visited England after the Restoration noted with wonder the keen interest which all classes of the people took in public affairs. In this country, reported the French ambassadors in 1665, every man thinks he has a right to talk about matters of state. Even the watermen, as they rode the lords to Westminster, would try to get them to speak about the political questions of the day. What happened at court was the continual subject of debate in the city. As they are naturally lazy, says another traveller, and spend half their time taking tobacco, they are all the while exercising their talents about the government, talking of new customs, of the chimney tax, the management of the public finances, and the lessening of trade. All this activity of public opinion outside stimulated Parliament to assert itself. Let the king come in, said Harrington in 1660, and let him call a parliament of the greatest cavaliers in England, so they be men of estates, and let them sit but seven years, and they will all turn commonwealthsmen. The prediction was not yet fulfilled, but there were signs that it was on its way to fulfilment. Inevitably, something of the spirit which animated the long parliament of Charles I passed into the long parliament of Charles II. During the civil troubles, first one branch of government, then another, had fallen under the control of the House of Commons. It had assumed not only the legislative power, but the direct control of the executive. All the different functions of administration had been taken charge of by its committees. All the highest questions of policy had been subjected to its decision. Men might change, and principles might change, but such an experience could not be forgotten, and the increasing independence and growing claims of the House of Commons testified its consciousness of its past. King and minister were alike obliged in the long run to yield to its pressure. What Charles wished to do became a minor question. The King of France, wrote Cortin to Lyon in 1665, can make his subjects march as he pleases, but the King of England must march with his people. What Clarendon thought best for the King's service was more and more liable to be overruled, and he was obliged to conform himself, though not without a struggle, to the views of Parliament. Accordingly, Parliament proceeded to complete its ecclesiastical settlement by a series of measures for the complete suppression of nonconformity. An act specially directed against the Quakers had been passed in May 1662. If five or more of them met for worship, they were to be fined five pounds each or three months' imprisonment for the first offence, ten pounds or six months for a second, and to be banished to the plantations on a third conviction. In 1664, this act was strengthened and extended to Presbyterians and Independents in general, under the pretext that their assemblies were the seed plots and nurseries of seditious opinions. A conventicle was defined as a meeting of more than five persons over and above the members of a household. Conviction was facilitated and offenders who could not pay the cost of their own transportation to the colonies were to serve five years as indentured labourers. Transported convicts who escaped or returned to England 
before the expiration of their sentence, were to suffer death as felons. A year later came the Five Mile Act, which aggravated the lot of ejected nonconformist ministers by prohibiting them from residing within five miles of any corporate town or teaching in any public or private school unless they had taken a test. The test consisted of the non-resistance oath imposed by the Corporation Act, with the additional pledge not to endeavour at any time any alteration of government either in church or state. This closed the series of measures which some historians have dubbed the Clarendon Code. Clarendon approved of the Conventicle Act. His attitude with regard to the Five Mile Act is uncertain. The King's compliance was due to his pecuniary necessities. The growing power of Parliament was not only shown by the fact that it forced its ecclesiastical policy upon the King, it influenced both the relations of England to the rest of the British Isles and still more its relation to Europe. The settlement of Scotland and Ireland had proceeded pari passu with that of England. In both kingdoms, the restoration of the old constitution in 1660 entailed the restoration of their separate parliaments and the undoing of the legislative union which Cromwell had effected. Equality of commercial privileges perished with the Cromwellian Union or survived it only for a short time. The Navigation Act of 1660 excluded Scotland from the benefits of the colonial trade, though it included Ireland. The Act for the Encouragement of English Trade, passed in 1663, imposed a heavy tax on the importation of Scottish cattle and sheep. Scottish corn was practically excluded, Scottish salt ere long heavily burdened. Clarendon hints that the king might have done well to maintain the union with Scotland, but that he would not build according to Cromwell's models. In Ireland, Charles had to do this, whether he would or not. The Cromwellian settlement rested on a solid legal basis, since the last acts which Charles I had given his assent before the civil war began were a series of measures confiscating the lands of the Irish rebels in order to pay the cost of reducing that country. The new colonists were in possession, all the machinery of government was in their hands, and English public opinion was unanimous in their support. Despite the king's obligations to the Irish Catholics, Despite his pity for the miserable condition of the Irish nation, all he could do was to restore a few favoured individuals to their estates and induce the soldiers and the adventurers to submit to a slight reduction of their share of the land for the benefit of the dispossessed. On the other hand, the commercial jealousy which found expression in the restrictions placed by England upon Scottish trade was still more strongly felt with regard to Irish. In 1663, Irish shipping was entirely excluded from the colonial trade. In 1666, the importation of Irish cattle, sheep and swine, alive or dead, was totally prohibited. The latter act led to a long struggle between the country gentlemen who backed it and the government. The king yielded under compulsion. The House of Lords resisted stubbornly and became involved in a heated controversy with the Commons. Clarendon sacrificed the last shreds of his popularity with the Country Party in his endeavour to maintain the prosperity of Ireland and the rights of the Upper House and the King against the encroachments of the Commons. But the Lower House would hear of no compromise, as, in the case of the ecclesiastical statutes, so in that of economic statutes, they refused to leave any loophole for the exercise of the king's dispensing power and carried the day. The House of Commons, commented Clarendon, seemed much more morose and obstinate than it had formerly appeared to be, and solicitous to grasp as much power and authority as any of their predecessors had done. 
English foreign policy during the period between the Restoration and the close of 1664 developed upon similar lines. That is, its control passed by degrees from the hands of the king and his ministers into the hands of the parliament. Clarendon's policy, as stated by himself, was straightforward and intelligible. He laboured nothing more than that his majesty might enter into a firm peace with all his neighbours, as most necessary for reducing his own dominions into that temper of subjection and obedience as they ought to be in. At first sight, it seemed easy to attain this modest aim. The fact that the king was restored without the interposition of any foreign power appeared to leave him free to follow what policy he pleased. It is true that Charles was personally pledged by his treaty with Spain in April 1656 that when he recovered his throne he would abandon Jamaica and other possessions in the West Indies acquired since 1630 and would assist Philip IV to regain Portugal. But it might be argued that the king's restoration without Spanish aid freed him from these stipulations. England was still nominally at war with Spain when the king returned, but a formal cessation of hostilities was proclaimed on September 10, 1660. But Charles turned a deaf ear to the Spanish demands for the restoration of Jamaica and Dunkirk. Parliament was firm on that point, and a bill for annexing both places in perpetuity to the Crown of England passed the House of Commons on September the 11th, 1660. Their retention rendered an agreement with Spain impossible. The old treaty of November 15th, 1630 was republished, but hostilities in the West Indies still continued, and in October 1662, an expedition from Jamaica took and destroyed Santiago de Cuba. A new treaty of peace and commerce was not signed till May 1667, and the American quarrels were not settled till July 1670. During the same period, Charles, instead of assisting Spain to recover Portugal, adopted exactly the opposite policy. England had, from the first, favoured Portuguese independence. In 1642, Charles I signed a treaty with Portugal, securing great privileges for English merchants, which were further increased by Cromwell's treaty with Portugal in 1654. Blake's fleet helped to preserve Portugal from the navy of Spain, and Cromwell's diplomacy labelled to compose her quarrel with Holland. On the very eve of the Restoration, in April 1660, the English Council of State signed a treaty permitting Portugal to levy 12,000 men in England. It was natural, therefore, that Portugal, abandoned by Louis XIV at the Treaty of the Pyrenees, should turn to Charles II for aid as soon as he was restored to his throne. In the summer of 1660, Francisco de Mello, the Portuguese ambassador, proposed a match between Charles and the Infanta Catherine, daughter of John IV, and sister of the reigning king Alfonso VI. As an inducement, he offered the cession of Tangier and Bombay, commercial privileges and complete liberty of conscience for English merchants, and a dowry of two million crusados. The Cromwellian statesmen in the king's council, Albemarle and Sandwich, were strongly in favour of the proposed alliance. Ormond and Hyde, the heads of the Cavalier section, approved it. Bristol, the leader of the Catholic party, worked hard with the aid of the Spanish ambassador to prevent its acceptance. The treaty was signed on June 23, 1661. The marriage followed on May 21, 1662. England became pledged to assist Portugal with 2,000 foot, 1,000 horse and 10 ships of war until her independence was attained. Old soldiers were not difficult to find at the moment. The removal of the Cromwellian garrisons in Scotland, which took place about the end of 1661, supplied an organised body of infantry, whilst Irish Catholics who had served the King in Flanders helped to furnish the cavalry. 
both did good service. In the battles of Amagial, June the 8th, 1663, and Montes Claros, June 17th, 1665, the English contingent bore a large part in winning the victory. English diplomacy, too, represented by Fanshawe, Southall, and Sandwich, worked indefatigably on behalf of Portugal until the Treaty of February the 13th, 1668, secured its independence. By retaining Cromwell's conquests from Spain and by assisting Portugal, Charles returned to Cromwell's foreign policy, though he succeeded in avoiding open war with Spain. At the same time, he naturally drew nearer to France. At first, he had testified his resentment of Mazarin's close alliance with the usurper by ordering Bordeaux, the ambassador, who had been the instrument of the cardinal in effecting it, to leave England. But this feeling did not prevent the re-establishment of good relations between the two powers. Queen Henrietta Maria, who exerted all her influence to restore them, proposed a match between Charles and Hortense Mancini, Mazarin's niece, to whom the cardinal promised to give a dowry of four million livres. Charles refused the match as beneath his dignity, but the queen succeeded in negotiating a marriage between Princess Henrietta and Louis XIV's brother, the Duke of Orléans. It took place on March the 31st, 1661, and the Duchess of Orléans became ere long the channel for all confidential communications between Charles and Louis. The marriage of Charles with Catherine of Braganza formed a second link with France. Debarred from assisting Portugal openly, Louis was anxious to prevent her reconquest by Spain in order to keep that power weak. Hence, when Charles hesitated, Louis pressed the match and promised to contribute 800,000 crowns towards the expense of defending Portugal, besides permitting a certain number of French officers and soldiers to take service under the Portuguese standards. The sale of Dunkirk to France constituted a third link. It was an expensive possession, for it required a garrison of nearly 4,000 men and cost about £100,000 a year. The harbour was poor, which made it of little value as a naval station, and with the abandonment of Cromwell's plan for a great European League, for the support of Protestantism, its military value was greatly diminished. For strategic reasons, Albemarle and Sandwich urged its sale. Tangier, they said, would be far more valuable as a naval base, and it was impossible to hold both places. For financial reasons, Southampton, the Lord Treasurer, took the same line, and Clarendon both approved the plan and managed the bargain. The two possible purchasers were France and Spain, and the former was at once the better paymaster and the more desirable ally. After much haggling between Clarendon and Detrade, the price was finally fixed at 2,500,000 livres, and the transfer took place on October the 27th, 1662. It seemed, at the close of 1662, as if Charles had definitely resolved to range himself on the side of France in her struggle with the Spanish monarchy, and, as if as close an alliance between Charles and Louis was about to be formed as that which Cromwell had made with Mazarin. But the difference was that religious interest had no part in determining the policy of Charles, nor was his inclination towards France connected with any definite scheme of European policy. His policy was mainly dictated by commercial considerations, and he looked outside Europe. Upon the king's first arrival in England, says Clarendon, he manifested a very great desire to improve the general traffic and trade of the nation, and upon all occasions conferred with the most active merchants upon it, and offered all that he could contribute to the advancement thereof. He began by erecting a Council of Trade, November the 7th, 1660, and by its side a Council for Foreign Plantations, December the 1st, 1660. 
the alliance with Portugal was dictated by commercial consideration, and it was popular because the Portuguese was the most beneficialist trade that ever this nation was engaged in. Bombay was to be the centre of a lucrative traffic with India, while the possession of Tangier was not only to secure for England the trade of northern Africa, but to enable it to give the law to all the trade of the Mediterranean. When Burnett visited England in 1663, Tangier was talked of at a mighty rate as the foundation of a new empire. It was by holding out the prospect of easy conquests in Africa and the Indies and of enormous mercantile profits that Détrade, on behalf of Louis XIV, encouraged Charles to accept the offers of Portugal. The materialism of the king's policy exactly fitted the temper of his people, but any attempt to obtain for England a larger share of the commerce of the world was certain to produce a conflict with the present holders of commercial dominion, the Dutch. Other causes of conflict between England and Holland were not lacking. Charles II had a personal grievance against the Dutch government. He was anxious for the restoration of his nephew, the Prince of Orange, to be the political and military functions from which he had been debarred by the Act of Exclusion in 1654, and the position was further complicated by a dispute about the guardianship of William, who was but ten years old in 1660. At The Hague, before he returned to England, Charles urgently recommended the interests of his sister and her son to the States-General. After his return, he became still more pressing. The Dutch government revoked the Act of Exclusion, September 25, 1660, and the States of Holland took the care of the Prince's education into their own hands. The death of the Princess Mary on December 24, 1660, reopened the question. Charles, at her request, assumed the guardianship of the prince, which he shared by agreement with another uncle, the Elector of Brandenburg. They entrusted William to the control of his grandmother, Amalia, Princess Dowager of Orange, ousting the representatives of Holland from their charge. Portuguese affairs added to the friction. For nearly twenty years, the Dutch and Portuguese had been fighting over their possessions in South America and the East Indies. Cromwell had sought to mediate between the two states, and Charles pledged himself by a secret article in his marriage treaty to follow Cromwell's example. Downing, the very diplomatist Cromwell had employed, was dispatched again to The Hague to continue the mediation. On August 6, 1661, a treaty was signed by which the Portuguese retained Brazil and the Dutch Ceylon, but its ratification was retarded till December 1662, owing to disputes about the comparative privileges of Dutch and English commerce in the Portuguese possessions. These quarrels retarded the treaty between England and the United Provinces, which had been set on foot in 1661 and was not concluded till September 1662. It settled the long disputes about freedom of fishing and the salute of the British flag, but it left two outstanding questions undetermined. One was the question of the compensation claimed by the owners of two English ships taken by the Dutch in 1643. The other was the question of the restoration of Pularoon, one of the Spice Islands. The Dutch had expelled the English from it about 1620, and the verdict of the arbiters appointed under the Treaty of April 5, 1654, had adjudged it to England. The new treaty promised that the long-delayed transfer should be effected, but when one of the ships of the English East India Company arrived with authority to take possession, the Dutch governor refused to give it up. Besides this breach of faith, there were fresh complaints of the capture of English ships in the East Indies and a forcible obstruction of English traders in West Africa. Reprisals inevitably followed. Shortly after the Restoration, Charles had granted letters patent for the formation of the Royal African Company, December 18, 1660, 
to which he subsequently granted a charter, June the 10th, 1663. The Duke of York was the special patron of the company and one of its founders. At his instigation in October 1663, Robert Holmes, with a small squadron, was sent to the African coast to protect the trade of the company against the Dutch, which he effected by capturing most of the Dutch stations there. England had also shadowy claims on the territories occupied by the Dutch West India Company in America. On March the 12th, 1664, Charles granted to his brother James a patent for Long Island and the whole country between the Connecticut and Delaware rivers. In May, a small expedition under Colonel Nichols set sail from Portsmouth to put the Duke in possession. Throughout 1664, the war feeling in England grew stronger and stronger. In April, the Turkey Company and the East India Company presented complaints to Parliament, claiming that damages to the amount of £714,000 had been inflicted upon them by the Dutch, and the two houses petitioned the King to take effectual measures to obtain redress. In October and the following months, de Reuter captured the English possessions on the Gold Coast. In December, an English squadron under Allen attacked the Dutch Smyrna fleet. War was declared on March the 14th, 1665. Charles II was pushed into war by his people and by his brother. Quote, I never saw so great an appetite to war as is in both this town and country, especially in the Parliament men. End quote. He wrote to the Duchess of Orléans on June the 2nd, 1664. Quote, I find myself almost the only man in my kingdom who doth not desire war. End quote. He added three months later. Clarendon, too, was notoriously opposed to war, but like his master, he was obliged to follow the current. When the English government saw that war was inevitable, it began to look round for allies. Fanshawe was sent to Madrid and Southall to Lisbon to negotiate a truce between Spain and Portugal, and if possible, an offensive and defensive league with Spain. Sir Gilbert Talbot was sent to Denmark and Henry Coventry to Sweden to secure the aid of those powers against the Dutch. Lord Carlingforth went to Vienna to propose to the Emperor, Leopold, a league between England and the House of Habsburg. Sir Walter Vane was dispatched to Berlin to gain the support of the Elector of Brandenburg. But the only ally England could obtain was the Bishop of Munster, who offered his services in return for a subsidy, made a treaty with Charles II on June 13, 1665, and invaded Holland two months later. All this diplomatic activity was frustrated by the attitude of Louis XIV. On April the 27th, 1662, he had signed an alliance with Holland by which he was pledged, if Holland were attacked, to aid the Dutch with 12,000 men and to declare war against its assailant within four months. Charles was badly served by Lord Hollis, his ambassador at Paris, and neither realised the precise nature of the engagements of Louis to the Dutch, nor the political motives which swayed the French king. Through his sister, he endeavoured in vain to procure the support of the French king, or at least his neutrality, and argued that since the Dutch were, in reality, the aggressors, Louis was not bound to help them. It was all in vain. Louis had no love for the Dutch, but in view of his designs against the Spanish Netherlands, their future neutrality was necessary to him. Nor was he disposed to overthrow their maritime and commercial power for the benefit of England. When the war broke out, he sent two extraordinary ambassadors to England in April 1665 to endeavour to mediate and sought through his diplomacy to prevent other powers from taking part in the war. The death of Philip IV of Spain, September the 7th, 1665, somewhat altered the situation, since an agreement between England and Holland might hinder the designs of Louis on the Netherlands and its prolongation might facilitate their execution. Accordingly, he sent an auxiliary force to the aid of the Dutch, which drove the Munster forces out of Holland, 
and declared war against England on January the 26th, 1666. The result was decisive. The King of Denmark, guaranteed by France against any danger from Sweden, allied himself with the Dutch on February the 11th, 1666. The Elector of Brandenburg on February the 16th, 1666, made a treaty with the Dutch, promising to aid them with 12,000 men. England's only ally, the Bishop of Munster, threatened alike by France and Brandenburg, made his peace with the Dutch on April the 18th. Sweden, which had been on the point of forming a league with England, declared itself neutral on July the 17th and offered its mediation in the quarrel. Finally, on October the 25th, 1666, Holland, Denmark, Brandenburg and the Dukes of brunswick Lüneburg formed what was known as the Quadrangle Alliance for Mutual Defence. The diplomatic defeat of England was complete. End of section 12《セクション13》of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 5, The Age of Louis the Fourteenth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Adrian Stevens. Chapter 5: The Stuart Restoration by C. H. Firth, Part 3. At sea. During the same period, in spite of some reverses, England had more than held its own. The details of the naval war are related elsewhere. Southwold Bay, June the 3rd, 1665, was a great victory, and the repulse at Bergen, August the 16th, 1665, had been compensated by the capture of many Dutch ships during the next few months. The Battle of June the 1st to the 4th, 1666, was a defeat, but it was avenged by the victory of July 25th and by the burning of the Dutch merchantmen in the Vlie on August the 8th. In the West Indies, Jamaica and Barbados were two strongholds from which English expeditions sallied forth against the Dutch or the French. Privateers from Jamaica captured St. Eustatia Santa Saba and Tobago in 1665. In 1666, fortune turned the other way. Antigua, Montserrat and the English half of St. Christopher's fell into the hands of the French and Suriname was captured by the Dutch. On the other hand, the internal condition of England at the close of 1666 was extremely unfavourable. The strain of the war had been aggravated by two extraordinary calamities. The plague, which raged in London during the summer and autumn of 1665, swept away nearly 70,000 persons out of a population of rather less than half a million. It was still raging in the eastern and southeastern counties during the first half of 1666, and in Colchester alone, between 4,000 and 5,000 persons perished from it. In September 1666 came the Great Fire of London, which is said to have destroyed 13,200 houses and reduced two-thirds of the capital to smouldering ruins. Throughout England there was widespread discontent, with complaints of heavy taxes and of abuses. The nation said an anonymous letter addressed to Charles himself, are ready with every puff of wind to rise up in arms because of the oppression that is laid upon them. There were rumours of conspiracies for the restoration of the Republic. Ludlow, Algernon Sidney and other exiled Republicans were summoned to Amsterdam. It was said that the Dutch government intended to relieve the good people and that Dutch statesmen had at last come to see that their government could not long subsist if monarchy continued in England. De Witt suggested that Louis the Fourteenth should seize a convenient port in Ireland and call on that people to shake off the English yoke. 
In Scotland, there was still greater danger. The war with Holland had closed the only remaining market for Scotch merchandise, and in the western shires, exasperated by religious persecution, a general rising would certainly have followed any landing of the Dutch troops. The Pentland rising showed the temper of the Whigs, and its suppression at Rullion Green on November the 27th, 1666, was a piece of undeserved good fortune for the government. The real difficulty of Charles II's ministers, however, was not the political, but the financial situation. The king's ordinary revenue, nominally £1,200,000 a year, was really about £900,000, and he was in debt before the war began. In June 1664, at the first threat of war, he had to borrow £100,000 from the City of London in order to equip a fleet for sea. Parliament voted large sums for the expenses of the war. In December 1664, it imposed a royal aid of £2,477,500 to be raised by a monthly assessment during the next three years, beginning in January 1665. In October 1665, it voted an additional aid of £1,250,000 to be levied in the next two years, beginning in January 1666. Thus, during 1665, the monthly assessment levied was £68,500 per month, while during 1666 and 1667, it rose to £120,000 per mensum, which was what the Long Parliament had raised during the First Dutch War. But this sum was far from sufficient. The expenses of the Navy between September 1, 1664 and September 29, 1666, came to £3,200,000, and of that sum, about £900,000 was still owing. About £238,000 had been spent in subsidies to the Bishop of Munster, whose services had proved a very insufficient return. The deficiency was freely attributed to malversation in high places. It was reported that since the war began, £400,000 had been diverted from the service of the state to the privy purse, and people said... Give the king the Countess of Castlemaine, and he cares not what the people suffers. In reality, Charles was not to blame for the deficit. No doubt he was extravagant in his private pleasures, but the embarrassments of the state were due to other causes. The new taxes should have been imposed when the preparations for war began, not months after war had broken out. They dribbled in slowly, not a penny of the royal aid voted in December 1664 reached the Exchequer till April 1665. They brought in less than their estimated yield. The royal aid fell short by about 85,000, the additional aid by about 100,000. The government had to borrow money from bankers at high rates for its daily expenditure, and it could only borrow with great difficulty, for there was no efficient way of anticipating the receipts of taxes already voted by borrowing on the credit of them, nor was the device of funding the debts of state and assigning certain revenues to provide the interest due upon them as yet naturalised in England. In both respects, the Dutch government had a great advantage over the English, not only were the United Provinces a far richer country, in which the rate of interest was much lower than it was in England, and the available capital much larger, but the whole machinery of public finance was more highly developed, so that the Dutch could bear with comparative ease the burden of a war expenditure which was crushing to an economically more backward nation. When Parliament met in September 1666, it resolved to raise £1,800,000 for the King's service, 
but long disputes followed before the method of raising the sum could be agreed upon. Eventually, it was determined to raise £1,256,000 by a monthly assessment beginning in January 1667, and a poll tax, which was expected to produce £500,000, but really brought in only half that sum. At the same time, the House of Commons proceeded to claim the control of the finances of the state. Already in 1665, when the House voted an additional aid of £1,250,000, a proviso had been introduced into the bill requiring that the money raised should be applicable only to the purposes of war. But now, beside the right of appropriating supplies, it claimed the right of examining into their expenditure and set up a bill nominating commissioners to inspect the public accounts. The king opposed it as an encroachment on his prerogative, and the House of Lords backed him. In the end, Parliament was prorogued before the bill was perfected, February 8, 1667, and Charles, at the suggestion of the Lords, appointed commissioners of his own choice to carry out the proposed examination, March 1667. With insufficient supplies, and with a quarrel with the Commons on his hands, the King was left to face the difficulties of the next year's war. In this extremity, the King's Council adopted a full plan of peril. It was resolved to stand entirely upon the defensive, to lay up the great ships, and to send nothing but squadrons of light frigates to sea during the next year, to suffer the sailors who should have manned the fleet to take service on board merchantmen, to fortify Sheerness and other places in order to protect the ships in the river. No other course seemed open. There was no money in hand, either to repair the ships or victual them or pay their crews. To the king and his political advisers, it seemed a safe and economical way out of their difficulties. Peace seemed close at hand. Overtures had been made by the Dutch in the latter part of 1666, and, in the spring of 1667, Charles had three negotiations on foot. There was a public one through the Swedish mediators, which ended on March the 18th, with an agreement for a general treaty to take place at Breda. There was a secret attempt set on foot by Lisola, the imperial ambassador, to bring England and Holland to terms in order that both might league themselves with the House of Habsburg for the defence of the Spanish Netherlands. Finally, through St Albans and the Queen Mother, Charles was privately treating with France on the basis of the restoration of the French conquests in the West Indies in return for the complicity of England in the attack on the Netherlands. In April, the two kings concluded their bargain, and in May, the French army invaded Flanders. In the same month, the negotiations at Breda began. It was agreed that both England and Holland should keep their conquests, and after Charles had at last abandoned the demand for the restoration of Poularoon, nothing but minor questions remained to be settled. Over these questions, the English envoys at Breda, Hollis and Coventry haggled and delayed, the king felt secure. Now that he had agreed with France, the Dutch would be obliged to come to his terms, and either Louis would prevent the Dutch fleet from putting to sea, or the preparations made would be sufficient to repel them. On the other hand, the Dutch, who had refused to agree to a cessation of arms, were eager for peace, and their eagerness was increased by the French invasion of the Netherlands. De Witt resolved by a sudden and decisive blow, to prevent the prolongation of the negotiations and enforce the conclusion of peace. The appearance of de Reuter's fleet in the Thames and the burning of the ships in the Medway on June the 13th were the result not only of a strategic blunder, but of diplomatic incompetence. The story of the disaster itself is told in a later chapter. Peace was signed at Breda six weeks later on the terms which the Dutch had offered in May 
July the 31st, 1667. Charles had made up his mind to accept them before the Dutch fleet sailed, and De Witt, with wise moderation, did not attempt to raise his demands. In England, public feeling, exasperated by the national disgrace, demanded satisfaction. Men said, in private, that Clarendon and Arlington, who were responsible for the King's foreign policy, with Sir George Carteret and Sir William Coventry, who were responsible for the administration of the navy, were to be sacrificed. Nothing but some concession to the nonconformists would put an end to domestic discontents. There must be a severe inquisition into the late miscarriages, and Parliament must take the whole management of affairs into its own hands. When Parliament met, the first demand made was for the disbanding of the newly raised forces, July the 15th, for the fear of a standing army had become one of the dominant instincts of all English politicians. When the Cromwellian army was disbanded, the intention was to leave Charles II with no forces but his guards and a few companies scattered through various garrisons. But Venice rising in January 1661 showed the need for more troops, and Monk's regiment was continued in arms under the name of the Coldstream Guards. The withdrawal of the garrison of Dunkirk added a second battalion to the King's own regiment, so that, by 1663, Charles had a standing force of about 3,400 foot and a 1,000 horse, quite apart from the troops in Scotland and Ireland and the garrison of Tangier. Each addition had excited the jealousy of Parliament, and war caused a further increase. Three regiments of foot and 23 troops of horse were added during 1665 and 1666, while, in June 1667, 12,000 more foot and 2,400 horse were raised to resist the threatening Dutch landing. Charles had over 20,000 armed men at his disposal, and it was freely reported that he meant to rule by a standing army and to assimilate the government of England to that of France. Public opinion regarded the Duke of York as the man who had pressed this design upon the King and Clarendon as his tool. There was some colour for the charge against the Chancellor. At the end of June 1667, he had combated the proposal to summon Parliament and had urged a dissolution and the calling of a new Parliament in the autumn. In council, he had advised that the newly raised forces should be supported by levying contributions on the counties in money or in provisions so long as the present emergency lasted. The belief that Clarendon sought to alter the Constitution was without foundation. Yet, since his constitutional ideas were incompatible with the claim which Parliament now made, its leaders were right in regarding him as their enemy. Appropriation of supplies, audit of accounts, control of the armed forces of the nation, all appeared to him encroachments which the king must resist to the last. Clarendon was likewise regarded as the inspirer of the king's foreign policy, though in reality he was merely its instrument. English opinion attributed the Chatham disaster as much to French intrigue as Dutch arms, watched with rising hostility the progress of the French in the Netherlands, and blamed the minister for subserviency to France. The ambassadors of Austria and Spain fanned the flame and sought to overthrow one whom they regarded as the creature of Louis the Fourteenth. Had the Commons sat a day longer, an address in favour of a league with the House of Habsburg and a war with France would have been presented to the King. For the moment, the sudden prorogation of Parliament, July 29th, saved Clarendon from direct attack, but it was still more embittered parliamentary feeling against him because it seemed a personal insult to the members. It did not diminish the King's difficulties. Charles was obliged to disband the newly raised forces because the conclusion of peace left him no excuse for maintaining them. He was obliged to dismiss Clarendon 
because his retention would make peace at home impossible, and on August the 30th the Chancellor, by the King's order, gave up the Great Seal. Clarendon, in his autobiography, attributes his fall to personal reasons. He had been too bold with his master. He had told him plainly that he had no prerogative to make vice virtue. The courtiers and the mistress had poisoned the king's ears. This phrase had been misconstrued and that act intentionally misrepresented. But the real reason lay much deeper. It was true that the king had outlived any personal attachment to his minister, but he also perceived that the situation demanded ministers who possessed the confidence of Parliament. It was not possible, he told Ormond, to keep Clarendon and to do those things with the Parliament that must be done, or the government will be lost. Clarendon did not realise this. Parliaments, he told Charles in his last interview, were not formidable unless the king chose to make them so. It was yet in his own power to govern them, but if they found it was in theirs to govern him, nobody knew what the end would be. Nobody knew better than the king that the first half of the sentence was a fundamental misconception. As to the second, Charles felt that it was easier to outmanoeuvre Parliament than to fight it. In the seven years which had passed since he re-entered London, statecraft had come to mean not the steady pursuit of a well-considered policy, but the art of managing Parliament. And more and more, Parliament signified the House of Commons, a beast not to be understood, because there were yet no definite parties, and because no machinery had yet been devised for securing cooperation between the executive and the legislative. When Parliament met, the King yielded all the points at issue. He had already disbanded the newly raised forces. He now assented to the bill appointing parliamentary commissioners to examine the public accounts, December the 19th, 1667, and permitted a searching inquiry into the naval miscarriage of the late war. But, though Charles promised never to employ Clarendon again, his enemies were not satisfied and drew up articles of impeachment for high treason against the fallen minister. The Lords refused to commit Clarendon on the ground that the articles accused him of treason in general only and did not specify any particular treason. There followed a complete breach between the two houses. The Commons voted that the refusal of the Lords was an obstruction of the public justice of the kingdom. In the meantime, Clarendon, hearing that Parliament was to be prorogued and that he was to be tried by a special court erected for the purpose, took the King's advice and fled the kingdom. The two houses ordered the vindication he left behind him to be burnt and passed an act which banished him for life and made his pardon impossible without their consent. In dismissing Clarendon, Charles had submitted to the will of Parliament, not for the first time, but more conspicuously than he had done before. But he did not feel that he had permanently surrendered any portion of his royal power. His concession seemed to him, in his own words, rather inconvenient appearances than real mischiefs. His new ministers were his own choice, not imposed upon him by Parliament. The removal of Clarendon was the removal of a check upon his freedom of action, and in his heart Charles agreed with the courtier who told him that he was now king, which he had never been before. He began to mediate large projects at home and abroad, and initiated a policy of his own, which was distinct from the official policy of his government. Clarendon lived until 1674, an exile in France, he spent the last years of his life in compiling a vindication of his political career and in revising the exposition of constitutional royalism, which ultimately became the history of the rebellion. The fundamental principle of that creed was the necessity of the union of church and state. Clarendon's great political achievement had been the realisation of that principle 
by reuniting parliamentary government and the Anglican Church after they had been separated by the Civil War. One might almost say that the unconditional restoration of the old church was the work of Clarendon, as the unconditional restoration of a monarchy was the work of Monk. But, in achieving his purpose, Clarendon failed to perceive that toleration had become necessary to the peace of the nation, and his error led to the fall of the House of Stuart. End of section 13《Section 13 Section 14 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 5, The Age of Louis the Fourteenth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6 The Literature of the English Restoration, Including Milton, by Harold H. Child, Part 1. The Renaissance did not bear its perfect fruit in England till late. Long after in Italy it had been defeated in its protracted struggle with the reactionary element in the Church, it continued in England to find fuller expression not only in the minds but in the characters of men. In the Florence of Milton's day, the spirit of the Renaissance lingered only in the intellectual pastimes of the academies. In England, where the study of the classics continued hand in hand with that of the Bible, the freedom won refused to stop short at the acquirement of mental elegance. It embraced the whole man, raising before him an ideal of life and conduct, largely Hebraic, in its consciousness of duty to a deity who had selected a nation, and, according to some, here and there a person, for favor. At the same time, the chivalric ideals were not dead. The memory of Sir Philip Sidney, the Elizabethan perfect knight, was still active, Dante and Petrarch, lofty fables and romances, and the fairy queen, were still consulted for moral guidance as well as for pleasure. And the study of the classics had encouraged certain notions of the Stoic philosophy, which were assimilated into the ideal. Of this ideal, the result of the joint action of Reformation and Renaissance, John Milton in his early years was the supreme example. That there were others, Mrs. Hutchinson's record of the youth of her husband, who was born seven years after Milton, helps to show. There was little of it in what we now imply by the name Puritan. The arts were freely practiced. Milton, who inherited a love of music from his father, preserved it to the end of his life, and formed a friendship with Henry Laws, a court musician. And the great heritage, as it had already come to be, of Elizabethan imagination, as lavished in the Elizabethan drama, was, in his youth, still a matter of glory, not, as it became later, of shame. If Milton hissed academical comedies at Cambridge, he hissed them not because they were stage plays, but because they were silly. If he wrote nothing for a theatre which had already begun to show signs of decadence and immorality, he wrote, and that not long after the publication of Histriomatics, two masks for performance, meditated for many years the composition of a biblical or historical drama, and published within three years of his death a tragedy. His austerity was not that of a hatred, but of a severe choice of pleasure. An intellectual and moral aristocrat, he disliked not art, but vulgarity. The humanist and the Puritan are often spoken of as two elements at war in Milton— Rightly regarded, they would rather seem to be interdependent, forming together the peculiar and beautiful result of the interaction of Reformation and Renaissance. So early as 1630 we find the two wrought into perfect harmony, in a poem, at a solemn music. The time was to come when they would be forced into opposition. Meanwhile, the youthful Milton is almost, if not entirely, such a man as he has been declared to have been, one who would not unnaturally have sided with the Cavaliers against the Puritans. His disinclination to take orders may have been due, partly, to his inherited Calvinism and his dislike of the growing Armenianism which followed Law's elevation to the archbishopric. The final motive seems to have been his desire to reserve himself for something higher. 
he retired to his father's house at Horton, and there, while preparing for a greater task, he wrote, among other things, two poems, Legro and Il Panceroso, circa 1633, which bring back into a world of decadence and barren conceits, conceits which his manuscripts prove him to have been at pains to avoid, something of the freshness of the Spenserian time, but chastened, scholarly, and informed with the constant suggestiveness of classical allusion. The poems paint nature as seen through two moods in the mind of a young scholar. They foreshadow, too, the coming conflict between those moods as expressed in Cavalier and Roundhead. To the same years of preparation belong the two masks, Arcades, circa 1633, and Comus, 1634. The former is a work of the Johnsonian type. The latter is more interesting, not only for its superior poetry, but for the vision of the age that shows through it. Comus has been described as a double allegory. If it represents the conflict between virtue and vice, it represents also the conflict, now growing yearly sharper, between the two parties in religion and politics. In Lycidas, 1637, we have a still stronger sign of the cleavage. Here, into the perfect pastoral, the last expression of the Spenserian influence, comes the first genuine note of the sublime passion for order and liberty which inflamed the remainder of Milton's life. Laud's insistence on uniformity was filling the pulpits with obsequious and greedy hirelings. The sacred office of speaking was bought and begun with servitude and forswearing, and the prophet, who formed so large a part of the poet as Milton conceived him, speaks for the first time in direct reference to national affairs. This was before the final separation. There were many, afterwards, to be found upon the other side, who must have agreed with the passage in Lycidas concerning St. Peter, and the two voices are still one. Milton's enthusiasm for freedom and religious matters was probably intensified by what he saw and learned during his travels on the continent, 1638-39. through He must have heard from his friend, Charles Diodati, the descendant of a family of Luca, which had emigrated in the sixteenth century to escape conformity with the church, of the vigilance of the Holy Office and the Jesuits, and that he started with an almost dangerous amount of Protestant feeling may be deduced from the story of Sir Henry Wotton's famous warning, Pensieri Stretti et il viso sciolto, Secret Thoughts and Open Countenance. Paris, the home of experimental science, could not hold him and he moved on to Italy. The language he had already mastered, the country he doubtless regarded as still the home of culture and the arts. Here he found matter to inflame him still further. He left in England, where the battle was still to come, for in Italy, where it was long over. Nearly a century before, the establishment of the Holy Office, the activity of the Jesuits, and the accession of Paul IV, had driven the Protestants from Lucca, Siena, and elsewhere, to Geneva and other places north of the Alps, to be joined there by Huguenot refugees from France. The Catholic reaction had come, and the academies where Milton was made an honored guest were little more than schools of superficial elegance, of flattery and fustian. In Florence, Milton contrived both to speak his mind and to remain unmolested. In return, his Italian friends told him their real thoughts on the state of learning and life under the sway of the church. In Rome he was shunned. At Naples, Manso was afraid to make too much of him. At Florence, on his way back, he visited Galileo. At Geneva, he was the guest of the Dodati, and was able to contrast the conditions of life in the capital of Protestantism with that of the cities under the rule of the church. To Milton's foreign travels we owe, indeed, the beautiful Epitaphium Demonis, in which he laments in strains of genuine grief, through the ample use of conventional classic machinery, the death in England of his friend Charles Dodati, and other poems in Latin and Italian, which prove him to have been still extremely susceptible to influences of beauty. We owe to them also an increase of his bias against religious authority. Milton reached home in August 1639, 
he had intended to include sicily and greece in his travels but was recalled as he himself records by a sense of duty to his country where lovers of liberty were preparing to strike a blow his journey bore no immediate fruit it was not till two years later that he put forth the first of his pamphlets the resolve to lay aside poetry to a more fitting time was not yet definitely formed but the publication of the first pamphlet of reformation touching church discipline in england in sixteen forty one raises the question how far milton deserted his first ambition in order to write his controversial prose works more than any other man of his time he had the consciousness of being dedicated in his view all men were dedicated to the service of the great taskmaster himself in particular was chosen for the accomplishment of greatest things he abstained from trade or profession mainly in order to be free for more exalted work his task was to be a poet and his view of the office differed widely from that current in his own day and in the age that followed a poet in milton's eyes was not merely a sweet singer but a prophet the poet must be in himself a true poem a man of knowledge wisdom and religion and he must sing not for gain or pleasure or even with god's help for immortality for himself but for the service of god and of his country there was then no renunciation certainly no betrayal of his high calling in the postponement of the great epic or drama for which he had been preparing himself since youth god and his country had needs more pressing than poetry could satisfy and if the inception of the pamphlets shows a change in his methods it shows no change of final aim it is not within the province of this chapter to discuss the pamphlets in detail it will be enough to refer briefly to one or two general characteristics of milton's prose works his argument is not clearly conducted nor is it truly philosophic a constant discrepancy is to be noticed between the aspiration that possesses him and the theorem that he has to advance the areopagitica for instance shows no special knowledge and advances no practical schemes in the tractate on education there is a deep fall from the principle to the scheme proposed of rhetoric there is plenty sometimes magnificent at others merely tinkling at others tawdry to read milton's prose is to find frequent cause for wonder how the poet who chastened and solidified english blank verse after it had fallen into decay could run so wild in working without the restrictions of metre the want of arrangement of construction and of order is almost as remarkable in the uncontroversial as in the controversial works and the grossness the malignity of the vituperation in which he occasionally indulged cannot be wholly excused even by a remembrance of the age in which he wrote the enemies he was attacking or the life and death struggle in which he engaged them in milton's prose we find it has been said the poet in the politician if the arguments are weak and the practical value small the prose works are aglow with the purposes of the greatest mind of his time the vision of the poet breaks through the question of the moment to the expression of a vast idealism inherited from the less hampered aspirations of the elizabethans however much this enthusiasm may be superficially affected in milton's case by party spirit or the need of the moment personal or political it renders his prose more passionate and at its best more lofty than any other prose in the language in arrangement and style we must mark a decline from the ordered dignity of hooker it is not so rich as jeremy taylor for tempestuous passion striving to force expression from an insufficiently developed medium it has no equal the passion at the root of it is the passion of liberty liberty always conditioned by the divine law as revealed in the double scripture of the bible and the spirit that is given to each man as a yet more certain guide and by the intellectual and aristocratic love of order and the passion is increased by the fact that many of these pamphlets are strongly autobiographical the areopagitica was written in order to facilitate the publication of the doctrine and discipline of divorce 
which in its turn was written, whether Mason's later theory of its date be correct or not, because of the author's personal sufferings in wedlock. Sufferings, if this theory be indeed correct, sufficient of themselves to account for his mainly Hebraic view of women. The aspiration, therefore, is never feigned. Milton speaks from his heart of hearts, his rare spirit elevated with conscious superiority to time-servers, slaves, demagogues, and fools, stung by personal griefs, and inflamed with a passion for freedom and order, and his prose is typical of his age, an age of vast ideals and makeshift practice. If it is impossible to read Milton's prose without as much pain and disappointment as pleasure, it is also impossible not to realize that its whole effect was greatly for the good of English prose. His lowest vituperation, hardly less than his loftiest flights, helped to stretch the capacity of the tongue, and the application of Milton's scholarship to his own language resulted in the fortifying and enriching it for the benefit of those that came after. In the twenty years of battle, almost the only poetry produced by him consists of a few sonnets, not founded, like those of the Elizabethans, on accepted conceits and fashionable ardors, but struck out from the poet's heart. Perhaps for the first time in English literature we find the sonnet used for an expression of genuine personal feeling, which owed nothing to Italian or French originals. Milton's sonnets were written not because the poet would, but because he must, and no more passionate or truly lyrical sonnets are to be found in the language, and when the battle was over, and the cause practically lost, the poet returned, old, blind, and unhappy, to the work to which he believed himself dedicated. The twenty years had left their mark. If there is much of the poet in the politician and theologian, there is a great deal of the theologian in the poet. It is a useless but fascinating task to speculate what the great epic or drama would have been like had Milton produced it ten years earlier, after years of peace and retirement. One thing is certain, that the poem would have lacked certain priceless touches of self-revelation. The best-known passage in Paradise Lost is that in which the poet speaks directly of his own blindness. On the other hand, it is easy to imagine that the poem, whether epical or dramatic, historical or sacred, would have been a more human poem. Aristocratic and aloof, nice of nature, honestly haughty and self-esteeming, as Milton had always been, he found himself between 1658 and 1663 more out of sympathy with the world about him than he had been before. The principles that were the passion of his life were denied. He was blind, poor, surrounded by enemies, and, during part of the time, in personal danger. It is not surprising that, in addition to some outbreaks of bitterness, the poem shows an increase, an excess, of that detachment from the affairs of common humanity, which had always been a feature of his sublime mind. Chosen many years earlier, for the very reason that it relieved him of the necessity of dramatizing, of characterizing, men and women, his subject now formed at once a refuge from the overwhelming disappointment and a means of expressing his own exaltation above the study of his worthless fellow-men. At the same time it may well seem to the modern reader to be more aloof from the concerns of humanity than it seemed to Milton. If he had rejected the idea of an Arthurian or other legendary subject in favor of a scriptural, it was because the legends— even history itself, had less of actuality, of literal truth, and of human moment, than the subject of Paradise Lost. To Milton, his angels and his demons were not only eternally, essentially true, but more exactly and literally true than King Arthur. He took the Bible narrative and enlarged it, supplying nothing from uninspired sources but the imagery of his poem, and such names and figures as were regarded by himself and his times as essentially linked with eternal truth by being personally existent sources of error and opposition. Criticism has succeeded in discovering only a single passage where Milton represents an incident in his story otherwise 
than is recorded in the Bible, and his authority in that case is the Book of Wisdom. Though today, therefore, the poem is read mainly by scholars, who admire its learning, its technical beauties, and the constant stream of classical allusion, which gives a deeper meaning to every line, and by such classes as the Russian peasants, to whom its story is still literally true, and capable of being illustrated by flaming woodcuts, it is possible to regard Paradise Lost as more remote from the concerns of common humanity than it was. It contains no human sweetness, no charity, no love. Whatever of those elements there may have been in a man austere and sublime from youth, twenty years of pamphleteering, together with his private sorrows and the rejection of his ideals, had killed in him. The world of chivalry had passed forever. Woman was no longer the lodestar, but the source of error, and man no longer the lord of the world, but a traitor to his own greatness. The voice is the voice of a man defeated. His contemporaries, and his successors, for some generations, it seemed that Paradise Lost stood not only for an expression of the eternal truth, of matters of supreme and eternal moment to mankind, but for a story of the warfare between combatants, all of whom were perfectly familiar and personally existent beings. That the story should be presented, with all the learning at the poet's command, was in accordance not only with Milton's exalted idea of the office of poetry, but with the constant humanist element in him. Aspiring to the expression of thoughts and truths vaster than any poetry had yet dealt with, he lavished on his poem all the knowledge, the accomplishment, and the beauty that he had to bestow. But the humanist in him was not now, as in the days of Lycetus, the master of the Calvinist theologian, not only in the doctrine of victory over evil by force, and the passages in which the spirit of the war still rings, may we trace the influence of the twenty intervening years. Setting out to place on record, as it were, as much of the eternal truth about God, the devil, and man, as his poem could contain, in the face of an age which threatened already to forget or to deny that truth, Milton was led into regions of disquisition outside the scope of epical poetry proper. Paradise Lost is the last and belated voice of a great age that was gone. It gathers up all the idealism, all the poetic labors, all and far more than all the learning of the Elizabethans. It takes the instrument which from the days of Surrey onwards had grown slowly towards perfection, and rescues it from misuse in order to employ it on greater themes than it had ever known. If the debt of the poem to the Renaissance is great, its debt to the Reformation is hardly less great, though it contains in it the seeds of decay. The spiritual scope of the poem could only be commanded by the choicest of the minds which were able to understand and assimilate all that was vital in the Genevan doctrine. The realization of the justice and might of God and his direct concern with the affairs of men, the malignity and persistence of the powers of evil, the vastness of the scheme in which man is a minute, but responsible and therefore important, element. Of the world into which the poem was born, it shows no impress, though here and there a bitter reference recalls it. The nature of that world will be seen shortly. It was a world in which Calvinism was, except for an inarticulate remnant, as dead as the tradition of the English Renaissance. That the poem was read, we know. It is to Dryden's honor that he saw its merit. But, so far as actual effect went, it fell on deaf ears. For its public appreciation, Paradise Lost had to wait not only till the Revolution, but even later, till Addison, the mouthpiece of the greatly changed party of the Whigs, expounded such of its beauties as he and his age could grasp. Paradise Lost, if Milton's greatest, was not his last message to the faithful remnant and the host of foes that surrounded them. Paradise Regained, his own favorite, and Samson Agonistes, published together in one volume, followed. And it is difficult not to see in these two very different works a kind of alternative suggested to the losing side. Paradise Regained, a poet's poem, 
has been even less widely read, but more enthusiastically admired by a few, than Paradise Lost. Its severity is greater, its display of imagination, learning, and poetic adornment less, its nakedness being partly, perhaps, a protest against the false poetry, as Milton considered it, in fashion during his later years, and partly due to a feeling that the word of truth was sufficient of itself. Paradise Regained has, however, a unity and a closeness of form that have induced Wordsworth and Coleridge, among others, to rank it higher than any other of Milton's poems. Its message is one of humility and hope, of a peaceful expectation of release from the bondage of evil. The message of Samson Agonistes is very different. In adopting the dramatic form, and modeling his tragedy on Greek lines, Milton was only carrying into execution an idea that had possessed him from his earliest days. Since his return from Italy, the views of the author of the sonnet on Shakespeare, of Arcades, and of Comus, with regard to the acted drama, had undergone a change, an approximation to the views of histriomastics, which may be noticed in the reference to Shakespeare in Iconoclastes, 1649, and even earlier. He had rejected the dramatic form for Paradise Lost, influenced, no doubt, to some extent, by the discredit into which the theatre had fallen, as well as by his sense of poetic fitness. But he had retained his admiration of the dramatic form of tragedy as the gravest, moralist, and most profitable. Had the play been written in his youth, there would have been, perhaps, no need for an apology. To Samson Agonistes, he prefixed an essay of that sort of dramatic poetry called tragedy, partly in order to justify his choice of form to those remaining Puritans who might not grasp the distinction between the acted and the unactable drama, and partly to protest against what he held to be the lower kind, which intermixed comic stuff with tragic sadness and gravity, corruptly to gratify the people. If the simplicity of Paradise Regained is a rejection of the restoration ideal and practice of poetry, it is also, perhaps, a rejection of the Spenserian. It is impossible not to see in Samson Agonistes a complete rejection of Elizabethan tragedy. The play, then, is a tragedy on the Greek lines. It has been accused of lacking strength of design and vigor of handling. Read in the light of Milton's life and times, it becomes the most passionately personal expression he has left. Of direct symbolism, the play contains much. The Philistines have triumphed over the chosen people. Samson is blind and at the mercy of his foes. Moreover, his chief fault is his marriage with a Philistine woman. And there can be no doubt that to some extent Delilah stands for Milton's first wife, Mary Powell, and that Samson's self-reproaches addressed to the chorus and to Manoah and his scene with Delilah represent a recrudescence of the old wound. The chorus, indeed, that follows the scene between Samson and Delilah is taken, almost literally, from the pamphlets on divorce. In spite of the final words of the chorus, the burden of the play is no message of resignation or patience. The prophet once more lifts up his voice to denounce not only the victorious enemy, but the half-hearted on his own side, to draw a picture of the doom awaiting the oppressor, almost to advise a last desperate struggle. The play and poem, issued in one volume, represent what may be supposed to have been Milton's two main moods during the last years of his life, violent indignation, reaching almost to despair, and a withdrawal from the memories of the past, and from the hateful present which he could not see, into the inner world of his genius and his religion. End of section 14